Chapter 20 of The Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 20 What the Stakes Revealed. James Greenfield, returning to Kingston from his tour of inspection, left at once for his own world a world of offices with mahogany furniture, of men with white collars and pale faces, of banks and trust companies, and good business. The afternoon of the day he left, Willard Holmes rode into the camp at Dry River Crossing. The engineer explained that he was looking over the route of a new main canal that was being surveyed by his men, and that, finding himself in the vicinity of Mr. Worth's headquarters, he had taken the opportunity to call. From Barbara, as well as from Jefferson Worth and Abe Lee, the company man received a hearty welcome, with a cordial invitation to ride with them the next day over the line of their work. Although Holmes watched with peculiar sensitiveness, there was no sign from either of the three that they had yet discovered the real significance of the South Central deal, or that they knew the part he had played in it. His desire to end the whole unpleasant situation by going over the work with Mr. Worth and the surveyor, and by confessing to Barbara how he had permitted her father to walk into the trap, led him to accept the invitation. The little party left camp early the next morning, and following the line of black survey, found a mile or more of the canal already completed, while a large force of men and teams was at work clearing the ground and pushing the big ditch still farther in a general southerly direction toward the company canal, fifteen miles away. Abe Lee explained to Barbara that other camps were located at points farther on, thus dividing the whole district to be excavated into several sections. You see, he said, turning to Holmes, the waste from Dry River heading coming down the old channel gives us water at several points so that we can handle this work in a little better advantage than we used to do with the first of the company canals. I see said the company man. And how many head of stock are you working? About 1,500 now, but we're increasing the force right away. We expect to handle about twice that. Instantly, Willard Holmes saw that he could still save Jefferson Worth from heavy financial loss. But it was the interest of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company for Jefferson Worth to lose heavily. What should he do? They had left the first section of the work now and were following the line of the survey where the brush had been roughly cleared. The engineer, preoccupied in his struggle with the question that confronted him, had dropped behind the others when suddenly Barbara, looking back, checked El Capitan. "'What's the matter, Mr. Holmes?' she called. The others also looked back to see the engineer kneeling on the ground." Jefferson Worth glanced quickly at his superintendent, who chuckled outright. "'What is it?' cried Barbara at Abe's unusual laugh. "'What's the joke?' Before either of the men could answer, Holmes sprang to his saddle and, with a quick jab of his spurs in the horse's flanks, rejoined them on the run. In his excitement the mental habits of his life asserted themselves— and he was again the typical corporation official, dealing with a mere private individual, operating on a small scale. Look here, he burst forth sharply to Abe. These are not our company stakes. You're not following Black's line. The surveyor grinned. We follow it for a half mile this side of the cut. Then we branched off. You evidently did not notice. Where do you strike it again? We don't strike it again. Then how do you get to the intake location? We don't get to the intake you located at all. We strike your canal three miles farther up. The company's chief engineer retorted hotly. 
But you can't do that. Our survey shows... He stopped. Your survey shows what? came Abe Lee's sharp challenge. You're undoubtedly familiar with the data turned in by your man Black, for you told Mr. Worth the quality of the soil before he closed the deal. What else does your survey show? Before the engineer could answer, Jefferson Worth's cool voice broke in. You understand, Mr. Holmes, that there's nothing in my contract with your company that binds me to follow the line of your survey or accept your location of the intake. The company contracts to deliver the water into my canal. That is all. The engineer regained control of himself. I beg your pardon, Mr. Worth, and yours, Lee. I forgot myself. I see that my man Black made a mistake. Abe laughed dryly. In checking over Black's work, Holmes, I found his elevations correct at every point. Holmes himself smiled as he said, Well, Lee, whether you believe me or not, I am very glad you checked over Black's work, and, Mr. Worth, with all my heart, I wish you success in your project. Thank you, said Worth. I'm already indebted to you for a valuable piece of information. Indebted to me? You remember what I asked you when I was going over this proposition with Greenfield and Burke in the company office? I remember that you asked me about the soil in the district. You answered that the soil was all right. Holmes drew a long breath. And you let Uncle Jim and Burke think... I let them think what they wanted to think, said Jefferson Worth. Barbara, who had listened with intense interest to the conversation, at Holmes unfinished remark and her father's reply, moved El Capitan slowly away from his place beside Worth's horse and went close to Abe Lee. All the gladness was gone from the young woman's face now and while she maintained a show of interest, it was plainly forced. The banker, at his daughter's movement, retreated behind his gray mask, and for the rest of the trip spoke only when it was necessary, leaving her entirely to the surveyor and Willard Holmes. Barbara had understood from the talk of the men that her father, by using the unsuspecting engineer, had in some way shrewdly gained a business advantage over the company. The incident forced her, as she thought, to see with a cruel clearness that to Jefferson Worth this splendid work of reclaiming the desert was nothing but the opportunity to win larger financial gains, that he was still practicing the tactics for which he was famous. She shrank from him unconsciously, but to the man as plainly as she had drawn back in fear that night years before. As the baby had turned from him to the seer then, the young woman turned from him to Abe Lee now. During the rest of the day, Barbara kept so close to the surveyor's side that Willard Holmes had no opportunity to talk with her alone and when they arrived again at the headquarters camp, the engineer, promising to call upon her soon in Kingston, left for one of his own camps a few miles away. That evening, Jefferson Worth and his daughter sat alone under the arrowweed ramada facing the river. Moving her camp chair closer in the dusk, so close that, reaching out, she laid her warm young hand on the hand of her father, Barbara said in a low tone, Daddy, I wish you would tell me all about this South Central District business. She felt the slim, nervous fingers move uneasily. Never before had Barbara asked him to explain any of his transactions. The man's habit of retiring behind that gray mask whenever the subject of his business was mentioned together with the girl's instinctive shrinking lest his answers to such a question should drive them farther apart, prevented. But tonight, perhaps because Willard Holmes was concerned, perhaps because her peculiar interest in the work involved, Barbara forced herself to ask, "'What do you want to know?' At his expressionless tone, it was to Barbara as though she felt the chill of his cold mask 
coming between them. But she persisted, and in her voice was passionate earnestness. I want to know all about it, father. I must. Why? Because, she hesitated, because I understood from the conversation today about the surveys that someone had made a mistake. I, I don't want to make a mistake, Daddy. Won't you please explain it all to me? What was it that you let Mr. Greenfield and Mr. Burke think? Perhaps because of the memories of the place, or because it was the first time Barbara had ever sought an explanation, or again perhaps it was because Willard Holmes was interested, Jefferson Worth answered. I let them think I was a fool. But why was Mr. Holmes so excited today when he found out about those stakes? He discovered that I was not such a fool as they thought. Then Jefferson Worth explained to the girl the whole situation. He made clear Greenfield's reason for offering him the water rights, why he would have taken the stock without investigation, but for the hint he received from the company engineer's manner and the way Holmes had answered that simple question about the soil, how he had made the survey secretly, because Greenfield would have refused to close the deal if he had known that Worth wanted it after he had investigated, and because if Greenfield believed the district stock to be valueless, he would sell at a very low figure rather than not sell at all and how it was that same low figure had enabled him to give the men who were working on the canal a chance to acquire farms of their own. When he had made it all plain, the young woman exclaimed, And this man Greenfield and those with him in the company are the men who are doing the Sears' work, who are making the reclamation of the desert possible. I don't, I can't understand it. It is a very simple business deal, said Worth. There is nothing unusual about it. Greenfield and his men are good men. They are simply defending their interest from a competitor. This desert never could be reclaimed at all without them, or others like them. Tell me again, Daddy, was Mr. Holmes sure that this land was worthless? Certainly he was sure of it. He had all of Black's data giving the elevations. And he knew that they were trying to sell it to you? Yes. But did he know why? Did he know it was a trap to ruin your work? Certainly, he must have known. The girl's voice trembled. Oh, why? Why didn't he tell you? Why didn't he warn you? He did. Yes, Daddy, but he did not intend to do it. For today he did not know that he had until you explained. And I thought, I thought, her voice ended in a sob. But Barbara Holmes did just what he should have done. He's in the employee of the company. He had no right to interfere with their business. Every man has a right to be a man, she answered hotly. Abe wouldn't have kept still. The seer would not have helped them in their schemes. I don't wonder that the company discharged the seer to give Mr. Holmes his place. Jefferson Worth was silent for a little. Then he said, If I had thought that you would blame Holmes, I never would have told you. But you did right to tell me. I am glad, for I see now that I was making a mistake, that I was making two mistakes. I misjudged you, Daddy. Forgive me. And I... I've been mistaken about Mr. Holmes. For an hour or more, the two sat silent, the mind of each occupied with thoughts that were much the same. Barbara, for the first time, felt that she could enter fully into her father's life. She had at last seen behind his gray mask and found herself in full sympathy with him. And the lonely man knew that at last he had gained that for which his heart hungered, the fullest companionship of the girl he loved as his only child. At last, Barbara said softly, Daddy, I'm not going back to Kingston tomorrow. I'm going to stay here with you. 
You can have another tent house built, and Texas can go for Inez, who will bring what things I need. I'm going to make a home for you. You need me, Daddy. You are so alone in your work. No one understands you as I do now. Let me come and help you. Awkwardly, Jefferson Worth put out his hand, and drawing his daughter closer, said in a tone that Barbara had never heard before, I was wishing that you would want to stay. You, you are not afraid of me now, Barbara. Why, no, of course not. What a strange thing to ask. I've never been afraid of you. Why should I be? And Barbara thought that she spoke truly, that she had never feared him, though Jefferson Worth knew better. So another tent house was built, and Texas went alone to Kinston to return with Inez as Barbara had planned, and the young woman set about making a home for her father in the rude desert camp. Every day, nearly, she rode El Capitan out to some part of the work, and the men who were toiling for more than wages learned to know her and to hail her presence as a good omen. Many a rough fellow, dreaming of wife or sweetheart and the home he would make for them in the desert as he drove his team and held the bar of his Fresno, worked the harder for a cheery word from the daughter of his employer. And every evening under the Ramada, Barbara sat with her father, often alone, sometimes with one or more of her little court, and always the talk was of the work, save for the times when Pablo would come softly to make music for his senorita, and then they would sit silently, listening to the sweet harmonies that floated away into the night. Often Barbara would go the short distance from the house to the old wash, there to sit almost on the very spot where her mother had perished beside the dry water hole, and watching the stream that now flowed through the old channel, or looking away across the deep cut to the sand hills that showed clearly in the distance. She would live over the story as she had learned it that day with Texas, asking the old, old question to which there was still no answer. One afternoon, as she was sitting there, two wagons with a small party of men appeared on the high bank of the stream opposite. As the men climbed down from their seats, someone on horseback rode to the edge of the cut and sat for a moment looking across. Even at that distance she knew him, it was Willard Holmes. Watching, she saw him turn and by his motions guessed that he was giving some instructions to the men. Then he rode away toward the crossing. Quickly, Barbara returned to the rude porch of the tent house, and in a few minutes saw the engineer approach. Dismounting and throwing the reins over his horse's head, he came to her smiling, sombrero in hand. Buenos dias, senorita. Please, may I have a drink? Certainly, Mr. Holmes, help yourself. She pointed to the Ola hanging in the shade of the Ramada. The engineer started at her cool reply, given as she would have addressed a stranger, and more, to regain his composure than because he was thirsty, helped himself from the earthen water jar. When he could delay no longer, he turned again to her, and forcing himself to speak as if he had not noticed the lack of warmth in her greeting, said, I was sorry to miss you in town. I called several times. I'm keeping house here for father, she answered. Then we will be neighbors, he said with assumed lightness, at least halfway neighbors. A party of my surveyors will be camped over there across the river. I will be with them part of the time. When she made no reply to this, the man understood. Slowly he drew on his gloves, and, laying aside all pretense, said simply, I've been trying to see you, Miss Worth, because I want to tell you myself of the miserable part I took in the shameful trick my uncle attempted to play on your father. I see that you know all about it, 
and I realize that it is quite useless for me to ask you to forgive me. He paused, but still the young woman was silent. The man could not know how she was fighting to keep back the tears. You told me plainly that you could never forgive one who was untrue to his work, he went on hopelessly, and you are right. There was a time before I knew you when I would have defended my action, when I would have held that it was right, but I cannot now. Perhaps if I'd known you longer, but what's the use? I am a sad bungler in this great work, Miss Worth. I'm out of place in the big desert. I should have stayed at home. I wish, I wish you had never wakened me to the possibilities of life, real life. You would not need to feel ashamed for me now. When she looked up, he was mounting his horse. Almost she cried out to him, but he rode quickly out of her sight. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 of The Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 21 Pablo Brings News to Barbara all through the long hot months of that second summer, Barbara stayed in the desert with her father. Many times Mr. Worth insisted that she should go to the coast or to the mountains for a few weeks, while Abe, Texas, and Pat added their entreaties. But the young woman's answer was always to her father, If you must stay, Daddy, then I must stay to take care of you. To Abe it was, why don't you take a vacation? This is just as much my work as it is yours. To Texas it was a laughing question whether he thought she was a quitter. And to Pat she always declared that the desert could not in the least hurt her complexion. And look at the other women, she would argue. There was Jack Hansen's little wife with their children in a twelve-by-fourteen tent, out there on their claim alone all day and many nights, while Jack was on the work. And Mrs. White, who stoutly declared that she was sure going to stand by her gem if it burned her to a crisp, and that they did not have the money to spend, even if they could leave the crops they had managed to plant. And Mrs. Rollins, and Mrs. Baird, and Mrs. Cole, and the others, who were holding down their husbands' claims while the men were earning money on the works to help them in getting their start. Surely if these women could stay with their men folk, Barbara could. So Mr. Worth let her have her way, and the other three strove among themselves with varied and picturesque figures of speech and, it must be confessed, some rather strong language, to express their admiration for her courage and endurance, while all four taxed their inventive powers to the limit, devising ways to add to her comfort. The work in the South Central District continued steadily, with no delay through lack of help, and when the canal was finished and the water ready, the men who had built it turned to making the ditches on their own claims, leveling their land for irrigation, preparing for the first crops, and making what other improvements they could. Meanwhile, the new town site was laid out on the ground already occupied by the headquarters camp, and the camp itself became the town of Barba. But perhaps because, as Pablo said, there was no senorita in the company, Greenfield's chief engineer again found it hard to hold his men through the hot months and was obliged to discontinue work on their central main. Holmes himself spent the weeks of the flood season at the river, refusing to leave even for a day. Three times when conditions at the intake and heading were most critical and the danger that threatened the unconscious settlers seemed imminent, the engineer sent for Abe Lee, 
while Texas, Pat, and Pablo were instructed by Mr. Worth to be ready at an hour's notice to move the entire workforce of the district to the scene of the expected disaster. And still, even through those trying times, Jefferson Worth continued his operations in all parts of the basin and started various enterprises in his new town with the conviction of a born fatalist, though he almost constantly now, except when he was with Barbara, wore that expressionless gray mask. Abe Lee's thin face, burned dark by constant exposure to the fierce desert sun, had a look of watchful readiness. And Barbara, seeing, thought that it was all because of the strain of their own work, for even Barbara was not told of the terrible risk that the company was forcing the pioneers to take. Meanwhile, James Greenfield and the company officials, from the outside, watched the situation with the calmness of professional gamblers watching the turn of the cards. Though he did not come into the desert during the summer, the company president spent most of his time in the West now, for the reclamation project launched by him was assuming such proportions that his personal attention was justified. Only one thing more was needed to bring such a flood of land seekers, speculators, and investors that the company's immense profits would be assured. The new country must have a railroad. To this end, in the city by the sea, the eastern financier was bringing every influence he could command to bear upon the officials of the southwestern and continental that skirted the rim of the basin. But the great man who shaped the destinies of the S and C, secure in the knowledge that his road controlled the only pass through the range of mountains that shut in the new country, for some reason refused to build a branch line into the territory in which Mr. Greenfield was so deeply interested. James Greenfield, himself a power of the first magnitude in the financial world, was always admitted to the presence of the railroad man without delay, and was always received by the official with every courtesy. His statements as to the extent and value of the lands that were being developed by his company, with his estimates of the volume of business that the branch line would bring to the southwestern and continental, were received without question. The railroad man even betrayed unusual interest in the reclamation of the King's Basin Desert, with a knowledge of conditions almost as complete as Mr. Greenfield's. Frequently, he asked of Jefferson Worth's operations and of the development of the South Central District. But always he shook his head when Greenfield urged immediate action. There were certain reasons he was not at liberty to go into details. Some day, no doubt, the branch line would be built, but he could make no promises. This was the situation in the fall when, with the danger from the river past and his canals finished, Jefferson Worth sought an interview with the president of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company at his office in the Coast City. Mr. Greenfield received the banker cordially, congratulated him upon the success of his South Central District work, and prophesied great things for everybody interested in the King's Basin project. Jefferson Worth, behind his gray mask, at once made known the object of his visit. He wished to secure from the company the right to take water from their central main for a small powerhouse to be located in the dry river wash. Mr. Worth explained frankly the advantage it would give the new town of Barba, in which he was interested, and stated that he had, some time before, laid his proposition before the company's manager in order that Mr. Greenfield might be informed of the matter. Greenfield said that he had heard from Mr. Burke and that he thought it might be arranged. Then, while Jefferson Worth listened with his usual careful attention, the company man set forth their great need of a railroad. And by the way, 
was mr worth personally acquainted with the man who controlled the s and c i know of him came the cautious reply well mr worth said the president i'll tell you what we'll do we need that railroad and we need it now so far i've failed to get any definite promise from the s and c that they will give us a branch line if you can secure a railroad for the basin this year we will give you the right of way for your power canal and a contract for the water is that your only proposition that is my only proposition the president of the king's basin land and irrigation company would have been astonished if he could have witnessed the meeting of Jefferson Worth and the railroad man an hour later. Hello, Jeff, came in hearty tones from the official as the door of his private office closed behind the banker. How are you? I hear that Greenfield sold you a gold brick. Mr. Worth smiled while the other laughed heartily. I tell you, Jeff, we little westerners have got to watch out for these big eastern operators or they'll take the whole blamed country away from us the gold brick is panning out pretty well so far said the banker so i understand crawford has been telling me all about it in fact the whole king's basin proposition looks mighty good to me except for that new york bunch i'm afraid of them jeff greenfield has been camping on my trail for three months wanting us to build them a branch line. I told Crawford yesterday that it was about time for you to come around. When are you going to build that road? asked Mr. Worth. The other shook his head. Can't do it, Jeff. You know the situation as well as I. If the river comes in, the whole country will go to smash. And with the class of structures they put in to control it, and with an eastern engineer in charge, it's too big a chance. The S&C is not spending money to help out wildcat projects promoted by Eastern Capital. But if you give us the branch line, it will ensure the success of the project, for it will make the company property so valuable that they will spend more money to protect it. Or, added the other, we would have to spend more money to protect it. I'm sorry, Jeff, if that's what you've been figuring on, but we're not an insurance company. We're in the transportation business. Then you won't build into the basin? Not under existing conditions, Jeff. With as little a show of emotion as he would have exhibited had he merely proposed to purchase a morning paper, Jefferson Worth said, All right, then I'll build it myself. The railroad man knew that the quietly spoken words meant that the banker had determined to stake everything he had in the world upon a chance that even the SNC, with its unlimited capital, refused to take. With his already large investments in the new country, the building of the railroad would tax Worth's resources to the very limit, and the failure of the company's project would mean for him financial ruin. During the flood season just past, Jefferson Worth had seen the safety of the reclamation work hanging on a very slender thread. Every hour he had looked for the disaster that would bring to nothing all that had been accomplished by the desert pioneers, whose ruin he would share. Yet he calmly proposed now to throw into the venture everything that years of unceasing toil had brought him his capital, his credit, his reputation. Don't do it, Jeff, said his friend. You're in deep enough now. Better keep an anchor to windward. I figured on taking a chance when I went into that country, said Worth simply. It was as if he had foreseen this situation from the very beginning and had planned how he would meet it. The railroad man's face expressed his admiration for this display of nerve. If I can do anything for you, let me know, Jeff. Thanks. If you would just not mention to anyone that I'm connected with this for a little while. Oh, I see. Greenfield again, I suppose. What are you up to anyway, Jeff? Buying another gold brick? 
Wirth explained his plan for a power plant and Greenfield's proposition. Hell, exclaimed the dignified official, you can't tell me that you're going to build a railroad into Greenfield's town just to get a dinky little power plant in your own district. I'm not from New York, Jeff, to which Jefferson Wirth answered from behind his mask. The basin needs a railroad. The next day, Greenfield sought the railroad office in haste. I understand that you've decided to build that branch road. The official who had received his guest with the dignified courtesy befitting one of his position smiled at the other's manner as a gracious sovereign might smile on granting a subject's petition. Greenfield accepted the smile as an assent. May I ask when you will begin the work? I cannot say exactly, Mr. Greenfield. The survey will probably be made at once, and the work begun as soon as it is possible to assemble men and material. When the King's Basin messenger announced that the survey was being made for a railroad from the main line of the SNC at Deep Well to Kingston, it did not mention the fact that Abe Lee was in charge of the work, and James Greenfield, who signed the promise contract following the announcement, did not learn until the next issue of the messenger that the road was not being built by the SNC, but by Jefferson Worth himself. Quickly, the news that the railroad was building into the King's Basin was spread by the papers throughout the surrounding country, and from every side the swelling flood of life poured in. Every section of the new lands felt the influence of the rush. For miles around the towns, every vacant track was seized by the incoming settlers. Town site companies quickly laid out new towns, while in the towns already established, New business blocks and dwellings sprang up as if some Aladdin had rubbed his lamp. Real estate values advanced to undreamed figures, and the property was sold, resold, and sold again. And Kingston, the heart and center of it all, Kingston, Texas Joe said, went plum locoed. The name of Jefferson Worth was on every tongue. Was he not the wizard who commanded prosperity and wealth to wait upon the king's basin? Was he not the Aladdin who rubbed the lamp? Horace P. Blanton, who seemed to increase magically as if, indeed, he fed on the stuff of which booms are made, did not lack for audience now as he talked in rolling phrases of his friend Worth and what we had done with suggestive hints of still greater things that we, again, would do. To see the great Horace P. in all the glory of white vest and picture hat, as he escorted parties of awe-stricken newcomers about the town and pointed out with majestic gestures our opera house, our bank, our powerhouse, our ice plant, the site of our new depot, was an experience never to be forgotten. To watch him give orders, when Pat was not near, to some laborer in the grading gang, at work on the roadbed and yards, or to see him instructing a merchant in the finer points of his business, was a delight. To hear him speak with authority upon every question relating to the King's Basin project, from the stage of the water and the river two years before the first survey, and the future plans of Jefferson Worth to the chemical properties of the soil, the proper grade for irrigating alfalfa, and the kinds and varieties of fruits and vegetables best adapted to the climate was as instructive as it was interesting. With the beginning of the work on the railroad, Barbara and her father again made their home in Kingston, and Horace P. Blanton, whenever he could escape from his arduous duties, endeavored earnestly to make himself agreeable to Jefferson Worth's daughter. There was no mistaking either his purpose or his perfect confidence in his ability to achieve success. 
many and ingenious were the things that three members of barbara's court promised each other should happen to horace p it was on one of those afternoons when the man with the white vest was making himself very much at home on the front porch of the worth cottage that pablo riding in from the south central district sought la senorita dismounting from his tired horse the mexican his spurs clanking on the walk approached barbara and with his sombrero brushing the ground greeted her in his native tongue turning an inquiring eye meanwhile upon the portly horace p barbara returned his greeting in spanish following her words in english with this is senor blanton pablo mr blanton this is my friend pablo garcia the white man acknowledged the introduction with a lordly gesture the mexican with a gleam of his white teeth said i had the pleasure to see the senor sometimes before he is what they call the booster i have heard him talk many times on street then to barbara i am come quick senorita to find senor worth or senor lee you know if it is far to where they are i ride fast my horse is tired before the young woman could answer the big man with a voice of authority said you will find them out on the line of the railroad somewhere between here and deep well just follow the grade you can't miss it pablo should have considered himself dismissed but ignoring blanton he waited for barbara's answer i don't know just where they are pablo you had better wait until they come in is there anything wrong the mexican shrugged his shoulders with another glance toward her companion i cannot say senorita there is no what you call accident but i think better i come what is it my man said horace p again interrupting i will see mr worth about it as soon as he comes in you have no business troubling miss worth barbara's slippered toe tapped the floor nervously although barbara was not a nervous young woman pablo with another shrug said coldly it is to tell senor worth or senor lee that i come if la senorita tells me i trouble her that is different the young woman spoke put your horse in the barn pablo and then come in i know you have had nothing to eat since morning and you're all tired out inez is away but i will find something for you and you can rest here until father comes pablo retreated and barbara rising said you will excuse me mr blanton are you going to let that greaser spoil our afternoon he asked in a tone of offended majesty the girl laughed outright you are so funny when you puff yourself up that way and try to look so kingly pray how is this our afternoon what is left of it belongs to pablo i'm going to find him something to eat and then i mean to talk to him every minute until father comes you may stay if you like but we shall talk in spanish the face of horace p blanton expressed fat anguish rising he went closer and stood over her with a look which he imagined to be a look of melting tenderness and in a voice that fairly dripped with honeyed sweetness he began miss worth barbara i sir if barbara had shot the word at him from texas joe's forty-five it could not have been more effective i i beg your pardon miss worth he stammered certainly certainly by all means miss worth good-bye and that was as near as horace p blanton ever came to achieving the success of which he was so confident a few minutes later pablo without hesitation told barbara what had brought him to kingston a mexican friend who worked for the king's basin land and irrigation company had overheard a conversation between the company manager and the chief engineer who were together inspecting the work on the central main canal dropping into his quaint english pablo repeated what his friend had told him 
Senior Holmes, he say, the canal will go here where the stakes are set. Senior Burke say, no, you shall go that other way. But that will leave the powerhouse away eight miles, and the elevation it is not the same, says Senior Holmes. Senior Burke say, powerhouse is Mr. Worth's, not our. This way is good for us. Senior Holmes no like it. He's very mad, say my friend. He say, I will not do it. Then Senior Burke say, all right, you lose your job. Greenfield say it must go there. It is an order. Then they go away, and my friend, he tell me, cause he think maybe it is no good for powerhouse. I think maybe so Senior Worth like to know. The next morning, Jefferson Worth called upon the manager of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company. Mr. Burke, I understand that you're changing the line of your central canal. We are but my contract with your company must be considered. We've already considered it, Mr. Worth. It relates only to the delivery of a certain amount of water into your canal. There's nothing in it that binds us to build our canal on the line surveyed. End of chapter 21《Chapter Twenty Two of the Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Two Gathering of Ominous Forces. Kingston was a boiling, seething, steaming volcano of hot wrath, burning indignation, and fiery protest. Kingston cursed, raved, stormed, and resoluted, then stormed, raved, and resoluted some more. Kingston was tricked, betrayed, cheated, defrauded, insulted, and mocked, and the unspeakable villain, the sordid wretch, the miserable gamester who had ruined Kingston, was Jefferson Worth. It is unknown to this day who first brought the news that all work on the railroad for a distance of seven miles out of Kingston was stopped, and that the camps with their entire outfits had disappeared, leaving the scenes of their stirring activity as still and lifeless as if they had never existed. Next it was known that from deep well southward the construction train was still pushing its way into the basin, and that the work ahead of the train went on. Then, while Kingston was wondering, questioning, discussing, the word went quickly around that the grading crews were setting up their camps twelve miles east of the company town, and that a line of stakes led one way to the town of Barba, and the other way in the direction to meet the construction train working out from the junction with the S and C at Deep Well. Then the startled people grasped the truth of the appalling situation and awoke from their dreams. In the line of the railroad survey that had led to Kingston as straight as you could draw a string, there was now a curve seven miles away, the tangent of which would carry it twelve miles east of the company town and straight into Barba. Practically all business ceased while the citizens in knots and groups discussed the situation. Jefferson Worth was in the coast city, and telegrams to him, all save one, received no answer. To a message from Mr. Burke, he replied that the line had been changed by his orders. As for Abe Lee, they might as well question one of the surveyor's grade stakes, even Barbara, besought by the distracted citizens could tell them nothing except that her father would return Saturday. There was nothing to do save to wait for Mr. Worth and to prepare for his coming. When the president of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company arrived on the scene in answer to an urgent wire from his manager, he was at once the center of public interest. But Mr. Greenfield escaped quickly from the crowd at the hotel 
and was very soon closeted with Burke in the office. Then a boy found Horace P. Blanton. Horace P. Blanton was not hard to find. With the word that Mr. Greenfield desired to see him immediately, Horace P. Blanton increased visibly, so visible that the spectators watched the white vest with no little anxiety. Tell Mr. Greenfield that I will see him immediately, he said in a voice that was easily heard across the street. Then Horace P. arrived at the door of the company office a full length ahead of the messenger. An hour later, when Blanton reappeared to the public eye, the white vest could no longer be buttoned over his expanding importance, and beads of portentous dignity stood on his massive brow. What did Greenfield want? What was the company going to do? The crowd demanded eagerly. From his lofty height, the great one answered, Our company president simply desired my opinion and advice on this little difficulty. As to what we will do, I'm not at liberty to make a public statement, but that but was filled with tremendous potential power. Did Mr. Greenfield know that the change in the railroad line was contemplated? Certainly not. He learned of it first from the telegram that called him to Kingston. Why was the change in the road made? Horace P. Blanton smiled. It was very easy to understand if they would look over this man Worth's operations since he had been in the basin. What had he done? First, he had quietly invested heavily in Kingston real estate. Next, he had as quietly, through his various companies and agents, gained control of all the public utilities in the new country. Then he had so manipulated things that he gained absolute control of the whole South Central District, one of the richest sections of the basin, and had started the town of Barba on land owned by himself. His next move was to gain control of the railroad, which, as everyone knew, was started as an SNC line. Remember, said the perspiring master of affairs, that when this man Worth began work on the railroad into Kingston, he still owned a large amount of Kingston real estate with buildings and business establishments. Today you will find that, save for the newspaper, the telephone line, the power plant, the ice plant, the bank, and his home, he does not own a foot of land, a building, or a business establishment in Kingston. What has he done? He used the railroad to start a boom in our beautiful little city, then sold out at an immense profit, and now, having no further interest in Kingston, changes the line of his road to Barba, the town he owns, leaving us to make the most of the situation. The orator's impressive climax called forth from every hearer furious invectives against the absent financier. Following the announcement of the coming of the road to Kingston, the name of Jefferson Worth had been on every tongue. The same name was on every tongue now, but the man that had been hailed as the good genius of the reclamation was now cursed for a selfish fiend who would lay waste the whole country for his own greedy ends. Horace P. Blanton exhausted both himself and the English language in a lurid, picturesque, and vigorous delineation of the character of this monstrous enemy of the race. It was such gold-thirsty pirates as Jefferson Worth who, by preying upon legitimate business interests and coining for themselves the hard blood of the people, made it so hard for such public benefactors as James Greenfield to promote the interests of the country. It was beautiful to see how the speaker appreciated the splendid character, matchless genius, and noble life of his friend Greenfield, the distinguished president of the King's Basin Company and the father of reclamation. Some day, he declared, the citizens of the reclaimed desert, looking over their magnificent farms and beautiful homes, would appreciate the work of this man, and understand then, as they could not now, how he had toiled in their interests. As for this fellow Jefferson Worth, dark and dreadful were the hints that Horace P. dropped 
as to his future. It was Horace P. Blanton who arranged for a public indignation meeting in the Worth Opera House the afternoon of Jefferson Worth's expected return. When the day arrived, Kingston entertained the largest crowd that had ever gathered within the boundaries of the town, for word of the situation had traveled throughout the basin, and from every corner of the new country men came to the scene of the excitement to attend the massed meeting and to be present when the man that threatened Kingston with ruin should appear. Teamsters left their teams and Fresnos on the company works, ranchers left their crops and cattle, newly located settlers forsook their ditching and leveling, Zanheros deserted their water gates and levees. Bold, hardy, venturesome spirits these were, with bodies toughened with hard toil in the open air, and faces blackened and bronzed by constant exposure to the semi-tropical sun. For the desert did not yield to weaklings who would submit tamely to being skillfully juggled out of their own by a slim-fingered manipulator of business. Under the natural curiosity and love of entertainment that drew these strong, roughly-dressed, roughly-speaking pioneers to the point of interest, there was an undercurrent of grim determination to protect their new country from the schemes of unprincipled corporations. It was an old, old story. At the mass meeting there were many vigorous speeches by hot-headed ones, a masterly address by Horace P. Blanton, and, because he could not escape this, a few words by James Greenfield, who was introduced by Blanton as the father of the King's Basin Reclamation Work, and received by the citizens with generous applause. Acting upon Greenfield's suggestion, a committee was appointed to wait upon Mr. Worth immediately upon his arrival, and the meeting adjourned until nine o'clock that evening, when the committee would report. As the eventful day drew near its close, horsemen from the South Central District began to arrive. These were the men who had worked for Jefferson Worth on the canals, and who, through him, were now developing ranches of their own. These South Central men scattered quietly through the crowd, and soon in every group there was one or more of the newcomers listening attentively. And it was a significant, though in that country an unnoticed fact, that every man from Jefferson Worth's district wore the familiar sidearms of the West. But these attentive ones took no part in the discussions, speaking neither in defense nor in condemnation of the man who so stirred the public indignation. As the hour for the arrival of the stage approached, the crowd massed in front of the hotel, filling the lobby, the arcade, and the street, and still scattered through the throng were the men from the South Central District. When the stage was seen in the distance, a low murmur, like the threatening rumble of a coming storm, arose from the mass of men, and following this, a hush, like the hush of nature before the storm breaks. Into and through the strangely silent crowd, the driver of the six Broncos forced his frightened team. As the stage stopped and the passengers, looking curiously down into the excited faces of the throng, prepared to alight, a murmur arose. The murmur swelled into a roar. Jefferson Worth was not there. When the main line train discharged its basin passengers at the junction that afternoon, the engine of the construction train on the new road brought Mr. Worth as far as the rails were laid. Here, Texas Joe, with a fast team and light buckboard, was waiting. So it happened that while the crowd was massing in front of the hotel, awaiting the arrival of the stage, Jefferson Worth was at his home, quietly eating his supper and reassuring his frightened daughter. When the assembled pioneers learned from the stage driver that the man they waited for had left the junction on the engine, they were not long in arriving at the truth. 
the excitement inflamed by what seemed the fear of jefferson worth and increased by the judicious efforts of horace p blanton was intense from an orderly company of indignant citizens waiting to interview a public man the crowd became a mob pursuing an escaping victim with shouts and yells they started for the worth home and with them went the quiet men from the south central district as the sound of the approaching crowd reached the two at the table barbara sprang to her feet her face white with fear daddy they're coming they're coming she whispered trembling with anxiety for her father's safety quick el capitan is ready i told pablo to have him saddled but jefferson worth quietly sipping the cup of black coffee with which he always finished his meal returned calmly sit down barbara i won't need el capitan tonight as he spoke the crowd arrived at the front of the house and as if to confirm his words a sudden peaceful silence followed the uproar of their coming on the front porch in the red level light of the sun that across the desert was just touching the topmost ridge of no man's mountains stood the tall grizzly-haired dark-faced old-timer texas joe the heavy-shouldered bull-necked irish gladiator pat and the lean sinewy iron-nerved man of the desert abe lee while quietly pushing and elbowing their way to the front were the men from the south central district the quiet was broken by the slow drawling voice of texas joe evening boys what for is the stampede we all trust you ain't aiming to tromp out the grass none on mr worth's premises within the house barbara and her father heard the drawling challenge and the color returned to the young woman's cheeks as she smiled and whispered good old uncle tex there was in that soft southern voice an undercurrent of such cool readiness such confident mastery of the situation that her fears vanished nor was the crowd in front slow to recognize that which reassured barbara for a moment following texas joe's greeting there was a restless shifting to and fro in the crowd then the impressive hulk of horace p blanton detached itself from the common herd with hands uplifted and a gesture of mingled command and appeal he called no violence men no violence for god's sake don't shoot let me talk a minute whether he appeared to the three men on the porch or to the company behind him was not clear but texas answered you all has the floor as usual senator i don't reckon anybody here will be so impolite as to interrupt your remarks is mr worth at home he sure is altogether and very much to home could we um see him to ask about a matter that concerned virtually every gentleman in this company horace p was regaining his breath and his poise at the same time mr worth just at this minute is engaged with his daughter at the supper table his superintendent mr lee is present we'll be glad to hear what you have to say the exact formal politeness of the old plainsman was delightful in spite of the gravity of the situation, several in the crowd chuckled audibly. Mr. Worth will see your committee, said Abe crisply. The citizens had forgotten their committee. Horace P. Blanton had made it difficult to remember. Three men now came out of the crowd at different points and went forward, James Greenfield's orator following them to the porch. But as the men came up the steps, Abe spoke in a low tone to his companions, and Blanton found his way barred by the solid bulk of Pat. "'Were you also appointed to interview Mr. Worth?' asked Abe dryly. "'I understand it was a committee of three. "'I'm not exactly a member of our committee, but I'm always glad to offer my services in the best interest of the people.' "'Mr. Worth will see the committee,' said Abe." but you have no right sir 
This is an outrage, a disgrace. I... A growl from the Irishman interrupted him. That's just for what I'm thinking. The presence of such a domed hot-air merchant as yourself is a disgrace to any God-fearing company and honest workman. If Abe here will only give me half... Horace P. backed away, and from beyond reach of those huge fists said loftily, My friend, Mr. Worth, will hear of this. "'Tis likely that he will have you stand within reach of me two hands,' agreed Pat. Horace P. backed farther away. "'I shall let him know that I offered my services,' he declared with all the dignity he could command. "'Do,' called the Irishman. "'I think that if you offered yourself cheap enough, he might give you a job with a shovel on the grade. "'Tis myself would be proud to have ye and my gang of roughnecks.' Don me, but I think I could reduce your waistline to more respectable and presentable dimensions. At this the crowd laughed outright, but not one of those hardy pioneers but knew the real value of Horace P. Blanton to the reclamation work, and therefore the force of the Irish boss's remarks. While Pat and, against his will, the company's representative were amusing the crowd, Abe led the committee to Jefferson Worth. One of these men was a prominent merchant who, for the first eight months of his business in Kingston, had occupied a storeroom in one of the worst buildings, rent-free. Another was a real estate man, whom the banker had supplied with funds that enabled him to make several profitable deals that would otherwise have been lost. The other man was a successful rancher who owned a half-section of improved land joining the town site. Deck Jordan had carried him at the store for implements, seed, and provisions the first two years. Jefferson Worth greeted them in his habitually colorless voice, and they, striving to see behind that gray mask, felt that there might be something in the situation that had not appeared on the surface, in spite of the fact that the situation had been made so clear by Horace P. Blanton after his interview with the president of the company. This quiet voice, calm faced man, who had been so ready to help every worthy settler in the new country, did not appear at all the monster in disguise that the chief speaker at the mask meeting had pictured. The committee, free from the heat of the crowd and the eloquence of Horace P., felt just a little ashamed. Mr. Worth, said the spokesman with a smile, we were appointed to interview you about this railroad business. What do you wish to know, Gordon? Well, first, is it true that you've sold out practically all of your property in Kingston? Yes, it was my property. Jefferson Worth did not explain that he had sold because he was forced to turn everything he could into cash in order to build the railroad so badly needed by the new country. The committee looked serious. Is it true, continued the spokesman, that you're changing the line of the railroad so as to take it to Barba and leave Kingston out entirely? The line of the road is changed, came the exact colorless answer. Will it be possible to make some arrangement by which you would carry out your former plan and build the road into Kingston? You mean a bonus? Yes. I'm not in the market. Is there nothing that we can do to change the situation? The answer startled the committee. Tell Greenfield that he had better see me himself. Jefferson Worth's relation to the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company was always a much-discussed question among the pioneers. The new country was settled by working people of limited means, and if there was one belief common to this class, it is that all capitalists are members of one great robber band perfectly organized, firmly united, and operating in perfect harmony against their helpless victim, the public. However much they might fight among themselves over the division of the spoils, they were a unit in their common operations against the masses. From the first, Jefferson Worth was held by many to be the secret agent, the silent co-partner of Greenfield, and the South Central District seemed to justify this opinion, 
for of course the public knew nothing of the inside of that deal. The people accepted Mr. Worth's personal assistance cheerfully, thankfully, and had come to look upon him as a friend. But this did not in the least alter their belief that he belonged to the band. He was simply a generous, gentlemanly sort of robber, kin to the hold-up man who returns the railroad tickets of the passenger and refuses to rob the ladies. This railroad situation had seemed to deny the relationship between the banker and the company, and now came Worth's advice. Tell Grainfield that he'd better see me himself. It was no wonder that the members of the committee looked at each other startled and bewildered. Was it, after all, a fight between the members of the band over the division of the spoils? It was too deep for the committee. They could feel dimly that mighty forces were stirring beneath the surface, but they could not fathom what it was all about. One thing was clear— the one thing that is always clear when capital speaks to businessmen of their class, they must obey. What shall we report to the crowd? they asked as they arose to go. I figured that you could tell them what I've told you, came the answer. The crowd, when the committee briefly reported their interview, were as puzzled as members of the committee, and questioned and discussed affirmed and denied until Pat said to his companions on the porch that it sounded like a flock of damn bumblebees. When the president of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company, who dared not refuse the request of the committee, stood before Jefferson Worth, the man behind the gray mask forced him to speak first. I understand you wish to see me about this railroad matter, Mr. Worth. I told the committee that you'd better see me, came the answer without a trace of the emotion in the colorless voice. Well, I'm here. What do you want? I want a new contract from your company, binding you to build the central main canal on the line of the original survey, bringing it to a point within 400 yards of the west line of the south central district where the San Felipe Trail crosses Dry River and agreeing to deliver into my power canal, without charge, a flow of three hundred second feet of water, as in the old contract, and in addition the exclusive power rights of all of the company's canals in the basin. If I give you this contract, you will build the railroad into Kingston? When you change the line of your canal back to the original route, I will change the line of my road. Suppose I refuse. My railroad will not come into Kingston, and I will explain to the crowd out there the reason. You have worked up a pretty strong public feeling against me, Mr. Greenfield. Now make good, or stand in my place and take the consequences. James Greenfield was not slow to grasp the point. A simple explanation of the situation from Jefferson Worth with the old contract to back it up would turn the wrath of the people against the company president. Rising, he said with an oath, You win, Mr. Worth. I'll have the contract ready for your signature in the morning. Now, what will we do with that mob out there? It's your mob, Mr. Greenfield, answered Jefferson Worth. A few minutes later, from the front porch of the Worth Cottage, with Texas Joe on his right hand and Pat on his left, Horace P. Blanton announced, Our committee will report at the Opera House in half an hour. The committee reported that Kingston was saved, and the orator of the day made another speech, so far eclipsing all his former efforts that the cheering citizens were evenly divided as to whether it was James Greenfield, Jefferson Worth, or Horace P. Blanton who saved it. "'Well, boys,' remarked one of the men from the South Central District as the little party of horsemen set out for the long ride home, "'one thing is sure. Those Kingston fellows have got the railroad, but we still have Jefferson Worth, and I reckon that Jeff can build us a railroad,' Any old time he gets ready. That's right, returned another. But what in hell do you suppose it was all about? What's Jeff's game, anyhow? 
End of chapter 22《Chapter Twenty Three of the Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Three Exacting Royal Tribute. In spite of the optimistic view of the man who said that Jefferson Worth could build a railroad for Barbara and the South Central District whenever he wished, there was no little disappointment expressed in Worth's town when it became known that the company town was to have the road. When the grading camps had returned to their former locations and the construction train drew every day nearer Kingston, with the time approaching when regular trains with passengers and freight would ply to and from the company town, the feeling of discontent in Barba grew. It even came to be generally understood throughout the basin that the whole movement had been cleverly planned by Jefferson Worth to force the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company to make a large contribution to the railroad builder's personal fortune. The people sensed something in the whole transaction that they could not clearly grasp, an intangible, mysterious something, as great as it was indefinite. They felt blindly that they were being used without their consent in a game played by these master financiers, and they resented being sacrificed as dumb pawns in a move, the purpose of which they could not know. In the meantime, while the people were charging him with selling them out to gain his own ends, the man whose purpose was known only to himself was putting into his enterprise the last dollar of his resources. And another flood season, with its appalling danger, was at hand. Because his laborers on the railroad were not as the men who built the South Central Canals, working for more than their day's wages, and because, though no one knew it, Jefferson Worth's finances were so nearly exhausted, work on the road, as on the company project, was discontinued for the summer months to be resumed in the fall, perhaps. Barbara again refused to leave her father, and in the close companionship and full understanding of his daughter, the man, who lived so much alone behind his gray mask, found inspiration and strength. The telephone now connected the heading at the river intake with Kingston, and every hour of those hot days and nights Jefferson Worth listened for a call from Willard Holmes, who also had refused to leave his work while three of the fastest saddle horses in the basin were stabled with El Capitan. Texas Abe and Pablo were ready to ride at an instant's notice to rally the pioneers who were developing their ranches, building their homes, and planning their future unconscious of the real danger that hung over them. Vague rumors of the dangerous condition of the company structures floated about, and there were not wanting prophecies of disaster. But not one in a hundred of the settlers had even visited the intake at the river, or if they had, what could they judge of conditions there? The settlers were ranchers, not civil engineers. The companies and harrows turned the water into their ditches when they were asked for it. Their crops, growing marvelously in the rich soil, demanded constant attention. They had neither time, inclination, nor ability to investigate every flying rumor. As for the prophets of evil, only confirmed optimists can reclaim a desert or settle a new country, and the croakers received little attention. Besides, the great all-powerful company would surely protect its own interest, and in protecting its own would protect the interest of the settlers. It was the business of the company engineers to look after the river. The ranchers were looking after the ranches. Thus another summer went by, and the great river, save for the small toll taken by those who were reclaiming the desert it had created in the ages of long ago, continued on its way to the sea. Its time was not yet. With the return of the cooler weather, and the still further increase in the volume of new life 
that continue to pour into the basin from the great world outside, work on the railroad was begun again. But Jefferson Worth knew that the first payday would mark the end. He was as a man with his back to the wall, fighting bravely to the last blow, and he stood alone. Among the hundreds of pioneers with whom Worth had elected, as he had told Abe Lee the night of his arrival in Kingston, to take a chance, there was not one to take a chance with him now. If he lost, he would lose alone, for those who had built upon the work that he had done would not suffer through his defeat. Had any of them known the situation, they could have done nothing to help him. But no one knew, and this was the financier's one desperate chance that no one did know, not even Barbara. With his capital exhausted and no resources upon which he could realize, he went ahead with the work, apparently with the confidence of one with millions behind him. It was, in the language of the West, all a bluff. But it was a magnificent bluff. Two weeks of the month were gone when a telegram from the high official of the SNC summoned him to the city. The railroad man, in the secrecy of his private office, greeted the promoter with his usual, Hello, Jeff. I see the King's Basin is still on the map. Jefferson Worth smiled. Then, as the official's eyes were fixed upon his face in a way that he understood, he retreated behind his mask. Things are going very well, he answered. Working full gangs on that railroad of yours? We've taken on all the men we can handle. We will be ready for that last lot of steel in another two weeks. The other lay back in his chair and laughed with a hearty admiration and regard. Jeff, you are a wonder. How long do you suppose it would take Greenfield to start something with your creditors if he knew what I know? Not a line of Jefferson Worth's face changed. Only his nervous fingers caressed his chin, and the railroad man, noting the familiar signal, smiled again. Then, leaning forward in his chair, he said, Jeff, I've been keeping my eye on you ever since those days when our line was building into Rubio City and you handled the right of way for us. I've never caught you in a blunder yet. When it comes to sizing up a proposition all around, I don't believe you have an equal. Now look here. With a quick movement, he took a paper from a pigeonhole in his desk and laid it before the other. The paper was a carefully tabulated statement of Jefferson Worth's financial condition at that moment. In vain, the official tried to see behind that gray mask. Well, the word was absolutely colorless. Well, repeated the other savagely. What I want to know is this. Why in hell are you bucking Greenfield and his crowd to such a limit? Because, said Jefferson Worth carefully, I believe in the future of the King's Basin Project. Providing, he paused. Providing what? Providing someone bucks Greenfield to the limit. In one instantaneous flash, the man whose clear brain directed thousands of miles of a great railroad system caught a glimpse of the real Jefferson Worth, the Jefferson Worth who was not, as the railroad man had himself said, doing it all for a dinky little power plant. Jeff, he said slowly, when you asked us to build a branch line into the basin, I told you that we couldn't do it. As I said then, we are not in the insurance business. A railroad's business depends upon the actual development of a country, not upon backing promoters who open up a new country simply as a speculative proposition. You say you believe in the future of the King's Basin country, providing someone bucks Greenfield, and you are sure giving him a run for his money. But you have reached the end of your pile, and I know it. Now, I've been taking up this matter with our people and we're ready to take a chance on your judgment. Suppose we take over your road as it stands at a fair price. What would be your next move? 
get out and leave us in the insurance business? I would build a line from Kingston to Barber, tapping the South Central District, which is the richest section of the basin, came the instant reply. Good, but perhaps you don't want to sell the line you're building to the S&C, he suggested with a smile. I figured that you would be ready to make me a proposition about the time I had it in shape for the last shipment of steel. Worth's bluff had won. The railroad man said again, solemnly, Jeff, you are a wonder. With the passing of his nearly completed railroad into the hands of the S&C, Jefferson Worth began at once to arrange for the building of the other line from Barber to Kingston. This new road, to be known as the King's Basin Central, connecting with what was now the SNC, would give an outlet to the rich South Central District, while the Southwestern and Continental Company announced that its new branch would not stop at Kingston, but would build on south to Frontera. With a main line branch of a transcontinental railroad building straight through the heart of the new country, and their town located just halfway between the junction and the terminal, the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company saw the value of their property increased many times. The day was not far distant now when every quarter section of the desert land would be filed on by eager settlers and the once barren waste would rapidly give way to the fertile fields of the ranchers, every foot of which should yield tribute to James Greenfield and his associates. But the reclamation of the desert opened many avenues for profit other than the irrigation system. From these also the company, obeying the law of good business, had planned to take toll but the field for investment most closely allied with the fields of the ranchers, and therefore keeping even pace with the increasing wealth of the new country, had been preempted by Jefferson Worth. The company desired to add to their holdings those enterprises that had come to be known as the Worth interests. They had failed repeatedly to bring about a union of forces. Their only recourse, then, was to force the independent operator to sell to them or to eliminate him from the King's Basin project. To this end, Greenfield and Burke watched and planned on the well-known principle that whatever Jefferson Worth wanted was bad for the company, until the day when the interest of Worth and those of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company should be the same, or Jefferson Worth should be no longer a factor in the new country. While the Worth Enterprises were firmly established in all the centers of activity in the basin, the company knew that his largest interests were in Barba and the South Central District. Worth must have railroad connections with the S&C line before he could even begin to realize on his largest investments. There was every reason why he should desire to make Kingston the junction point of the road he was now forced to build. James Greenfield was not backward in letting Worth understand that he would need to pay well for a right-of-way with terminal facilities in the company town. For two weeks, Jefferson Worth tried to bring the company president to some reasonable settlement but his efforts only served to make Greenfield more determined to exact royal tribute. I tell you, said the president triumphantly to his manager, he's forced to build that line or go to smash with his town and district. No one will settle away off there from the railroad as long as they can locate in reach of Kingston or Frontera. And he's got to connect with the S&C branch at Kingston for we are the only place between the main line and the terminal. When Mr. Worth reminded them that the proposed road would benefit Kingston, and that in view of its value to their town, it would be only just for them to give him the privilege he needed, but for which he was quite ready to pay a reasonable price, Greenfield declared that his company had already given Worth quite enough. Of course, if they could find some basis upon which to unite their interests, that would be another matter. 
Then the evening mail brought to Mr. Worth certain legal-looking papers, and the next morning he called again upon Mr. Greenfield. In a spring wagon in front of the company office, Texas Joe and Abe Lee waited with a prosperous-looking stranger who also had arrived the evening before. Mr. Greenfield, I have come for your final answer on this railroad deal. On Greenfield's face was a smile of satisfaction and triumph. There were several reasons why he enjoyed seeing Jefferson Worth in a corner. I'm ready to listen to any other proposition you have to make, Mr. Worth. You have the only proposition I shall make. Really? I fear that we can do nothing this morning. The visitor turned on his heel and left the office. Later, in describing the interview to Willard Holmes, Burke commented thoughtfully, I very much fear your festive Uncle Jim played the game a little too fine. You can take some things and most men for granted, but a railroad now, and Jefferson Worth. He shifted his cigar to the corner of his mouth and cocked his head in the opposite direction. I think, Willard, that something is going to happen. What happened was this. When Jefferson Worth left the company's office, he stepped into the waiting rig beside the stranger. Go ahead, Abe, he said. Then the surveyor giving Texas the direction, the team sped away. Once in the desert, they stopped occasionally while the surveyor examined the four-by-four four redwood stakes. At a point on the S&C, four miles north of Kingston, and therefore between the company town and the main line, Abe directed Texas to stop. The surveyor, taking a notebook from his pocket, went to a corner stake and indicated with outstretched hands the direction of the boundary lines of a tract of land owned by his employer. Here we are, Mr. Worth. The place was raw desert, and except for the railroad, without a sign of life save the life of the hard, desolate land. Though in the distance could be seen the improved branches with Kingston in their midst. Standing on the slight elevation of the railroad grade, Jefferson Worth looked around silently. Then, followed by the stranger and Abe, he walked some distance west of the track. Pausing and striking his boot heel into the soft earth, he made with much less show of emotion than is exhibited by the average schoolboy in laying out a ball ground. We will build a hotel here, over there a bank. The main street will run toward the railroad. The Basin Central from Barber will come in from the southeast. And this was the beginning of Republic, the town that was built on a barren desert almost in the time it would have taken to prepare the land, plant, and grow a crop of corn. The stranger was the president of a town site company, organized by Jefferson Worth, while James Greenfield was congratulating himself that he at last had that gentleman in a trap. Worth had given the company the land and had entered into an agreement whereby he was to build a hotel in several business blocks and furnish them rent-free for one year. With the railroad to deliver material in any desired quantity, work was begun in a few days. The King's Basin Messenger and the papers in Frontera and Barba, all owned by Worth, gave full accounts of the birth of the new town and the reason why the King's Basin Central would not be built into Kingston, with glowing accounts of Worth's plans for the future of the company's rival town. The Worth Electric Company moved its plant from Kingston to Republic, the ice plant, the bank, the telephone office, and every enterprise controlled by Worth followed. While many merchants, lured by the success of the Wizard of the Desert in every undertaking and by the promise of rent-free, went with the Worth Industries, and from the world outside, many who had hesitated to enter the new country before the railroad rushed in to locate in the new town. The first building completed in Republic was a cottage for Barbara and her father. 
Meanwhile, the work on the road to Barber and the South Central District was begun. The something prophesied by Mr. Burke had happened. End of chapter 23《Chapter Twenty Four of the Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Four Jefferson Worth Goes for Help. The winter following the birth of Republic witnessed the greatest activities that had been seen in the new country. The freighters' wagons, as they had once seemed so pitifully inadequate as they crept feebly away into the mysterious silences, were replaced now by long trains, heavily loaded with building material and goods of every kind, and drawn by laboring engines that puffed and roared and clanged and screamed their stirring answer to the challenge of the silent, age-old, desolate land and still the work that had been done was small in comparison to that which was yet to do before the reclamation of Barbara's desert would be complete. The acres of land, untouched by graders Fresno or rancher's plow, were many more than the acres that were producing crops. The miles of canals and ditches that were to be built were many more than the miles already carrying water. The tent houses and shacks of the pioneers were yet to be replaced by more comfortable homes. The frontier towns, big in that new country, were yet to grow into cities. From the top of any building in any one of the four towns, one could look into the barren desert. Tourists on the main line that skirted the rim of the basin from the car windows saw only the mighty reaches of the dun plain with its thirsty vegetation stretching away to the distant purple mountain wall. Curiously, the overland passengers looked at the crowds of settlers waiting for the basin train at the junction, wondering at their hardihood. Curiously, they followed with their eyes the thin line of rails and telegraph poles leading southward until it was lost in the mystic depths of color. To the tourist, it was a fantastic dream that out there, somewhere in the barren waste, people were building towns, cultivating fields, transacting business, and engaging in all the good business activities of the race. It was as impossible to them as it had been to Willard Holmes when Barbara first introduced him to her desert and tried to make him see, as she saw, the greatness of the work of which he was to become a part. The latter part of that winter found Jefferson Worth again with his back to the wall. James Greenfield, in his attempt to hold up his rival in the matter of the King's Basin Central Junction, had wrought better than he knew. While Worth's enterprises were barely as yet paying their way, the railroad, which he was forced to build in order to protect his own interest in the town of Barber and in the South Central District, would require practically all he had realized on the sale of the other line that had so nearly exhausted his resources. The company president, in forcing him to build the town of Republic, in addition to his heavy outlay on his new railroad, forced him to take another desperate chance. For the first time he was unable to pay the men, and in thirty days large obligations for material would be due, while certain rumors carefully started by Greenfield made it almost impossible for him to raise the funds he must have. "'I'm sorry, Jeff,' said his friend, the railroad man. But with present unsafe conditions, we can't load up with any more property in the King's Basin. You know as well as I that if the river comes in, we will have to get in there to protect our interests. For if those ranchers were wiped out, our road wouldn't sell for scrap iron. 
you couldn't do it, and the Greenfield crowd wouldn't. Why, that New York bunch outside of Greenfield don't know whether the Colorado is a trout stream or a mill pond. Their actual investment doesn't amount to half what you've put into your work, for the sale of water rights to the settlers is paying all the expense of their extensions, and they won't put up a cent to rebuild their shaky old structures. And look where we stand. We've put more money into that country now than the company and you together. And we won't pay operating expenses until the land is developed. And still the public is roaring about our rates. We don't want another desert line on our hands. Quietly, Jefferson Worth sold his interest in the banks in Frontera, Barba, and Republic. And as quietly, Greenfield, who was watching, set about gaining control of these institutions. His south-central district water stock was already sold, and most of his property in Barba. Even his little home in Republic was mortgaged. Thus Worth held on for a while longer. He dared not stop his work for such a move would not only ruin his chances of negotiating the loans he needed, but by bringing upon him a swarm of creditors would make it impossible for him ever to recover his standing in the financial world. Another payday passed without the men receiving their pay, and the third was drawing near. Already there was grumbling and complaining among the men over the delayed paychecks. It would take but little more to start serious trouble. There were many in the crowd at the depot that day when Jefferson Worth waited for the train to the city, who looked with envy upon the builder of towns and railroads. Horace P. Blanton proudly pointed out to a stranger, his friend, the Wizard of the Desert, with the information that Mr. Worth had cleaned up a cool million in the new country. Several went out of their way for a closer look at him or for a possible greeting. Others cursed him roundly under their breath for a hated member of the class of parasites that live on the industry of the laborer, a financier who robbed the people, a capitalist who produced nothing. The train pulled in, and Mr. Worth, with a goodbye to Barbara and Abe, who had come to see him off, stepped aboard. No one save Abe Lee, not even Barbara, knew that her father must raise $50,000 before the first of the month or suffer financial ruin. And no one, not even Jefferson Worth himself, knew where he could find the money. Barbara, when her father was gone, though she knew nothing of the danger that threatened him, was restless and ill at ease, beset by vague and nameless doubts and fears. The little desert town, with its bustling activity, its clamorous rushing disorder, its naked newness and glaring bareness, offended her. Nothing was completed. The streets, the buildings, the very people, seemed so unsettled, so temporary. She could not shake off the feeling that it would all vanish soon, as she had often seen the phantom cities of the desert plain melt and disappear. The morning after her father left, as she rode El Capitan slowly along the little village streets that lay so dusty and flat and that ended so quickly in the open country, she caught herself wondering how long the dream would endure. The farms, too, with their new green fields and their primitive pioneer shacks, tent houses and shelters, and their acres of still unimproved land, all lying under the white blaze of the semi-tropical sun, were they more than a mirage, weirdly painted in the air by the spirit of the dreadful land, to lure foolish men to their ruin? Near the crossing of a canal, she saw a Zanjero turning the water through a new delivery gate into a new ditch, and, checking El Capitan, she watched the brown flood rolling down the channel prepared for it, and heard the dry earth hiss and purr 
as it sucked up the moisture with the thirst of a thousand years. She wanted to cry out a protest. The effort was so pitifully foolish. This awful, awful land would never yield to the men who sought to subdue it with such feeble means. From the little stream of water, no deeper than it would reach to El Capitan's knees, and no wider than his stride, she looked away and around over the seemingly endless miles of barren waste. The man at the delivery gate recorded the number of inches in his book, and, with a greeting to the young woman, mounted his horse and rode away along the canal. Barbara, moving on, left the farms behind and rode into the barren waste. This, at least, was real. This, in its very desolation, its dreadful silence, its still menace, was satisfying. But as on that morning when she first rode El Capitan into the desert from Kingston, she grew afraid. The dreadful spirit of the land so pressed upon her that she turned her horse and fled as one might fly from an approaching storm. Another restless, unsatisfying day and a lonely evening dragged by. Texas and Pat she had not seen for a week. Even Abe had not been near her since her father left. Tomorrow, she told herself, she would find them at their work and demand a reason for their neglect. The next morning she set out on El Capitan to follow the line of her father's railroad until she should find her neglected menfolk. As she rode along the right-of-way, she watched the hundreds of Mexican and Indian laborers at their work on the grade and thought of the men who had built the South Central Canal. Those men, too, had labored for her father, but they worked also for themselves. The canal they built was to reclaim their own land and to make for them farms and homes. These poor fellows on the railroad, she reflected, had no share in that which they were doing. There was in their toil nothing but the day's wage. She could not feel, as she had felt in the South Central District, that she had a part with them in their work. Here and there she recognized a Mexican from Rubio City, and these returned her greeting pleasantly, for they remembered the young woman's kindness to the poor. But by far the greater number gave her only sullen glances. She was to them only the daughter of the man for whom they toiled, and who had not paid. Passing from gang to gang and camp to camp, watching the dark faces of the laborers, listening to their sullen undertone, the young woman felt the restless, threatening spirit of the little army, as one may feel sometimes the heavily charged atmosphere before an electric storm. But she did not understand. She had never before ridden over the railroad work alone, as she had so often done in the South Central District. She grew a little frightened at last at the scowling looks and muttered remarks that followed her as she went, and she was wishing that she had not come when she saw just ahead Abe Lee and Pat. The surveyor was giving some instructions to the Irish boss, and both were so intent that they did not see Barbara approaching. As the young woman grew quite near, a low-browed Mexican who, in watching her approach, either forgot the presence of his superiors or in sheer ruffinly bravado ignored them, uttered a coarse remark to his companions about his employer's daughter. The young woman heard and turned pale as death. Pat heard and, turning quickly around, caught sight of Barbara, and saw the ruffian who had spoken looking at her. With a roar, the Irishman leaped forward, and with a blow of his huge hairy fist dropped the Mexican a senseless heap in the dirt. With cries of rage, the fellow's countrymen ran toward the white man, drawing their knives as they came. Barbara sat leaning forward in her saddle, breathless. 
Abe Lee was quietly rolling a cigarette. Pat stood motionless, his battle-scarred features set and his eyes shining like points of light. Within ten steps of their boss, the little mob stopped. Then the Irishman spoke in a voice that rumbled and shook with menacing rage. Emmanuel and Pedro, drag that carrion off the right away, and when he wakes up, if he values his life, to stay out of range of me two hands. The rest of ye hombres, get the hell out of here. The two whom he called by name did his bidding, and the rest scattered like sheep. Pat turned to Barbara. "'Tis sorry I am that you should see it, me girl, but it had to be done. "'Oh, Pat, did you—is he—' She could not speak the word, but followed with fright and eyes the still form of the unconscious man, as his companions half dragged, half carried him to the shade of a mesquite tree. "'There, there, don't worry,' said her big friend soothingly. "'He's not as much hurt as he should be.' He'll have a bit of a bump on his noodle. That'll maybe make him a bit careful with his foul tongue for a while, that's all. Barbara looked down into the face of the old gladiator, whose eyes, as they looked up at her, were soft as a child's. Oh, Pat, are you sure? He, he crumbled up so. It was awful, she shuddered. There, there, of course I'm sure. Don't I know? Look at him. He's sitting up now. He'll be on his feet in a minute. Sure enough, as Barbara looked again, she saw the Mexican rising to a sitting posture and with his hand to his head looked around in a dazed manner as though awakening out of a deep sleep. The young woman drew a long breath of relief and with a faint smile said to the surveyor who had drawn nearer, I am sorry I came, Abe. I'm afraid you'll think that I'm only in the way to make trouble, but I was so lonesome all alone at home. Why, Barbara, you know how glad we always are to see you. You must not mind this little incident. It's all in the day's work with Pat, you see. That fellow there has had his coming to him for some time. The Irishman grinned, and the young woman on the horse, with a little laugh, said, All the same, I don't think I would like you for a boss, Uncle Pat. You're too, too emphatic. And the big Irishman with twinkling eyes retorted, Sure, and if ye was boss and have a gang, you would break more hearts with your sweet face than I could heads with me two hands. Which retort effectually closed the incident. When the three had chatted a while and Barbara had scolded them for not coming to see her, Abe said, I think you'd better go back now, Barbara. But don't follow the line. Strike west of the desert until you come to the road and go in that way. We can't leave now to go with you, and some of these greasers might get gay again. I'll see you this evening. It was after nine o'clock that night when the surveyor finally reached the Worth cottage. Somewhat awkwardly he entered and seated himself in the nearest chair while Barbara, returning to her favorite rocker by the table, said, it's time you came. I was so lonely I don't believe I could have stood it another hour. Really, you and Pat and Tex have neglected me shamefully. You haven't been near since the day Father left. Even Pablo has forgotten me. Pablo is at the powerhouse at Dry River, Abe said slowly. We've all had our hands full for the last three days. I reckon you know we've not stayed away because we wanted to. Something in the man's tone and manner caused Barbara to look at him closely. Was it a fancy keeping with her gloomy spirit of the last few days, or did the surveyor's tall form droop as if with discouragement? He was not looking at her with his usual straightforward manner. He seemed to be studying the pattern of the Navajo rug that lay between them, and certainly his lean, bronzed face wore a careworn look that was new. She noticed, too, that he wore belt and revolver, which was very unusual for Abe. Of course, I know, she exclaimed. It was childish of me to complain. 
Forgive me. Abe, without answering, looked at her, a straight, questioning, challenging look that for some reason brought another flush to her cheek. Then the surveyor turned his gaze again upon the Navajo rug. I know you're tired, said the young woman again. You have so much to think about with all those men to look after and Daddy away. Come now. You sit right over here in this easy chair and shut your eyes and smoke and forget all about the work and everything while I make a little music for you. Barbara did not realize how she tried this man of the desert with a glimpse of a heaven that Abe knew could never be for him. For a moment he sat motionless without answering, his eyes still fixed upon the floor. Then with a quick, resolute movement he threw back his head and straightened himself. I'm sorry, Barbara, but I can't stay this evening. Can't stay, she cried. Why, Abe, you just came. Yes, I know. I, I just ran in to ask you to see if you... He hesitated and stammered, then finished desperately, to ask you to let me send Texas to stay here tonight. She looked at him in bewildered amazement. Why, what in the world do you mean? Why should Texas stay here tonight? Then, as a sudden possible explanation came to her mind, Abe, has Uncle Tex, is he in trouble? The surveyor smiled at her words. It's nothing like that, Barbara. Tex is all right. But I don't think that you should be left alone here with only Inez just now. Pat is at the powerhouse, and I must be at the ice plant. And Tex, he checked himself in alarm. Barbara's face was white, and her eyes, fixed upon his, were big with sudden fear as, rising slowly to her feet, she went towards him. With an exclamation, he sprang from his seat, but she regained control of herself and, quietly taking another chair nearer him, said, I think you had better tell me, Abe, just exactly what the trouble is. I know something is wrong, or you would not want to send Texas here to me. You know that I've always stayed with Inez. Why are you afraid for me? Why is Pat at the powerhouse? And why are you going to stay at the ice plant? And why do you wear that? She pointed to the heavy Colt's revolver. Little by little, she forced from the reluctant superintendent an explanation of the whole situation. How her father had been driven by the company to build the new town of Republic in addition to the construction of his railroad to Barba, and how conditions in the basin had made it impossible to sell this line to the S&C as he had sold before. He told her as gently as he could that the men had not been paid for nearly two months and that if her father did not succeed in raising the necessary funds quickly, he would lose everything. The men had been put off from day to day with explanations that their employer was away and that they would receive their pay when he returned. But ugly rumors were afloat among them and their angry uneasiness and discontent were increasing. Threats against their employer and his property were being made by the hot-headed leaders, who always appear under such conditions, and the surveyor feared that serious trouble might start at any hour. To Barbara, the situation was almost incredible. Again and again, she exclaimed with pity for her father and demanded to know why they had all kept her in ignorance of the truth and as she realized how lovingly she had been shielded from every worry, that she might feel nothing of the burden that weighed so heavily upon them, her woman heart cried out that she had not been permitted to bear her share. But I know now, she said at last, brushing aside the tears that against her will fill the brown eyes, I know now, and you men shall see that I can do something to help. She stood before him, her strong, beautiful figure bravely erect, her face glowing with the light of a determined purpose. The surveyor smiled his appreciation as he said, 
It's almost as good as money in the bank to hear you talk like that, Barbara. But you'll let me send Tex over tonight, won't you? You must do whatever you think best, Abe. But you must promise me this. From now on, you will tell me everything, just as you have always told me about the work. Abe drew a long breath. I don't know what your father will say, but I'll do it. I felt all along that it was hardly square to keep you in the dark. Of course it wasn't, she agreed. And now listen. You and Pat come here for breakfast with Texas Joe and me. Come as early as you like. He began to protest, saying that they would need to eat at daybreak in order to get back to the work by seven o'clock. But she silenced him with, And do you think that I cannot even get up at sunrise? You shall not lose a minute's time, and it will do you good to start out with one of Inez's good breakfasts. So the surveyor was forced to promise this also. Then with a soft, Buenos noches, senorita, he left her. Later, Texas Joe came to sleep in Mr. Worth's room. The night passed without incident, and when the first trace of silver-gray light shone above the eastern mesa beyond the rim of the basin, Abe Lee returned with Pat to find the meal ready and Barbara waiting to pour the fragrant coffee. While the sky was still aflame with the colors of the morning and the desert lay under a curtain of fantastic figures and grotesque patterns woven by the light, the three men mounted their horses and set out for the field of the day's labors. And Barbara at the gate watched them go until, in the distance, their forms, too, were caught in the magic of the desert's loom and woven into the airy design. Before noon, Abe came back. The men had struck. The surveyor had already sent a telegram to Mr. Worth, and in the afternoon they had his answer that he was going to San Felipe, but there was no word of hope in the message. All that day the men from the railroad were gathering in the little town, and in the early evening the laborers from the power canal at Barba joined the throng on the streets. This dark-faced, scowling crowd of Mexican and Indians was very different from the company of pioneers that met in Kingston to receive Jefferson Worth a few months before. On every hand, they were heard cursing the man who owed them their wages and threatening to take revenge if they were not soon paid. That night, Texas Joe again slept at the Worth cottage, for Barbara stoutly refused to leave her home, and Abe and Pat with the little handful of white men from the office force, stood guard at the powerhouse, the ice plant, and the other buildings that were grouped near the railroad on the edge of town. End of chapter 24、Chapter、25 of The Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 25 Willard Holmes on Trial. Scarcely had the train with Jefferson Worth aboard passed beyond the yard limits of Republic when the manager of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company in Kingston was called to the telephone by the cashier of the bank in the company's rival town. Ten minutes later, a Western Union message in cipher went from Mr. Burke to James Greenfield in the city. The afternoon of the following day, Willard Holmes at the Dry River heading was called to the telephone. Mr. Burke was on the other end of the line. There's a telegram here from your Uncle Jim ordering you to go to the city on the first train. If you can make it, catch the 420 at Frontera. I'll pack your grip and give it to you when you go through. Mr. Greenfield met the engineer at the depot in the city the next morning and escorted him to his rooms in a hotel. I was almighty glad to get Burke's wire that you were on the road, said the older man. I was afraid he would not be able to find you in time, 
You go gadding about the country so. Where did he catch you? Dry River heading. My gadding takes me mostly there, or to the intake heading these days. Just now I'm trying to patch up the spillway, which threatens to go out at any time altogether. And the heading itself is so shaky I'm almost afraid to touch it for fear it'll fall down on top of me. No one ever dreamed that these structures would ever be called upon to stand the strain they're under now. I wish... All right, all right, my boy. I think I've heard you say something like that before. I called you in to help me on a little deal that will put us in shape to build all the new structures you want. You mean the company is at last going to make the appropriation I've been begging for? Not exactly. They will if we can handle one individual. Who? Jefferson Worth. Jefferson Worth? What under heaven has he to do with the company's appropriations? He has a lot to do with the company's profits, which amounts to the same thing. At this, Mr. Holmes was silent, and his uncle was forced to continue. You know what Mr. Worth has been doing to the company, don't you? Yes, and I know what the company has been trying to do to him. Exactly. And do you know his present situation? Only in a general way. Well, in a definite way, then. He's here in the city trying to raise $50,000. He must have it before the first of the month or go to smash. If he goes to smash, the company will be able to get hold of his interest, which will give us control of the whole King's Basin project as we planned in the beginning. Then we would be able to put what you want into the system. If Worth gets the 50000 he's safe to make a million or two that would otherwise go to the company, and we wouldn't feel justified in spending any more money on new structures. But Uncle Jim, what on earth have I to do with all this? It happens that you have a whole lot to do with it, my boy, or I wouldn't have called you away from your beloved headings. You remember old George Cartwright, don't you? Willard Holmes had grown to manhood with Cartwright's sons, and his earliest memories were of boyish good times at the old gentleman's home. With James Greenfield, Mr. Cartwright had been one of his father's oldest and warmest friends. The engineer listened with amazed interest as Greenfield told him that his old friend was spending the winter on the coast, and that someone— the general manager of S&C, probably, had introduced Jefferson Worth to him. And, Greenfield finished, they have him all lined up to furnish Worth with the capital he needs to go ahead. If he gets that money, we will never be able to block him. But why don't you get Cartwright into your crowd if he's so ready to invest in reclamation projects, asked the engineer. I can't on account of White and some of the others. You know how cranky the old man is. Besides, we don't want him in the company. What we want is to block Jefferson Worth from getting hold of that money. I sent for you because you can do more with Cartwright on this proposition than any man living. You mean that you've sent for me to influence Mr. Cartwright against Jefferson Worth's interests? I mean that I expect you to use your influence in the interests of the company, in my interest. Surely, Willard, that's not asking anything unreasonable. But, Uncle Jim, you just said that if Worth gets this help, he will clean up a million or two. That looks like it would be safe enough for Mr. Cartwright. Yes, and I said also that if Worth did not get that money... The company would acquire his interest in the King's Basin. While the company president was speaking, a messenger boy knocked at the door. Greenfield read the note and handed it to Holmes, who in turn read. Mr. Cartwright left this afternoon for San Felipe. Will probably return in a week. Worth is still in town. That means you must take a little vacation, Willard. But I can't, Uncle Jim, protested the engineer. My work is in such shape that I... The older man interrupted. Your work? 
You seem to think that there's nothing of importance to the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company but drops and headings and intakes and canals, and Lord knows what else you mess around with. If you handle old Cartwright in the interest of the company, it will be the best week's work you ever did. He's likely to return any day, and you've got to stay right here and see this matter through. All that day the engineer roamed about the city, striving to find distraction in the amusements offered, but feeling strangely alone and out of place. Under other circumstances he would have keenly enjoyed the brief vacation and the change from the desert life and work, but now he could think of nothing but the situation in which he so unexpectedly found himself. Once he would not have hesitated an instant to do Greenfield's bidding. Why should he hesitate now? Why, indeed, save for this? Willard Holmes knew that it would be better for the people in the new country if Jefferson Worth continued his operations. Willard Holmes' conception and understanding of his work as an engineer had changed materially in the years since those first days with Barbara in Rubio City, even as, under his hand, the desert itself had changed. It may have been that in his long, lonely rides across the great plain in the white light of the wide, cloudless sky, something of the spirit of the slow, silent ages that had wrought in the making of the desert had touched his spirit, as it could not have been influenced by the smoke-crowded atmosphere and crowded highways of the east, or that in the lonely nights under the stars the weird, mysterious voices of the desert had taught him truths he had never heard in the noisy cries of the great cities. Perhaps as he had looked day after day across the wide, far-reaching miles with their seas and scarfs and veils of color to the purple mountains, the very greatness of the unpeopled lands forced him to a larger thinking and planning and dreaming than would have been possible in the limited views of his eastern homeland, or that the spirit of the hardy settlers awoke the blood of his own pioneer ancestors to a feeling of fellowship, or his constant struggle with the river aroused the old conquering spirit of his race, or again it might be that some powerful chord, deep hidden and silent in his nature, had been touched by the spirit of the girl who had bidden him to learn the language of her country, and who had said that she could never forgive one who was untrue to the work itself. On the other hand, there was the training of his whole professional career. Up to the beginning of the King's Basin work, the engineer had known no other creed than the creed of those corporation servants who have no higher interest than that of the machine they serve. There was also his intimate relation with Mr. Greenfield, and the debt of gratitude he owed the man who had, in every way, been a father to him. And there was the prejudice of class, the instinct that holds a man to his own peculiar people, and the argument cleverly advanced by Greenfield that the protection of the King's Basin Project would be secured. As the engineer was wandering in the aimless and preoccupied manner of one whose mind is not on his task through one of the city parks, he saw just ahead a man whose figure seemed familiar. With aroused interest, he quickened his pace. There was no mistaking that form, so strongly upright, so instinct with vigorous power, nor those broad shoulders and the finely poised head. It was the seer. Overtaking the older engineer, Holmes greeted him eagerly, and the brown eyes of the old chief shone with pleasure while he returned the young man's greeting heartily. Had the seer any engagement that afternoon? None at all. He had just arrived from the North Country and was loafing a day or two. And Holmes? The younger man laughed. 
He was a stranger in a strange land, forced by circumstances to do nothing. Good. They would find a quiet corner somewhere, and Holmes would tell his old chief about the King's Basin work. Also, the King's Basin man would tell the seer about Barbara. So they found a seat, and Willard Holmes told how splendidly the seer's dream was coming true, and in answer to many questions talked of Barbara and her life in the new country, of Jefferson Worth and his operations, and of some of his own professional difficulties and problems. And the seer, as he led the younger man on and studied the strong bronzed face that was all aglow with enthusiasm over the work, smiled quietly as he remembered the tenderfoot who had once threatened to report his chief to the company. Brave, great-hearted, generous seer. There was in all his questioning not a hint of any feeling against the younger man who had been given the place that should have been his. He fell to wondering if, after all, the company had now in homes the man they thought they had, or the man they did have, indeed, when they made him their chief engineer. If the tests were to come now, the seer did not know that Willard Holmes was even then undergoing that test. The two men dined together that evening, and afterwards, over the cigars in the seer's room, the old engineer talked of the progress and future of the great reclamation work, of its value not only to our own nation, but to the overcrowded nations beyond the seas, and of its place in the great forward march of the race. Then gravely he spoke to the younger man of his own efforts to bring the work to the attention of the people, of disappointments and failures year after year, until at last the work in Barbara's desert had been launched, and following that several other projects, until now at last reclamation had become a great national enterprise. And Willard Holmes knew that out of the millions that would be realized from these reclaimed lands, this man, who had seen the vision, would receive nothing. The seer had not even a position with an irrigation company or with a reclamation project. As he listened to the man who had literally given the best of his life to a great work, the company engineer felt as he sometimes felt when alone in the heart of the desert itself he heard its call, the call that was at once a challenge, a threat, and a promise, and as he had felt the sweet power of Barbara's presence. At his hotel, Holmes found the president of the King's Basin and Land Irrigation Company anxiously awaiting him. "'Look here,' was Greenfield's greeting. "'This thing is approaching a climax.' He handed the engineer a telegram from Burke. Willard Holmes glanced at the yellow slip of paper. Strike on the KBC looks serious. Jefferson Worth left for San Felipe this afternoon, Greenfield said quickly. There's another train in thirty minutes. We mustn't miss it. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 of The Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 26 Held in Suspense. George Cartwright, the retired New York capitalist, belonged to that older school of American financiers who, having built up large fortunes by taking advantage of the speculative opportunities of their day, looked somewhat doubtfully from the pinnacle of a successful old age upon the same adventurous spirit when shown by the active younger generation. George Cartwright was ready to take a chance, certainly. He had taken chances all his life. But George Cartwright distrusted mightily what he called the slapdash smash bang system of the modern manipulators of capital. 
Some day, he predicted, the manipulators themselves would go smash-bang along with their methods. Though retired from the rush and drive of active business, the veteran still enjoyed taking an occasional hand in the game, though more than ever he played that hand with a dignified leisure befitting the stake. A business transaction, said he, was not something to be put through with a nod and wink, or at most a half-dozen monosyllables between as many bites of a sandwich. Jefferson Worth was in desperate need of quick action. He was not playing a game of business for the mere pleasure of playing. He was fighting for his financial life, and every hour's delay increased his peril. But Jefferson Worth did not need his railroad friend's warning that an attempt to rush George Cartwright would be disastrous. The old financier was not at all backward in making known to Jefferson Worth his opinions of Jim Greenfield and the men associated with him in the company. He had had some experience with them, not altogether satisfactory to himself, but an investment in actual improvement and development enterprises, such as he understood Mr. Worth to be promoting, was rather an attractive venture. He was going for a week's trip to San Felipe, and when he returned, he would take the matter up. Barbara's father could not urge his need of immediate relief, for to do so would have been to destroy his only hope. So he was forced to await the New York man's pleasure. Nor was Mr. Worth ignorant of Greenfield's efforts, as indicated by the presence of Willard Holmes in the city. He knew also the high regard that Cartwright held for the engineer, and that he would place great value upon the company man's opinion. What would Willard Holmes do? Abe Lee's telegram announcing the strike and the critical situation in the basin changed conditions instantly. Now Jefferson Worth's only hope was to get to Cartwright without delay and to present the urgent need of immediate action. For while the chances that the old capitalists would come to the rescue were greatly lessened, Jefferson Worth's financial ruin was certain if the critical situation at home was not relieved instantly. Sending the telegram to Abe Lee, he took the first train for San Felipe. It was indeed a forlorn hope. Mr. Worth's train arrived in San Felipe about eleven o'clock in the morning. Scanning the register at the principal hotel, he found the eastern man's name, but the clerk informed him that Mr. Cartwright was out for the day sightseeing with a party of friends from New York and would not likely return until late in the evening. No one observing the quiet, gray-faced man who waited in the hotel lobby that evening could have said that there was more on his mind than a mild interest in the evening paper. Yet Jefferson Worth was reading an account of the King's Basin strike. Finishing the article, he dropped the paper on his knee, while the slim fingers of his right hand sought his chin with a nervous, caressing motion, and his expressionless eyes moved continually over the crowd in the big room. Outside, the depot bus had just stopped in front of the hotel, and a company of newly arrived guests were entering the corridor, while the bellboys were running forward to relieve them of their luggage and lead them to the spick-and-span clerk behind the register. First of the group, Jefferson Worth saw the portly, well-groomed president of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company, and with him his athletic, bronze-faced chief engineer. Even as the two were talking with the clerk, and as Worth rightly guessed, asking for Mr. Cartwright, the old gentleman with his party of friends entered. At a word from the man behind the desk, Greenfield and Holmes turned to greet the entering capitalists and his party. They were all New Yorkers, acquaintances and friends. Coming together with the width of the continent between them and their homes, their greetings were cordial, joyful, even boisterous. And as they parted to follow the waiting bellboys to their rooms, 
the western pioneer banker heard them agreeing to meet and dine together a few minutes later jefferson worth realized that a business interview with mr cartwright that evening was impossible without visible interest in anything else he raised his paper again and continued reading the next morning when the new york capitalist stepped from the elevator on his way to breakfast he found himself face to face with the man who so desperately needed financial assistance well how do you do mr worth when did you land in san felipe cartwright's tone seemed to subtly change his commonplace question into why are you in san felipe jefferson worth's answer was straightforward i arrived yesterday conditions have arisen that make it necessary for me to see you at once the old veteran looked straight into jefferson worth's face with the understanding of one who had himself passed through many a financial crisis when the issue depended upon time gained or lost sometimes the wheel of fortune turns with dizzying speed certainly mr worth come to my room in half an hour he answered quickly and as quickly moved away when the king's basin man had placed the situation fairly before him and the old financier had asked a number of pertinent questions he said mr worth i understand that neither the value nor the safety of my investment is necessarily impaired because you have a situation on your hands demanding immediate relief i can see that the capital you ask me to put into your enterprise will relieve the situation at once and enable you to place the whole business upon a solid foundation if you fail to raise this money or if you get it too late you go to the wall and i lose a chance for what seems a profitable investment as i told you legitimate promotion of actual development projects has always been attractive to me but i want to examine into matters a little further before i give you my final answer frankly i want to ask the opinion of willard holmes i would not place too much confidence in mr greenfield's judgment or rather i should say in any advice that he would give me in this particular matter but i have known willard from babyhood i knew his father and the whole family and i would be guided by his opinion as an engineer of conditions in the new country in which you are all interested fortunately holmes is here in the hotel let me have a little talk with him and i'll give you my answer without delay writing a brief note asking the engineer to come to his room he summoned a boy and directed him to deliver the message immediately a few minutes later jefferson worth in the lobby saw the boy approach holmes who was with greenfield the engineer took the note from the boy glanced at it and handed it to his companion for a moment they stood in earnest conversation then the engineer turned and moved away jefferson worth saw him enter the elevator saw the ornamented iron door close and the cage glide smoothly upward james greenfield confident self-possessed with the air of one whose position and future are secure jovially greeted one of the new york party who came up on holmes departure and the two stood laughing and chatting over their cigars jefferson worth sat alone in a secluded corner of the lobby end of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven of the winning of barbara worth by harold bell wright this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 27 Abe Lee's Ride to Save Jefferson Worth The evening that Jefferson Worth spent in the San Felipe Hotel lobby, apparently absorbed in his paper while Greenfield, Holmes, and Cartwright with their New York friends were enjoying their dinner, Barbara and her court had their anxious supper together in the Worth home. 
The night that followed was one of wakeful readiness on the part of the men who guarded the Worth property, but the strikers seemed content to curse and threaten. Breakfast the next morning, in spite of Barbara's efforts at cheerfulness, was a gloomy meal. Worn with their anxious vigil, the men ate in silence, save when they forced themselves to respond to their young hostess's attempts at conversation. They knew that another day of idleness would fit the striking laborers for reckless action. When the meal was over, Barbara insisted that they must get some sleep. They protested, but she argued rightly that there was nothing else that they could do, and that they must keep themselves fit for a possible need of their strength later. So she brought comforts and blankets for bed on the floor in the little sitting room, and, drawing the shades, announced that she would take her sewing to the front porch while they slept. Three hours passed, and a boy arrived from the telegraph office with a message addressed to Abe Lee. Speaking in low tones that the tired man within might not be disturbed, Barbara said that she would hand the message to Mr. Lee, who was in the house, and signed her name in the book. Then, as the boy went down the walk, the young woman, with trembling fingers, tore open the yellow envelope. The message read, Money today by wire from 10th National Bank, New York. Pay men and go on with work. I leave for home tonight, 1030. Jefferson Worth. Barbara and her desert had won against the company through Willard Holmes, but Barbara did not know that. Behind her, as she stood with the yellow slip in her hand, the sitting-room door opened softly, and turning, she saw Abe standing on the threshold. The alert surveyor had been aroused by the coming of the messenger. Even before she spoke, her face told him the good news. Abe went at once to notify the strikers that they would receive their pay on the morrow without fail. To several of the leaders he exhibited the telegram with Mr. Worth's instructions, pay men and go on with work, and they in turn verified to their countrymen the good news. As the word went around, the dark scowling faces were lighted with satisfaction and pleased anticipation. Curses and threats were silenced in laughter and merry talk. In a short hour or two, the little army of striking laborers that had for days been in a mood for any violence became a good-natured crowd bent on enjoying to the full their short holiday. Barbara insisted on serving dinner for her three friends, and with the strike practically settled and the weary strain of the situation removed, the four made the meal a jolly one. When they could eat no more, they still sat idling at the table, reluctant to break the spell of their companionship. Texas Joe, leaning back in his chair, with his slow smile drawled in an inconsequential way, I reckon now that the financial obsequies of Mr. Jefferson Worth has been indefinitely postponed, owing to the corpse refusing to perform, that company bunch will wear a mourning because said funeral didn't come off as per schedule. Them roosters are sure a humorous lot. Of course they will be sorry, Uncle Tex, said Barbara. It's good business, you know, to want your competitor to fail. The old plainsman shook his head. I sure don't sobby this financiering game, honey, but I'm staking my pile on your dad just the same. Well, said Pat, we're all glad on Mr. Worth's account, of course, that it's over as easy as it is. But for myself, I was all the same to him. And of ye, Barbara, I'd be wishing the dang greaser'd kept on a-striking, so long as you'd let me put my feet under your table. They all laughed at Pat's sentiments, which the other two men endorsed most heartily. Then the surveyor, with his two helpers, went uptown. Stopping at the bank and showing the cashier his message from Mr. Worth, Abe asked if he had heard from New York. Before answering, the man picked up a telegram from his desk and scanned it thoughtfully. No, 
said Greenfield's cashier, as if against his will. We've heard nothing today. Just before the close of banking hours, the surveyor again called at the bank. Any news from New York yet? Yes. We had their wire just after you left. Well, asked Abe impatiently, isn't it all right? It's all right, Mr. Lee, except that we were forced to answer that we could not handle the business. The surveyor searched his pockets for tobacco and cigarette papers. I think you'd better explain, Mr. Williams. Again, the cashier hesitated, turning thoughtfully to the telegram on his desk. Then he said reluctantly, It is Mr. Greenfield's orders, Lee. With a cloud of smoke from Abe's lips came the question. And the other banks in the basin? You would only waste your time. Thanks, Williams. Adios. Abe Lee walked slowly out of the building. Moving aimlessly down the street, unseeing and unheeding, he ran fairly into Pat and Texas, who were talking with a rancher from the South Central District. The voice of the Irishman aroused him. What the hell? Is it drunk you are? Then, as he caught a good look at the surveyor's face, For the love of God, what's wrong with you, lad? The rancher also was looking at him curiously. Abe gained control of himself instantly with an apologetic laugh. Excuse me, Pat. I was thinking about the work and didn't see you. There's a little matter that I want to take up with you this afternoon. I'll be too busy for it tomorrow. The rancher, with another word or two, turned away. Then Abe, in a low tone, exclaimed, Let's get away from the crowd quick, where we can talk. They started down the street, and instinctively their feet turned toward Jefferson Worth's home instead of toward the office. As they went, Abe explained the situation. Pat cursed the bank and James Greenfield and the company with no lightweight curses. Hell will sure be a poppin' when them greasers don't get their paychecks, as we've been promising them, drawled Texas Joe, shaking his head mournfully. For regular unexpectedness, this year financerin' business gets me plumb locoed. What will you do, Abe? Greenfield sure takes this trick, don't he? They had reached the gate of the Worth home and had paused as people sometimes will when engaged in conversation of absorbing interest. Before Abe could answer Texas, Barbara, who sat on the porch, called laughingly. What's the matter with you men? Are you hungry again? Why don't you come in? In consternation, the three looked blankly at each other. Pat growled another curse under his breath. Texas shook his head doubtfully. Abe groaned. She'll have to know, boys. Slowly they went up the walk, and Barbara, as they drew near, did not need words to tell her that something seriously wrong had happened. When Abe had explained it in as few words as possible, she said, But it will only be for a few days. A few days will be too late, said Abe bluntly. We've promised these greasers and Indians that we will pay tomorrow without fail. When we don't pay, on top of all the trouble we've had, no explanation will stand. They'll go on the warpath, sure. If they were white men, it would be different. Well, why don't you telegraph Father and let him bring the money or send it by express from San Felipe? But he couldn't get the cash started before tomorrow afternoon. Then it would have to go around by the city and wouldn't get here until three days later. Williams didn't tell me, you see, until he knew that the San Felipe Bank would be closed before I could get a message through. They sat in troubled silence, Pat in sullen rage, Texas squatting on his heels cowboy fashion, Abe pulling at a cigarette, Barbara leaning forward in her chair. Three hours before, they had been so merry because the trouble was over. Now they faced a situation many times more perilous than before. With a quick gesture of decision, Abe tossed aside his cigarette. Tex, where's that buckskin horse of yours? In Clark's stable. Want him? Yes. Give me a good feed and bring him here as soon as he's ready. 
Bring one feed and a canteen, and while the horse is eating, go around to my room and get my gun. Without a question, the old plainsman left the group and walked swiftly away. Barbara puzzled for a moment, then asked, Are you sending Tex to San Felipe for the money, Abe? I'm going myself. Tex will be needed here. He's worth three of me at this end of the game. Today is Wednesday. That buckskin will make it to San Felipe in 26 hours. That will be tomorrow evening. If your father can have the money ready, I shall be back here by Friday night. While speaking, he was tearing a leaf from his notebook. Quickly, he wrote a message to Jefferson Worth. Pat, take this to the telegraph office and make them rush it. It must catch Mr. Worth before he leaves at 10.30 tonight. Barbara sprang to her feet. Oh, please let me go. Let me do something. Abe handed her the slip of paper with a smile. If you don't mind, I will take a nap in your father's room. And will you ask Inez to have a bite to eat ready for me with a sandwich or two that I can slip into my pocket? Pad, you stay here and don't let anyone disturb me until 5.30. Then call me sure. Tex will be here with the horse by that time. With the last word, he disappeared into the house. When Pat called him, he was sleeping soundly. Barbara had sent the telegram, and with her own hands prepared his supper and a lunch. While he ate, the surveyor gave brief instructions to his two helpers. Then Barbara went with him to the gate where the buckskin horse, one of that tough, wiry, half-wild breed native to the western plains, waited, head down, with bridle reins hanging to the ground. As Abe tightened the cinch and took his spurs from the saddle horn, the girl went closer to his side. I wish you did not have to go, she said as he stooped to put on a spur. He straightened up and looked at her. The brown eyes regarded him seriously. Why, Barbara, you're not afraid. Texas and Pat will be here. It's not for myself, Abe, it's you, she answered. You've had such a hard time since this trouble began, and now this long, lonely ride. I wish there was some other way. Stooping quickly so that she might not see his face, he adjusted the other spur with trembling fingers. I shall think of you every minute, Abe, said the young woman softly. The strap of the spur required several ineffectual efforts before the man could fasten it on the steel button. At length it was on, and, rising again, he threw the bridle reins over the horse's head, holding them in his left hand on the animal's neck. Barbara came still closer and with her finger traced the design carved on the heavy Mexican saddle. You will be careful, won't you, Abe? The hand on the horse's neck tightened on the reins as the surveyor looked straight into the young woman's eyes a moment, as if searching for something that he knew was not there. Then he held out his free hand, saying in Spanish with a smile, Adios, sister. Giving him her hand, she answered in the same soft musical tongue, Adios, my brother. Turning, he put his foot in the stirrup, and with the easy, graceful swing of the western horseman, he mounted, and the buckskin, as his rider lifted the bridle reins, struck at once into the long, lazy lope of his kind. Leisurely, Abe Lee rode along the main street of the little town. The strikers, idling in front of the stores, leaning against the buildings or awning posts, squatting on their heels on the sidewalks, or sitting in rows on the curbing, saw him pass without interest. If they thought anything, it was that the superintendent was going to Kingston on some business or other for their employer, Senior Worth, or that tomorrow the man on the buckskin horse would give them the slips of paper that they would take to the senior at the bank who would give them their money. Still riding leisurely, Abe left behind the town that Jefferson Worth had built in the barren desert and passed the newly improved ranches on the outskirts. 
Without hurry, even checking his horse to a shuffling foxtrot at times, he reached Kingston. From the window of his office in the company building, Mr. Burke saw the horseman as he passed, and the company manager, who was paid for thinking, shifted his cigar to one corner of his mouth and tilting his head grew thoughtful while the buckskin horse carried his rider out of kingston toward the south reaching the old san felipe trail the surveyor swung his horse to the west and leaving behind all that man had so far wrought in la palma de la mano de dios rode straight toward the mountain wall that in grim barrenness and forbidding solitude had stood sentinel through the unnumbered ages, shutting out from the land of death the world of life that lay on the other side. As that mighty wall had from the beginning turned back every moisture-laden cloud from the thirsty, starving land, so it seemed now to impose itself as an impassable barrier against the man who rode to save the work of Jefferson Worth. The buckskin horse, as if realizing that this was no jaunt of ten or twenty miles, held to his steady machine-like lope that measured the distance of each swing with the accurate regularity of a pendulum, while the lean, loose body of his rider, resting easily in the saddle, yielded without resistance to the horse's every movement, so that those laboring muscles working so smoothly under the yellow hide might not be called upon to adjust themselves to the sudden strain of unexpected changes in balance. Mile after mile of the dun plain slipped away under those apparently slow measuring hoofs at surprising speed. Now and then, at the slightest signal from Abe, the gait was changed from a lope to that easy shuffling foxtrot that lifted the dust in a great yellow cloud. Straight ahead the rider saw the sun go slowly down behind the mountain wall. He watched the purple shadows that he knew were canyons deepen, and the blue that he knew to be shoulders and spurs and points change and darken until every detail was lost in the slate gray mass while against the light that lingered in the west every tooth, knob, and peak of the skyline showed a sharp, clean-cut silhouette. He saw the colors of the desert fade and melt as the dark mantle of the night was drawn quietly over the plain. He heard the night voices of the desert awakening and sensed the soft breathing of the lonely land and in his nostrils was the indescribable odor of the ancient seabed that for uncounted thousands of years had lain under a blazing sun and scorching wind and mistless nights, knowing no touch of human life save the passing presence of those who dared to follow that one thin trail. And always with that dogged regularity the sandy miles were being measured by those steady hoofs. At Wolf Wells, as the last faint tinge of light went out of the sky beyond the black mass of no man's mountains, Abe drew rein for the first time. Dismounting, he slipped the bit from the horse's mouth, and the animal plunged his nose deep into the refreshing water. The buckskin, with the blood of his wild ancestors strong in his veins, was no dainty, tenderly nourished aristocrat that needed to be rested, cooled, and blanketed before he could slack his thirst. Without pausing, he drank his fill, and then, lifting his head, drew one long, deep breath of satisfaction and stood ready. In the dark, Abe felt his saddle girths, then ran his hand over the moist, warm neck and slapped the strong hips approvingly. Good boy, Buck. Good old boy. Without thought of further rest, he went on, on, and on, without pause or check save the occasional change in gait from the swinging lope to the shuffling foxtrot, until they reached the line of the ancient beach, and the buckskin, with head down, labored heavily up the steep grade to the mesa. 
It was at this point, four years before, that the four men and the boy had stopped to look away over the awe-inspiring scenes of wide sky, measureless plain, rolling sand hills, dream lakes, and ever-changing seas of color, all hidden now in the blackness of the night. In the dark, hall-like Devil's Canyon, the sound of the horse's feet echoed and re-echoed sharply from the rock walls, while the darkness was so thick that Abe could not see the animal's head. At Mountain Spring, where travelers into the desert always fill their water barrels, Abe stopped again. It was a little past midnight. Loosening the saddle girth and removing the bridle, the surveyor let his horse drink, and, taking a sack from his one feed of rolled barley, he deftly converted it into a rude nose-bag by cutting a strip in each side two-thirds the length of the sack and tying it over the horse's head. After eating his own lunch, the surveyor stretched himself out flat on his back on the ground, with every muscle relaxed. The sound of the horse munching his feed ceased. The animal's head dropped lower, and he, too, wise in the wisdom of the open country, relaxed his muscles and rested. For an hour they remained there. Then again the bridle was adjusted, the saddle girths tightened, and they went on. But the gait was not so measured now, nor the pace so steady, for they were well into the mountains, climbing toward the summit. But still there was no pause for breath, no relief for the straining muscles of the horse or for the weary, aching body of the rider. Crossing over the summit at last, they were on the long western slope of the range with much better going, and the buckskin again carried his rider swiftly on, while the thud and ring of the iron-shod hoofs on the rock-strewn road aroused the echoes in the dark and lonely hills. Hour after hour of the long night passed, with no sound to break the silence, save the sound of the horse's feet, the rattle of bridle chains, the click of spur or the creak of saddle leather. And when the gray of the morning came, they were in the foothills. Behind them the mountains, a bare and forbidding wall on the desert side, lifted ridge upon ridge with the green of pine on the heights, oak on the slopes and benches, and sycamore in the lower canyons. Streams of bright water tumbled merrily down their clean rocky courses, or rested in quiet pools in the cold shadows. Before them spread the beautiful coast country, sloping with many a dip and hollow and rolling ridge and rounding hill westward to the sea. At the first ranch house they stopped, a short hour's rest with breakfast for man and horse, and they were away again. For dinner, Abe drew rain in a beautiful little village in the heart of the rich farming country, and at four o'clock, from the summit of a low hill, he saw the ocean, with the smoke of San Felipe dark against the blue of sky and water. They were yet three hours of riding. The tired man straightened himself in the saddle. The horse felt the motion and responded with a slight quickening of the movements of those wonderful muscles that still worked so steadily and smoothly under the buckskin coat. The animal seemed to realize with the man that the end of the journey was in sight. Yet it would take another hour and another of that steady measured lope and the easy shuffling foxtrot. The sun was dipping downward now toward the ocean's rim, and sea and sky were a blaze of glorious light while on that dazzling background sail and mast and roof and steeple were painted black with edges of yellow flame. The horse, with the dogged determined spirit of his breed, was drawing upon the last of his strength, the strength that had brought them so many miles without faltering. But still he answered gamely to the lifting of the reins with that measured swinging lope. 
But as he watched the sun go down, Abley forgot his weariness, forgot his aching muscles and stiffened limbs. He remembered only that miles away in the little desert town there was a mob of striking Mexican and Indian laborers who, disappointed and enraged at not receiving their promised pay, would be ready now for any deed that promised to satisfy their blind desire for vengeance. He knew that no explanations would be accepted, no plea for patience would be heard. They could not understand. In their eyes they had been tricked, fooled, cheated, defrauded of their just dues. They knew no better way to redress their wrongs than the primitive way, to destroy, to injure, perhaps to kill. And Barbara, Barbara was there. If only they would let that one night pass. If only Tex and Pat and the little handful of white men could hold them off a few more hours until he could get back. Until he could get back. But what if Jefferson Worth had not received the telegram before he left San Felipe? What if there should be a still further delay in getting the money? Through the lighted streets of the harbor city, the buckskin and its rider finally made their way. A policeman looking suspiciously at the dust-begrimed, sweat-caked, trembling horse that stood with legs braced wide and drooping head, and at the haggard-faced rider directed the surveyor to the hotel a block away, and then stood watching them as they moved slowly toward the end of the ride. End of chapter 27Chapter 28 of The Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 28 What the Company Man Told the Mexicans. While Barbara and her three friends at home were rejoicing over the message from Jefferson Worth, telling them that he had secured the money needed to go on with the work. Willard Holmes was alone in his room in the San Felipe Hotel. Following the engineer's interview with Mr. Cartwright, he had passed through a stormy scene with James Greenfield, and the words of the president of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company were ringing in his ears with painful monotony. Discharged, discharged discharged. For the first time in his life, the engineer had heard those words addressed to himself. He could not rid himself of the feeling that he had come suddenly to the end of his career. All his life, Willard Holmes had had back of him the powerful influence of his foster uncle. Positions and opportunities had come to him from the first, without effort on his part. Notwithstanding the fact that his ability as an engineer was naturally of a high order and that his training was of the best, he had never been dependent wholly upon these things. Other and stronger considerations had always given him his place. For the first time in his life, he faced the world of his profession with nothing but his naked ability as an engineer to speak for him. While his abrupt dismissal from the company compelled him to realize with sudden force how overshadowed his work had always been by outside influences and how dependent he had been upon them, he felt lost and bewildered, knowing not which way to turn. His future seemed a blank. He had been anxious and eager to get back to his work in the basin, but he had not realized how much that work meant to him, how his plans, his dreams, his whole life work had become centered in the reclamation of the King's Basin Desert. If his dismissal had come from anything connected with his work, he told himself, it would be different. He thought bitterly how he had struggled with insufficient equipment and inadequate makeshifts of every kind to hold the company system together that the pioneers might have the water 
without which the work of reclamation could not be done. He knew every stake and pile and plank and crack and patch in the whole system. He had learned the tricks of the river and was familiar with the conditions peculiar to the desert country. He knew the terrible danger of the flood season that was only two months away. He had planned and prepared to meet emergencies that would be sure to arise. And now, because he had refused to deliver the settlers wholly into the hands of these New York capitalists who cared nothing at all for the real work, save as it could be made to increase their money bags, he was turned out. There was now no reason even for his return to the King's Basin. Why, he asked himself, should he go back? To see some other man doing his work? To watch as an outsider the development of the land, or perhaps, as was more likely, to stand idly by and watch its destruction. But even as he told himself that he could not do that, he knew that he would go back, that indeed he must go. The desert called him, summoned him imperatively. The desert and something else something that was as mysteriously impelling as the spirit of the land, something that had grown into his life even as his work had grown, something that seemed to him now a part of his work from the beginning. All that day the engineer avoided Greenfield and his eastern friends. In the evening he dined alone, and after the meal sat alone in the hotel lobby with his back to the crowd, watching through the big window the life of the street outside, watching without seeing. Moodily he pulled at his cigar, his thoughts far away in Barbara's desert, where, unknown to him, Abe Lee on the buckskin horse was riding, riding, riding to save the work of Jefferson Worth. His thoughts were interrupted by the voice of Jefferson Worth himself, who, seeing the engineer alone, had gone to him. Holmes, drawing another chair close to his, greeted Barbara's father with eager questions. Have you heard from home? Is everything all right? The older man accepted the chair by the engineer's side and answered his questions by saying, Mr. Cartwright instructed his New York bankers to wire this money to my account in Republic. I notified Abe to pay them in tomorrow and go on with the work. It was characteristic of Jefferson Worth that he did not attempt to thank Holmes for his part in the transaction with Cartwright, but in some subtle way the engineer was made to feel his gratitude and appreciation. After a pause, Worth continued. I'm going to start back tonight on the 10.30. When are you figuring on going back? The engineer smiled grimly. I can't figure on anything definite just now, Mr. Worth. I might as well tell you, I suppose, that I am no longer connected with the company. The announcement did not appear to be unexpected to Jefferson Worth, but his slim fingers caressed his chin as he said, I was afraid of that. Have you anything in view? Holmes felt that not only had Worth foreseen the situation, but that he had already set in motion some movement to relieve it. No, sir. It came so suddenly that I scarcely had time to think. I figured some time ago that the company would not be able to hold you much longer, was the surprising comment. The S and C has been looking for a good man to put down in our country for some time. Your experience on the river would make you particularly valuable to them under existing conditions. I told them about you. They've been holding off waiting developments. If I were you, I would get in touch with them at once. You can go up to the city with me tonight. We will stop over and look into the proposition, and then if it is all right and agreeable to you, we can go on home together. Jefferson Worth seemed to understand perfectly the engineer's desire to return to the King's Basin. 
Before Holmes could express his delight and gratitude at the unexpected relief, a call boy, passing among the guests, shouted, Mr. Jefferson Worth, Mr. Jefferson Worth. The banker opened the message, read it, then, without a word, handed the yellow slip to his companion. The engineer read, Banks in Basin won't accept New York business. Can't handle paychecks. Ably starting for San Felipe overland tonight. Have money and fresh horse ready. Barbara. Holmes looked in consternation from the papers in his hand to Barbara's father. The face of Jefferson Worth expressed nothing. It was perfectly calm and emotionless. Only the slim fingers were lifted to the chin, as if behind that gray mask the mind of the man was groping, seizing, searching, examining every phase of the situation so suddenly confronting him. In answer to the engineer's questioning look, he spoke in colorless words. With machine-like exactness, as if the matter under consideration were a mere mathematical problem presented for his solution. The company owns the banks. Greenfield went into the telegraph office this morning as Cartwright and I came out. Abe would get my message by nine o'clock. The banks would get Greenfield's instructions the same time. Abe would at once promise the men their money tomorrow. That cashier didn't tell him they couldn't handle the business until too late for him to get me before the banks closed here. Greenfield is playing for time so that the strikers will make trouble. Abe has it figured out right. He could get here and back before I could get the money to him by train. He should reach here tomorrow night. There's nothing to do except to see Cartwright this evening so that he can wire New York tonight and I can get the cash through the bank here before Abe gets in tomorrow. As he grasped the situation and the methods Greenfield had employed to injure Worth's interests, the engineer's eyes flashed. Mr. Worth, he cried, that is the dirtiest trick I ever saw turned. It's business, Mr. Holmes. Mr. Greenfield is merely using his advantage, that's all. The methods of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company in La Palma de la Mano de Dios were the methods of capital, impersonal, inhuman, the methods of a force governed by laws as fixed as the laws of nature, neither cruel nor kind, inconsiderate of man's misery or happiness, his life or death, using man for his own ends, profit, as men use water and soil and sun and air. The methods of Jefferson Worth were the methods of a man laboring with his brother men, sharing their hardships, sharing their returns, a man using money as a workman uses his tools to fashion and build and develop, adding thus to the welfare of humankind. It was inevitable that the company and Jefferson Worth should war. James Greenfield served capital. Jefferson Worth sought to make capital serve the race. But in the career of each of these men, who had been driven by the master passion, good business, into the hollow of God's hand, the dominant influence was a life. In the career of Jefferson Worth, it was Barbara. In the career of James Greenfield, it was Willard Holmes. In the King's Basin Reclamation Work, the New York financier, whose relation to Willard Holmes was a tribute to his love for the engineer's mother, felt that in some way, for some cause which he could not understand, the younger man was growing away from him. Their relation of employer and employee seemed to mar the close intimacy of the old ties, and the older man looked forward eagerly to the time when his business plan should be carried to a successful climax and they would both leave the West for their eastern home. That morning in the hotel, when he saw Holmes go with Cartwright to Jefferson Worth, 
and by that knew that the engineer had used his influence against the interest of the company he was astonished and hurt he felt that the boy whom he had reared as his own had turned against him as the president of the company he abruptly discharged the engineer for he could do nothing else as the foster father of willard holmes he was still proud of the younger man's strength of character for under all his anger at being thwarted in his plan against worth he knew in his heart that the engineer had done right as the day passed and the engineer did not seek his company while greenfield's own stubborn pride forbade him to go to holmes the older man's heart grew more and more lonely that evening, when he saw Jefferson Worth and Holmes together in earnest conversation, and through all the following day saw them apparently associated intimately in some plan or enterprise, for the first time personal feeling entered into his consideration of the whole situation. He felt that his business rival had become his rival for the affections of the boy he loved. The business victories of Jefferson Worth he could accept without feeling, but that this man, a stranger, should come between him and his foster son, the child of the woman he had loved with lifelong fidelity, stirred him to a vicious personal hatred. At dusk that evening he saw Holmes and Worth dining together. When the meal was over, he sat in the lobby, ostensively chatting with friends, but covertly watching the two, who seemed to be awaiting someone. Suddenly he saw them rise quickly and start toward the main entrance. A dusty, khaki-clad man of the desert was entering the hotel. Tall, lean, bronzed, his face haggard and strained with anxiety, his eyes bloodshot through loss of sleep, his figure expressing in every line and movement deadly weariness and aching muscles, he strode forward into the hotel lobby, his spurs clinking on the white tile floor. Greenfield recognized Abe Lee and grasped the situation instantly. The president of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company knew why the surveyor had come to San Felipe and he knew what he would carry back. If the money to pay the strikers reached its destination, Jefferson Worth would win. If not... At half-past nine o'clock that evening, the thoughtful manager of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company received a cipher message from his superior that drew a long, low whistle from his lips. For almost an hour he considered with an occasional quiet curse. Then, because he was a good company man, he put on his hat and strolled leisurely down the street of Kingston, apparently enjoying his evening cigar. Once he stopped to greet a belated rancher. Again he paused to chat a moment with a citizen. Once more he halted to exchange a word with a group of company men, and later stopped to greet three Mexicans who were in from the company's camps. The manager asked of the work, if all was well. Si, sí, senor. Then, naturally, Mr. Burke inquired for news of their countrymen, the strikers of Republic. The Mexicans, coming from the distant camp, could tell him nothing. They had heard little. Could Senor Burke tell them of the situation? The manager was quite sure that everything would be all right with the men on Jefferson Worth's railroad day after tomorrow. That was Bueno. Yes, Mr. Worth's superintendent was starting from San Felipe that very evening with money, thousands of dollars, American gold, to pay the men. He was coming alone through the mountains on horseback. Without doubt, the men would receive their pay. The manager was glad. Si, sí, senor. Gracias, senor. Buenas noches. Good night. End of chapter 28
Chapter 29 of The Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 29 Tell Barbara I'm All Right. When Abe Lee, after twenty-six hard hours in the saddle, dismounted in front of the San Felipe Hotel and entered the lobby, his usual perfect nerves were strained almost to the breaking point. For weeks the surveyor had carried the burden of Jefferson Worth's financial condition as if it were his own. With the prospect of seeing the work he loved better than his life wrecked and taken over by the company, he had for days faced the critical situation of the strike. Then, in the very hour of relief, the situation had become seemingly hopeless. Abe Lee, better than anyone, knew the temper of the Mexican and Indian strikers. He realized fully how great the chances were that at the very moment when he finished his ride for relief, the town of Republic was the scene of tragic violence. If Jefferson Worth had left San Felipe ignorant of the failure of his effort to relieve the dangerous situation at home, or if by some chance the money so desperately needed was not ready, Abe knew that the cause was lost. The company would triumph. As he entered the hotel, his eyes, searching eagerly for his employer, fell first on James Greenfield. With a movement wholly involuntary, the hand of the overwrought desert man came to rest on his hip, close to the heavy colt's forty-five. Then he saw Jefferson Worth and Willard Holmes moving towards him. When a man feels himself hard-pressed in a fight and is struggling desperately to hold his ground, he has small thought for the trifling courtesies demanded by custom. Without returning the greetings of the two men, and instinctively drawing apart from Holmes, the surveyor shot a single question at his employer. Have you got it? Everything is all right, answered Jefferson Worth, and with his words something of his calm confidence went to Abe Lee. When the two men reached Worth's apartment, the surveyor, without hesitation, began stripping off his clothes. I want a good bath first, he said, and while I'm at it, will you please have a good thick beefsteak cooked rare and sent up here? Then I'll sleep for a couple of hours. That buckskin of Texas Joe's is standing in front of the hotel. He's about all in. I wish that you would see that he's cared for. As he finished speaking, the tall, lean figure of the surveyor disappeared through the bathroom door. Mr. Worth sent the order for his superintendent's supper to the cook with a sum of money that ensured immediate and careful attention. Then, with his own hands, he led the buckskin horse to a barn where the animal would have the care he had so well earned. When Mr. Worth returned to the hotel, he opened the door of his room softly. There was a tray of empty dishes on the table an odor of cigarette smoke in the atmosphere, and in his employer's bed, the surveyor, sound asleep. Abe Lee understood the value of every moment, even in taking rest. Two hours later, Mr. Worth, going again to his room, found that the surveyor had just finished dressing. With a smile, the financier handed Abe a slip of yellow paper. It was a message from Barbara, saying that so far all was well at home, and concluded with the words, Love to Abe. Without a word, Abe turned away to buckle about his hips the broad cartridge belt with its worn holster and his big black gun. But Barbara's father did not see him slip the bit of yellow paper into the pocket of his blue flannel shirt. Then Mr. Worth gave the surveyor a black leather bill book, stuffed to its utmost capacity and secured with rubber bands. Here it is, he said. Abe stored the package in an inner pocket of his khaki coat and was ready. 
At the barn they found Willard Holmes waiting with two horses. The engineer wore a new belt, holster, and revolver. When he had greeted them, he said, Well, are we all ready? I have a lunch here. Is there anything else? Abe looked at him questioningly and turned to Mr. Worth. Mr. Holmes is going back with you, said the banker. For an instant the surveyor hesitated, but something in his employer's tone caused him to withhold any objection, and with no comment he turned to inspect the horses. The animals were of the same tough breed as the buckskin. They're all right, are they? Abe asked of the livery man. You can see for yourself, came the answer. You know the kind. They ain't nothing that can outlast them, and Mr. Worth said that was what he wanted. We will need one feed apiece, said Abe. Put it in two sacks, you know. Sure, returned the man. I'd have had it ready, but this year gentleman didn't tell me. While the liveryman was preparing the grain, Abe examined the saddles and cinches. Are your stirrups right? he asked Holmes. I think so. You had better know. We don't want to stop to monkey around in the dark. The barn man grinned, and with a wink at the surveyor, as the engineer decided after trying that he had better shorten the straps a hole. Abe silently assisted him in adjusting them. Then, swinging into his saddle, the surveyor said to his employer as the horses moved ahead, Goodbye, sir. Wire little sister that I'm coming. Along the lighted city streets they rode at a pace that seemed to Willard Holmes more fitting for a lady's gentle exercise than for two men bound on an errand against time. The eastern man urged his horse ahead, but his companion held back, and Holmes was forced to check his speed and wait for the other to come up with him. To the engineer's attempts at conversation, the other answered only in monosyllables, or not at all. There had been no opportunity for Mr. Worth to explain to Abe the engineer's part in helping him to secure the money from Cartwright and the consequent discharge of Holmes by Greenfield. To the surveyor's mind, his companion belonged to the enemy. He could not understand why, with the victory or defeat of Jefferson Worth in his fight with the company hanging upon his superintendent's mission, the company's chief engineer should volunteer to accompany him. The presence of Greenfield and Holmes in San Felipe, the action of the banks controlled by the company, made it clear to Abe that they understood the dangerous situation of Mr. Worth and his urgent need of immediate relief. The company had everything to gain if the arrival of the money at the scene of the strike could be delayed even for a few hours. But Abe had seen that it was Jefferson Worth's wish that Holmes go with him, and the surveyor could not, in the presence of Holmes, discuss the question. On his part, Holmes felt the antagonism of his silent companion, but could not guess the reason, while Abe's attitude of aloofness prevented the engineer from making any explanation. He told himself that the surveyor was naturally overwrought with the mental and physical strain of his long ride, and that later, at some more opportune time, when they halted for lunch and rest, perhaps, they would come to a more agreeable spirit of companionship. But he could not content himself with the slow pace when there was such an evident need of haste. It was all a mistake, he thought, for the man already wearied to undertake the return trip. A fresh rider was as necessary as a fresh horse. The surveyor was evidently too exhausted to push on at the necessary speed, and Holmes felt that it fell upon him to set the pace and thus force his companion to the exertion required. So he continued urging his horse ahead, while Abe's mount, held back by his rider, tugged at the reins and grew restless, and the horse of Holmes now started sharply forward, 
now pulled down almost to a standstill, became equally uneasy. So they rode out of the city beyond the lights and movement of the streets into the stillness and the darkness of the night. At last, as Holmes again touched his horse with the spur, making him bound several lengths ahead, and again pulled him down waiting for Abe to overtake him, the western man broke the long silence. "'You'll have to quit that, Mr. Holmes,' he said somewhat sharply. The engineer did not understand. "'Quit what?' "'Breaking ahead like that. I'll set the pace for this trip.' "'You don't seem to be in any hurry,' retorted Holmes, needled by the surveyor's tone. "'I ain't. Not in that kind of a hurry.' But look here, Abe, don't you know that Mr. Worth expects us to make the trip in the shortest possible time? We've got to get that money into Republic tomorrow evening, and before, if we can. There's too much at stake to poke along like this. Abe reflected. The company man certainly understood the situation. Aloud, he said, I think I know what Jefferson Worth wants, Mr. Holmes, and I reckon you'll have to trust me to carry out his wishes. I know the distance. I know this road, and I know horseflesh a little. At the rate you're trying to go, you'll be afoot before noon tomorrow. You can ride your own horse down if you want to, but you can't hinder me by fretting mine into unnecessary exertion. He'll need every ounce of his strength, and I'm going to see that he doesn't waste any of it. Either push ahead out of sight and hearing as fast as you please, or turn back. But if you ride with me, you'll quit this mucky business and ride quietly at the gate I set. Willard Holmes instantly saw the force of the western man's words. I beg your pardon, Lee, he said. Of course you know best. I'm so anxious over this business that I'm acting like a fool. After that, companionship was a little easier, but under the circumstances the one topic most on the mind of each was carefully avoided. At midnight they stopped at the crossing of a stream to water and feed, and Abe showed his companion how to make a nose-bag out of the sack in which his grain was carried. Daybreak found them in the foothills. At the ranch where Abe had been accommodated the morning before, they again halted for breakfast. With another feed for the horses tied behind their saddles, they began the long climb of the western slope of the mountains, and about four o'clock in the afternoon had crossed over the summit and reached the spring at the head of Devil's Canyon, the last water they would find until they reached Wolf Wells in the desert. When they dismounted at the watering place some two hundred yards off the trail, the surveyor, after slipping the bed from his horse's mouth and loosening the saddle girth, moved slowly about the little glen, his eyes on the ground. Holmes, standing by the horses which had their muzzles deep in the cool water, watched his companion wearily. "'Lost something?' he asked, as Abe continued moving cautiously about. "'Not yet,' came the laconic reply. "'Well, what the deuce are you looking for, then?' Abe, coming back to arrange the feed for his horse, looked closely at his companion, but made no answer. When the two men had thrown themselves on the grass to eat their lunch, the surveyor, between bites of his sandwich, carefully scanned the mountainside and the mouth of the canyon below. Suddenly reaching out his hand, he picked up a burnt cigarette butt and regarded it intently, while the engineer watched him with curious, amused interest. "'What the deuce is the matter, Abe? You act like one of Cooper's leather-stocking heroes.' What's the matter with that cigarette stub? The man of the desert, knowing nothing of Cooper, did not smile but answered shortly, eyeing the engineer as he spoke. It ain't dry. There was a party at this watering place not more than three hours ago. Well, what of it? This is government property. Probably somebody ahead of us going into the new country to locate. There's been nobody ahead of us all day. How do you know that? Abe shrugged his shoulders. How do I know that a party of five or six watered here since noon? Perhaps it's someone going out. Did we meet anyone? 
This is the only trail. Well, maybe it was a party of prospectors or hunters. They would not follow the road. They would have pack burros or mules. Nothing but horses in this bunch. They, the surveyor turned his head quickly to look up the hill. His ear had caught the sound of a horse's feet on the mountain road above. Holmes, looking also, saw a horseman ride leisurely around the turn and down the grade toward the canyon. Silently they watched, and as the newcomer came nearer, they saw that he was a Mexican. When the traveler reached the point where he should have turned aside to the water, he did not pause, but jogged steadily past. "'By George!' exclaimed Holmes. "'I believe that's one of our greasers from the outfit in number eight. "'I know it is,' said Abe. "'Perhaps you can make a guess as to what he's doing here "'and why he didn't stop for water.' As the surveyor spoke, he was rolling a cigarette, and from the cloud of smoke he watched the Mexican ride down the mountainside and disappear between the narrow walls of Devil's Canyon. I'm sure I don't know what he's doing. He seemed to be going toward the desert. There might be a hundred different reasons why he shouldn't have been out somewhere. There's only one reason why he didn't stop for water at this place. What's that? He had already watered but there's been no chance for miles back. He watered here. Holmes spoke sharply. Abe's manner irritated him. I don't see how you know. Because this is the only water for twenty miles going either way. But you said you thought there was a party of five or six. I know there are five or six. Where are the others, then, if this man was one of the party? I don't know exactly where they are, but I can guess. By this time, Willard Holmes had come to see that to his companion there was a great deal more in the commonplace incident than the surveyor chose to put into words. Abe, throwing away his cigarette and rolling another with his long practiced fingers, seemed to be striving to arrive at some conclusion about something that to the engineer was all very much in the dark. Aggravated by the reticence of his companion, Holmes burst forth with, For heaven's sake, Abe, open up. What's on your mind? What's the matter anyway? What's all this about? Abe faced the engineer with a straight, hard look. Don't you know what it's all about? So far as I can see, it's all about nothing at all. Tell me. Well, Mr. Holmes, I will. But I'm not sure yet that it will be news to you. The rest of the gang that watered here is down in Devil's Canyon waiting for us. They were here something like three hours ago. After watering, one of them went on over the ridge to watch for us, and the others went back down the canyon. They knew that we would stop here to feed and water, and that the lookout could jog along past, apparently minding his own business, and tell them that we were coming. You mean it's a hold-up? cried Holmes in some excitement. That's what I would call it. Your company would probably call it intercepting Mr. Worth's messenger. The company? What is the company to do with it? Greenfield and you were in San Felipe. You knew what I went after. You know that the chances are big that Jefferson Worth will go to smash if I don't make it to Republic tonight. And that greaser is a company man. In a flash, Holmes saw the whole situation from his companion's point of view and understood the surveyor's suspicions. At the same time, the engineer realized that it was now too late for him to explain his presence or that he was no longer connected with the company. In his perplexity and chagrin, and in the suddenness of it all, he said the worst thing possible. Well, what are you going to do about it? Abe's voice was hard. I'm not going to take any fool chances. This may be a plain, ordinary case of hold-up, or it may be a job framed up by the company simply to delay me. It's all the same to me, but this money goes to Republic tonight. Sabe that? The other would have spoken, but Abe interrupted. We've palavered long enough, Mr. Holmes. The horses have finished their feed, and it's time to start. When they were mounted, the surveyor said shortly, now, sir, you just ride ahead, and you ride slow until I give the word. 
Then you go like hell. If you lift a hand to signal or make any mistakes like stopping to fix your saddle girth or checking up to speak to that bunch or turning around, I get you first and you can't afford to have any hazy notions about my not wanting to kill you because you're from New York. If you're square, you can make good on those company greasers down there and I'll apologize afterwards. If you're in this deal with your damn company, you'll stop drawing your salary right here and there won't be any funeral expenses for them to pay either. Go ahead. Just a word first, and Abe saw that the engineer was as cool as a veteran. Granting that you're right about that crowd being down there to stop us, if anything should happen to you, tell me how to get into Republic with the money. You will be taking no chances with that, at least. Follow the trail to the telephone line. You know it from there. There's water at Wolf Wells. Give your horse a drink, but don't wait to rest. You can push him from now on as hard as you like. You should make it to Republic in six hours from here. Give the money to Miss Worth. Anything else? Holmes replied by turning in his saddle and moving ahead. Abe followed, his horse's nose even with the flank of the animal in the lead. Easily they jogged ahead down the grade toward the narrow throat of the canyon. A hundred yards from where the two points of jutting rock in the walls of the mountain hallway leave an opening not more than fifty feet wide, Holmes, with the slightest turn of his head, spoke over his shoulder. I see a man's face looking around that point of rock on the right. Be ready when I give the word. Monte Paras? Not if they can get the drop. They'll turn us loose on the desert. Shall I shoot? Behind the engineer's back, Abe smiled grimly. When they halt us and I give the word, cut loose if you want to. I'll take all on the left. The distance lessened to a hundred feet. Suddenly from the left three mounted Mexicans pushed into the road and from the right two more. Even as they threw up their guns and called, Alto, halt! Abe gave the word. Now! The two white men drove their spurs deep into their horses' flanks, throwing themselves forward in their saddles with the same motion. With mad plunges, the animals leaped toward the highwaymen. Even as he spoke, Abe's guns had cracked thrice in quick succession, the Mexicans firing at about the same instant. Two of the horsemen on the left went down, and the surveyor reeled almost out of his saddle. But Holmes did not see. His own revolver barked a prompt second to Abe's, and on his side a Mexican went over, clutching at his saddle horn. The horses of the Mexicans were rearing and plunging, the quick reports of the revolvers echoed viciously from the rocky walls. But the white men went through. Down the rocky hallway they raced side by side now as hard as their maddened horses could run. A moment to slip fresh cartridges into his cylinder, and Holmes cried to his companion, Good stuff, old man. Go on. I'll hold them and before Abe could grasp his purpose he had jerked his horse to his haunches and, wheeling, faced back up the canyon and disappeared around the turn. Even as the surveyor was trying to check his own horse, a tough-mouthed brute, another rattling volley of revolver shots, echoed down the canyon. By the time Abe had succeeded in turning his stubborn mount, Holmes reappeared. All over, the engineer sang out, as his companion wheeled again and rode beside him. Two of them were coming after us. I got one and the other turned tail. He winced with pain as he spoke. They presented me with a little souvenir, though. Abe saw that his left arm was swinging loosely. You're hurt, he said sharply, reining up his horse. Where is it? Here in my shoulder. It don't amount to anything. Let's get on to water and I'll fix it up. With the word, the engineer, whose mount had also stopped, started ahead. The horse went a few steps and stumbled, struggled to regain his feet, staggered weakly a few steps farther, stumbled again, and went down. As he fell, Holmes sprang clear. The animal raised his head, made another attempt to rise, and dropped back. 
another bullet from the last encounter had found a mark. The dismounted engineer, who stood as if dazed, staring at his dead horse, was aroused by the voice of Abe Lee. It looks like we've got all that was coming to us this trip. At his companion's tone, Holmes looked up quickly. The surveyor's lips were white, and his face was drawn with pain. The man on the ground sprang toward him with a startled exclamation. You too, Abe? Where is it? My leg on the other side. Quickly, the engineer went around Lee's horse to find the leg of the surveyor's khaki trousers darkly stained with blood. Get down, he commanded, and, reaching with his uninjured arm, almost lifted his companion from the saddle. An examination revealed an ugly hole in the surveyor's thigh. With handkerchiefs and some strips cut from the engineer's coat, they dressed their wounds as best they could. When they were finished, Holmes straightened up and looked around. Behind them was the bold mountain wall, grim and forbidding. On either side, the dry, barren mesa, and ahead, the miles and miles of desert. As if in answer to his thoughts, the man on the ground said grimly, This is hell now, ain't it? Mr. Holmes, I'll make that apology. If you please, would you mind shaking hands with me? Willard Holmes grasped the outstretched hand cordially. You did just right, old man. It was the only thing you could do. But I want to tell you quick, before anything else happens, that I'm not a company man any more. Not a company man? Greenfield fired me because I helped Jefferson Worth to interest the capitalist who is furnishing him the money he needs. For a moment, Abe Lee looked at the engineer in silence. Then his pale lips twisted into a smile. Mr. Holmes, would you mind shaking hands again? With a laugh, the engineer once more held out his hand. Then he asked seriously, How are we going to get out of this, Abe? The smile was already gone from the surveyor's face. He answered slowly with dogged determination in his voice. We've got to get this money to Republic tonight. It's the only thing that will stop those Colos and Cocopas. We'll make it to water together. Then you can go on. Help me up. With the engineer's assistance, Abe managed to gain his seat in the saddle, Holmes mounting behind, and thus they made their way down into the basin and to Wolf Wells. There Holmes helped his companion from the horse into the shade of a mesquite tree near the water hole, where he stood over him as he lay on the ground, protesting vigorously against leaving him alone in the desert. But the surveyor argued him down. I couldn't possibly make it if we had another horse, he said. I'm down and out. There'll be hell to pay in Republic tonight, even if the boys have held them off this long. The money's got to get there this evening. You can reach there by ten o'clock and send a wagon back for me. Don't you see there's no other way? He held out the black leather bill book with the rubber bands. Here, take this and go on. Go on, man. What's a night in the desert to me? But those greasers may come this way. They won't. But if they should, I have my gun, haven't I? and I'll see them before they see me. Go on, I tell you. We've lost too much time already. Think of that mob and Barbara. You've got to go, Holmes. The engineer turned toward his horse. Goodbye, old man. Adios. Tell Barbara I'm all right. Abe Lee watched the loping horse grow smaller and smaller in the distance, then watched the cloud of dust that lifted from the trail to hang all golden in the last of the light. Turning, he saw the summit of the mountain wall sharply defined against the sky. With a groan, his form relaxed. He closed his eyes. He was indeed down and out. The desert night fell softly over the wide, thirsty plain. A snarling, cowdy course came out of the gloom. Out there, Willard Holmes was riding, riding, 
riding along the old San Felipe Trail. Away over there, somewhere under those stars, Barbara was waiting his return. He remembered her parting words and how he had failed to find in her eyes that which he had longed to see. He felt for the paper in the pocket of his shirt. Love to Abe. She would never have sent that message had her love been other than it was. Abe Lee, born and reared in the desert, was not the kind of man to deceive himself. For his work and for the woman whose life was so strangely and closely bound up with it, he had given the utmost limit of his strength. And now another man would finish the ride and go to her with the prize. Not that it would make any difference to Barbara, but somehow it mattered a great deal to Abe. Willard Holmes, who in spite of his splendid strength had not the desert man's powers of endurance, clung grimly to one thought. The money must go to Republic. The steady rhythm of his horse's feet seemed to beat out the word, Barbara, Barbara, Barbara. The trying scene with Greenfield, the long hard hours in the saddle, the excitement of the fight in the canyon, with his anxiety for his wounded companion left alone in the desert, were almost too much. Could he hold out? Could he make it? He must. The engineer held his seat with the strength of desperation. He must. The money must go to Republic that night, to Barbara. 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 The horse's feet seemed to have beaten out the word for ages. For ages he had been riding, riding, riding towards some point out there ahead of the desert night. The engineer knew now what it was that called him back. End of chapter 29Chapter 30 of The Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 30 Manana, Manana, Tomorrow, Tomorrow. The night when Abe Lee started on his ride from Republic to San Felipe passed quietly in the little desert town. Texas and Pat, with a few faithful white men, guarded the Worth property, lest in some way the news that Worth would be unable to pay, as his superintendent had promised, should get out and precipitate a crisis. But the strikers continued to enjoy peacefully their holiday, looking forward to the morrow when they would be enriched with nearly two months' pay. When the morrow came, the laborers, their dark faces deeming with childish happiness, gathered early in front of Jefferson Worth's office. Texas and Pat, with the men of the office force who had been up all night, were sleeping, for another night of guard duty was before them. When it was ten o'clock and no one had arrived at the office, the crowd of laborers began to show signs of growing impatience. Then someone recalled seeing Abe riding on the buckskin horse toward the south, and suspicion grew. At last, a few of the more intelligent went in a body to the bank. We come to see about money. You saw me about money? What money is that? asked the man behind the window shortly. Our money for work on railroad. Senior Worth was to pay. El Superintende say pay today, sure. He no come. You sabe? I sabe that Worth won't pay. No? No, he has no money here. The Mexicans exchange glances. No money? You're quite sure, senor? Sure. Gracias, senor. Adios. It was a dangerous crowd that filled the streets of Republic that afternoon and evening. And all through the night that followed, the friends of Jefferson Worth expected every hour 
the fulfillment of the striker's threats. Soon after breakfast, which Pat and Tex shared with Barbara, the message came from Mr. Worth telling them that Abe was on his way home with the money. Again, the men were told they would receive their pay on the morrow, but this time the announcement was received with black scowls and muttered curses of disbelief. He made us damn fools one time. How we know this time not the same? asked one of the leaders, speaking for the crowd. Maybe, Senior Tex, you not know. Maybe they fool you like us. We get money this day, we glad. Go work. We no get money by this night. And expressive shrug of the shoulders finished the sentence. The attitude of the citizens of Republic was one of angry indifference. They were angry both with Jefferson Worth and the strikers because the trouble was unsettling and harmful to the best interest of all the business in the town and to some degree toward the inflowing stream of settlers and investors towards other parts of the new country. They were indifferent because of that underlying conviction brought about by mysteriously authoritative rumors and whispered statements from supposed inside sources that the cause of the trouble was a fight between Jefferson Worth and the company. Whether capitalists rise or capitalists fall is always a matter of indifference to all who are not themselves of the capitalist class. For capital continues its mastery of them just the same. No one doubted that the railroad would be finished whether Jefferson Worth failed or not. Horace P. Blanton was not backward in expressing the popular feeling, and the popular feeling often expressed grows ever more popular. Toward the end of the afternoon, Pablo, who had been mingling with his countrymen all day, came to headquarters to report. The strikers were planning to attack their employer's property that night. Pablo was certain that the mob would go first to the power plant and the adjoining buildings. No help was to be had from the citizens, and save for the few white men in Mr. Worth's employee who had been made to understand the situation and the reason for the delay, Tex and Pat were alone. They knew that there was small chance of Abe's arrival until well toward midnight. For a little they considered the situation. Then the old frontiersman spoke. It stands to reason that Pablo here is right, and that the stampede will head toward the works first, and they'll all go together. They ain't a-coming here till later, after they've made their biggest play. Now, Pablo, you listen. Get the two horses, Sabi, two, one for Inez and one for yourself, and have them with El Capitan for La Senorita ready by the back door. You watch. If Senor Lee comes, tell him quick to go to the powerhouse. If the men come, take the women on the horses and get out of the way. You understand? Si, senor. I will care for la senorita. Texas Joe turned to Barbara. I don't reckon they'll get here at all, for I bank on Pat and me fixing something to interest them until Abe gets here. But it's best to be fixed for what you ain't expecting. You'll be a heap better off with Pablo any way away from here if they should come this way. When the night fell, Texas and Pat went to the scene of the expected trouble, and Barbara was left with Pablo. The Mexican prepared the horses as Texas had instructed, and then took up his position by the front gate, proud and happy that they had so honored him, that they had trusted him to guard his employer's daughter. The darkness deepened. Watchful, alert, Pablo strove to see into the gloom and listened to catch the first sound of approaching friend or enemy. The white men should learn that he could protect La Senorita, La Senorita who, in Rubio City, had been to him an angel of mercy when he was lying injured, La Senorita whom they all loved. Behind him the door of the house opened letting out a flood of light, then closed. 
In the darkness, a voice called softly, Pablo, are you there? Si, senorita. You want me? Barbara came quickly down the walk to his side. It's so lonely and still in the house, Pablo. May I stay out here a little with you? We can both watch. Surely la senorita could stay. Why not? Pablo was to protect her, not to keep her a prisoner. She laughed quietly. I believe you would do anything for me, Pablo. I would protect la senorita with my life, he answered simply. I believe you would, Pablo, and so would Tex and Pat and Abe. You are all so good to me, and I, I feel so good for nothing, so useless. In the darkness, the musical voice of Pablo answered, Our love for la senorita is so great. It is like the desert in the gentle moonlight, so big and wide. It is like the soft night under the stars, so deep. Everybody so loves la senorita, and anyone loved that way cannot be what you say, good for nothing. Sometime men love like the sun on the desert in daytime, fierce and hot, and that is different. That makes sometimes trouble, sometime make men kill. It is not good, la senorita, but it is so. They heard a galloping horse coming nearer and nearer. Barbara touched her companion's arm, and Pablo laid a hand on his revolver. Was it Abe? Was it someone to say that the mob was coming? The horse and rider passed, and the sound of their going died away in the stillness of the night. Pablo, what time will they go to the powerhouse? Any time now, senorita. Barbara spoke quickly, eagerly now. Are there not a good many of your countrymen from Rubio City among them, Pablo? Si, senorita. And do they, do they remember me? Surely no one who lived in Rubio City could forget la senorita, who was so kind to the poor. Then, Pablo, I have a plan to help. I did not tell Texas and Pat, but Inez is not in the house. I sent her away this evening to stay with a friend on the other side of town. Si, senorita. The soft voice was perplexed and troubled. Pablo, I'm going to the powerhouse to help. No, no, senorita, it cannot be. Yes, Pablo, I must. But, senorita, that is not right. You will go with me, Pablo, and no one will harm me. But if Senor Lee comes, when he finds no one here, he will understand and go to us. No, no, senorita, you must not. The father, Senor Texas, and Pat, they will kill me. La senorita does not want Pablo to be hurt. Why, Pablo, no one can blame you. And don't you see that I must do what I can? Come, we're losing time. We must not be too late. You get the horses. She went quickly into the house, and when she came out again, the Mexican, still protesting, held the horses ready. At the powerhouse, Texas and Pat sat just inside the main entrance. In the big room beyond them, the great dynamos that furnished electricity to all the towns for lights and supplied the ice plant, the shops and every enterprise needing it throughout the basin with power, hummed and sang their monotonous song of industry. In front of the building, a large arc light made the immediate vicinity as bright as day. On every side of all the buildings in the group where the little handful of white men stood guard, similar lights had been placed by Abe at the beginning of the trouble. Holy mother, will you look at that? came from Pat as Barbara, followed by Pablo, rode into the circle of light. With an oath from Texas Joe, the two men ran forward, and as they came up to the riders, the Irishman cried, well, What the hell are you doing here? For what's the matter? Did them devils go to the house first, or are you crazy? With a laugh, Barbara dismounted, and telling Pablo to tie the horses to the hitch rack a short distance away, faced the astonished men. There's nothing wrong at the house, but I knew you must be lonesome here, so I came to see you. 
You don't seem a bit glad to see me. Mother of God, groaned the Irishman. Texas called to Pablo. Bring those horses back here. Pablo, called Barbara, do as I told you. The Mexican leading the horses moved on toward the hitching place. Texas scratched his head in a puzzled way while Pat grinned. Will you roll that in your cigarette and smoke it, Uncle Tex? I'll have to take a shot at that fool greaser for this, returned Texas. You'll do no such thing, declared the young woman. You know he couldn't help himself. Be the powers. It's us that should know that same. But, honey, you can't stay here. There's going to be trouble, real trouble. I know it, Uncle Tex. That's why I came to help. To help? The two men looked at her in amazement. Before they could find words for a question, Pablo came running back to them. They're coming, senorita, senor Tex. They're coming. He was right. Texas Joe caught Barbara by the arm, and with the three men she ran into the building just as the crowd of Mexican and Indian laborers reached the outer edge of the lighted space. While still in the shadow of the night, the crowd halted, and the watchers in the building could see them across the broad belt of light, a stirring, restless mass of men, shadowy and indistinct. Now and then, a single figure in the white canvas jumper, trousers and wide sombrero of the Mexicans, or wearing the blue overalls and black shirt decorated with many brightly colored ribbons, and the green, yellow, or orange head cloth of the Indians, would detach itself from the main company and, coming nearer, would stand out with sudden startling clearness, disappearing again as suddenly in the dark mass as it again moved farther away. Here and there in the confusion of dusky moving forms, a face would appear as someone looking up at the electric light caught its rays full upon his swarthy features or the watchers would catch the gleam and flash from a weapon, a belt buckle, or an ornament as the mob of men moved uneasily about. Still farther away the restless, stirring mass was dissolved in the darkness of the night. "'They're palavering about the lights,' said Texas to his companions. "'Can't just figure the deal under Abe's illumination. They're all plumb anxious,' but there's nobody wishful to make himself conspicuous. Oh, why doesn't Abe come? Why doesn't he come? exclaimed Barbara. Ah, oh, the saints will only keep them colos considering. The lad may get here yet. Even as the Irishman spoke, the crowd, seemingly agreeing upon a plan, moved forward slowly in a body. When they were well within the lighted space, Texas drawled. Right here's where I feel moved to address the meeting. And throwing open the door, he stepped out upon the platform, which was built to the height of a wagon bed above the level of the ground, with steps at each end. Standing thus in the bright light of the arc that sputtered over his head, he was seen instantly by every eye in the crowd. As if by command, they halted, standing motionless, their dark faces turned toward the old plainsman. Texas spoke in their own tongue. Good evening, men. Why do you come here at this time of the night? What do you want? There was an angry shifting to and fro in the mass of men, and a Mexican standing well to the front answered, What should we want, Senor Texas, but our pay? We've worked for... Five, seven weeks without money. We must have money to buy food, clothes, tobacco. Do not the commissaries in the camp supply you with all that you need? Surely you can wait a few hours longer. Tomorrow you'll be paid every cent. Manana, manana, always tomorrow. The superintendent promised other time tomorrow. The superintendent lied. Now we will not wait for tomorrow. Cries of approval greeted the bold speech. But we cannot pay you tonight. We've not the money here. That is too bad for Senor Worth, then. 
If he can not pay, he should have told us so that we could work for the company. The company can pay, but Mr. Worth will pay tomorrow morning. A chorus of angry, jeering yells greeted this repeated promise with cries of Pronto, Estadilla, and No Manana, now, today, and not tomorrow. The movement toward the building began again. Instantly the arms of the men on the platform were extended, and the mob saw in each hand the familiar Colts forty-five of the old-time West. The forward movement was checked. Men, cried Texas in his deliberate way, you cannot come any nearer these buildings. There are Americans here, friends of Mr. Worth, who are ready to shoot when I give the word. I can kill twelve of you myself before you can get to this platform. Go away quietly, and in the morning you'll get your money. Come one step nearer this building, and many of you will die. The moment was intense. A shot, a yell, a sudden movement would have precipitated a tragedy. In the full glare of the light against the blackness of the night, the crowd of dusky-faced, picturesque laborers hesitated. Standing on the platform under the arc that sputtered and sizzled, his back to the building, the single figure of Texas Joe was ready with menacing weapons. Behind the brick walls, the handful of armed white men were waiting, watching. Miles away in the desert, Abe Lee was lying wounded and alone under the still stars, and somewhere in the night, Willard Holmes, desperately holding his seat in the saddle, was forcing his already exhausted horse toward the end of his mission. As the muscles of a tiger work and twitch when the beast makes ready for its spring, a movement agitated the mob, and a low, growling murmur came from the mass of men. Texas spoke sharply. Ready, you fellows in there? If they start, let them have it. The murmur swelled in volume into an angry, inarticulate roar. The movement increased. An instant more, and it would have launched the mob in a mad rush. Suddenly, as a beast checked in its spring, they were still and motionless. By the side of the old frontiersman on the platform under the light stood Barbara. Let me speak to them, Tex. Without pausing for the astonished man to reply, she spoke to the mob in Spanish, her voice rising clearly and sweetly. Do you know me, friends? From different points in the crowd came the answers. Si, senorita, it is the daughter of Senor Worth. Among the poor in Rubio City, la senorita was an angel of mercy. I remember many of you, Barbara continued. Over there I see Jose Gallegos, whose wife and baby were ill. How's the little family now, Jose? Manuel Cortez, do you remember when you were hurt by a wicked horse and I would come to see the wife and children? And Pablo Sanchez, do you know how long you were without work until with father's help I found a place for you? Francisco Gonzalez, I helped you bury your mother and gave money to the priest that masses might be said for her soul. And you, Juan Arguello, and Francisco Montez, I remember you all, and I'm glad to see you, but I'm sorry that you come to destroy my father's buildings. Why do you wish to do that? The Mexicans, whom she called by name, stirred uneasily, but did not answer. Those who had known Barbara in Rubio City were few among the whole number of laborers, and to these others she was only the daughter of the man who was robbing them of their pay. The one who had so far acted as spokesman answered angrily, Must we say again what we want? If you are, as they say, an angel of mercy, give us our money, and we will go away. Cries of, Si, si, bueno, muy pronto, el dinero, and give us our money, arose on all sides. You shall have your money tomorrow, every penny. Cannot you wait until tomorrow morning? 
The impatient cries were louder now. La senorita always say manana. All the rich say all time to the poor manana, and manana never come. Give us our money now. The cries were increasing in volume as man after man joined in the course of threatening protest. White and trembling, Barbara realized that she could do nothing more. Texas said in a low voice, For God's sake, honey, get inside before they break loose. Go now, now. His voice rose into a sharp command, and his steady hands again brought the deadly revolvers into position. The young woman reluctantly drew a step backward in obedience, then suddenly, with wide eyes staring over the crowd into the darkness beyond, and extended hand pointing, she sprang forward to the very edge of the platform. Texas, Texas, look, he is coming, Abe is here. Overcome with emotion, she swayed and would have fallen, but Texas caught and steadied her. Every man in the crowd turned quickly toward the rear. A horseman, shadowy and indistinct beyond the circle of light, was riding toward them. As the newcomer pushed his horse nearer, and they saw that it was Willard Holmes, Barbara uttered a cry and turned away, but the quick eye of Texas Joe had seen that the engineer's horse was staggering with exhaustion and that the man could scarcely keep his seat in the saddle. "'Wait, honey,' he said, delaying the young woman. "'This may pan out yet.' Barbara paused, but did not turn toward the approaching engineer. Slowly Holmes forced his horse, reeking with sweat and dust, into the crowd that opened for him to pass, and closed in behind him with excited exclamations as the men saw that the rider reeled in his saddle, his face haggard and drawn with pain, and his useless left arm tied to his side. But Barbara still turned away her face. Coming so close that his leg almost touched the edge of the platform, the engineer, as though he saw no one but her, held out the black leather bill-book. Miss Worth! Barbara! With a cry she turned as the rider sank, and would have fallen had not Texas, reaching out, lifted him bodily from the saddle to the platform where Holmes sank unconscious. Barbara, with wonder and horror in her face, stood as if turned to stone, while Pat and Pablo quickly carried the still form of the engineer into the building. Unable to move, the girl followed them with her eyes until Texas, who had caught up the leather bill book, exclaimed with an oath, Look, it's the money! She looked at him as though she did not comprehend and he held the bundle of bills toward her. It's the money, the money, you tell him. Mechanically, Barbara took the money and turned to the crowd that stood silently, wondering what it all meant, waiting to learn whether the incident had anything to do with their pay. Under the powerful light, she held up her two hands filled with bills. Look, she cried, look, here's the money for your pay. My father sent it. Now will you believe? Shouts and cheers of understanding burst from the crowd. It is for you that it is here, continued the young woman. Will you go away now and come back in the morning, each man for what is his? Si, si, senorita. Gracias, senorita. Laughing, talking, and gesticulating, the crowd dissolved and moved away. Before the dispersing laborers had passed beyond the circle of light, Barbara was kneeling beside Willard Holmes. And when they would have taken the engineer to the hotel, Barbara said no, he must be taken to her home. Texas had just finished dressing with rude surgery the wound in the engineer's shoulder, and Barbara, standing by the bedside, was looking down into the still face when Holmes slowly came back to consciousness. His opening eyes looked up full into the brown eyes that regarded him so kindly. For a moment, neither spoke, but a slow flush of color crept into the girl's face. 
by some strange freak of his half-awakened intellectual facilities holmes was living over again the incident of his meeting barbara on the desert the morning after her first arrival in kingston is it really you or is it some trick of this confounded desert he muttered i never saw a mirage like this before i don't think the heat has affected my brain to barbara the words had the effect of suddenly blotting out all that had come between them and of putting them both back again to the day when they had started square so she answered as she had answered then i assure you that i am very substantial she added softly and i am here to stay too as you would never forgive me who was false to the work muttered the engineer and with the words his mind caught at the suggestion of the power that had enabled him to keep his seat in the saddle through the seemingly endless hours of torture and he remembered everything up to the moment when he had handed the money to barbara with an exclamation he tried to raise himself don't do that you must lie still mr holmes said the young woman texas and pat in an adjoining room heard and came quickly to barbara's side i must get up men cried holmes appealingly making another effort to raise himself we must go for abe lee he's hurt alone out there in the desert why don't you move miss worth please texas joe quietly forced him back on his pillow you gotta take it easy for a little while mr holmes get a grip on yourself and tell us plain what happened we'll move fast enough when we know which way to go when holmes had told them briefly the story of the fight in devil's canyon and how he had left abe at wolf wells texas said now mr holmes you just keep quiet right here barbara'll take care of you and we'll have abe home before noon tomorrow also we'll arrange for a little seance with them greasers what put you and abe in this fix an hour later a light spring wagon with four horses accompanied by a party of five mounted men moved swiftly out of republic toward the south end of chapter thirty Chapter 31 of The Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 31 Barbara's Waiting Breakfast for You. Alone on the desert, Abe Lee waited through the long, long hours of the night for the morning and relief. At times the wounded surveyor sank into half-unconsciousness when he would again be riding, riding, riding toward San Felipe that seemed almost so far away that he could never hope to reach the end of his journey. Again he would be at the hotel surrounded by a crowd of people who stared at him curiously as the clerk explained that Jefferson Worth had never been there, that there was no money no money no money at other times he would be fighting desperately with james greenfield for the possession of a black leather bill book secured with rubber bands or with the company engineer would face a crowd of mexicans in devil's canyon in such numbers that he could not count them but could only fight and fight and fight often barbara came to plead with him to save her from some terrible danger and when he would struggle to go a great weight held him down and he could not and the brown eyes looked at him full of pleading reproach then he would curse and cry aloud as willard holmes came to take her away and he would watch the two riding into the distance through the green fields and orchards of a beautiful land in their happiness for getting him alone in the desert at other times fully conscious 
He lay with aching body and that sharp pain in his leg, looking up at the stars, calculating the time and the distance Holmes had ridden since he left him. How long it would be until the engineer would reach Republic, wondering if Tex and Pat could hold the strikers or if already it was too late. Then again, when his mind would be losing its grip and slipping away into the land of half-dreams, the sounds made by some animal at the water-hole, or the fancied approach of the Mexicans would cause him to start into keen readiness to listen and watch with straining sense and ready weapon. At last all knowledge of time left him. His exhausted nerves and muscles no longer responded to suggestions of danger. His brain refused to act. A soft, thick cloud of darkness that was not the darkness of the night settled down upon him, enveloped him, wrapped him as in a sable blanket of many folds, thicker and thicker, blacker and blacker. Feebly he struggled against it for a little, then with a sigh yielded and lay still. He did not see the stars pale, and the thin streak of light above the eastern rim of the basin widen into the morning. He did not see the hills, all rose and purple, developed magically against the sky. He did not see the sun burst into view from the world below the line of the dun plain and roll its flood of light over the wide desert. He knew nothing more until someone was forcing something between his lips and a grateful, stimulating warmth crept through his veins. A familiar voice drawled. "'He ain't a-going out this time, boys. It takes more than one greaser bullet and a little ride to San Felipe and back to send his kind over the line.' And a rich Irish brogue responded, it's them black heathen that'll be going over the line in a bunch, and I can get wide and wrench of em with me two hands. Abe opened his eyes with a smile. Morning, boys. Did Holmes make it in time? An articulate yell of delight from Pat greeted his speech. The grizzled plainsman, with a smile of understanding, answered his question. Sure he made it. Everything's as peaceful as the parson's blessing after his discourse on the eternal fires of torment. Barbara's waiting breakfast for you, son. Wake up and come along. The surveyor did not need to ask why Texas Joe had brought so large a party of mounted and armed friends. He gave Texas and his companions all the information he could that would help them in their search for the Mexicans. When they had made him as comfortable as possible on a cot in the spring wagon, with Pat beside him and Pablo on the driver's seat, the horsemen mounted and Texas riding alongside the wagon drawled, There ain't no telling when we'll get back, Abe, but I don't reckon we'll be long, and there ain't no use telling you to take things easy. So, adios. Adios, came the answer, and good luck. Pablo spoke to his team, and they moved ahead. For a moment the horsemen watched, then Tex spoke. All set, boys. All set, came the answer. Wheeling about, the five men rode rapidly in the opposite direction towards Devil's Canyon. End of chapter 31《Chapter Thirty Two of the Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Thirty Two Barbara Ministers to the Wounded. Willard Holmes, after a few hours of refreshing sleep and a good breakfast prepared and served by his hostess with her own hands, announced himself as well as ever. "'But you need some fixin' just the same,' declared Barbara as the Indian woman entered the room carrying warm water, towels, and bandages. While the young woman bent over the engineer, 
and with firm, deft fingers removed the wrappings from his shoulder, carefully cleansed the womb, and applied fresh dressing and clean bandages. He watched her face, so near his own, and wondered that he had ever thought her plain. Her skin, warmly browned by desert sun and air, was fresh and glowing with the abundance of the rich red life in her veins. Her brown hair, soft and wavy, tempted him to reach up his free hand and put back a rebellious lock. He moved slightly, and the brown eyes, full of womanly pity, met his. Does it hurt? He smiled and shook his head. Not at all. In fact, I think I rather enjoy it. Her cheeks turned a deeper red, and he felt her fingers tremble as she went on with her task. If you laugh at me, I shall turn you over to Inez, she threatened, at which he promised so pitifully to be good that she smiled, and he stirred again impatiently. I am hurting you, she cried. I'm so sorry, but I'm almost through. There now. She finished with the last touch, and, straightening, put back that rebellious lock of hair. As she stood before him, beautifully strong and pure and fresh and clean in mind and heart and body, her sweet personality, the spirit of her complete womanhood, swept to him, appealing, calling, exhilarating, invigorating, strengthening, as he had often felt the early air of the sun-filled morning sweeping over mountain and mesa and desert plain. The man drew a long, deep breath. Tired? she asked softly, looking down upon him with almost a mother's look in her eyes. Heavens, no! he exclaimed, his voice ringing out strongly. I feel as though I had been made over, recreated. She laughed gladly. Do you know, he asked earnestly, how wonderful you are? Nonsense, she retorted. You're growing delirious. You must be quiet. I'm going to leave you alone for a little while now, and you must sleep. She followed the Indian woman from the room, and he heard her voice speaking in soft musical Spanish as they went. An hour later, Barbara, moving quietly toward his room to see if he was asleep or wanted anything, found him fully dressed in a big easy chair in the living room. Oh, she exclaimed in joyful surprise, what are you doing out here? I thought I told you to sleep. Your orders were inconsistent, he returned lazily. You can't cure a patient and still continue treating him as if he were an invalid. I don't need sleep. I need... Bring your chair and sit over here and let me tell you what I need, he finished. She did not answer, but going to his room returned with a pillow, which she arranged deftly behind his head, then kneeling, adjusted the footrest of the reclining chair. There, isn't that better? Bring your chair, he insisted. Again she left the room, returning this time with a bit of old, soft muslin. Drawing her easy chair to a position facing him, she seated herself and began converting the material in her hands into bandages. The man will be here with Abe any time now, she explained. I have everything ready except these. For a little while he watched her in silence as she tore the white cloth into long strips and rolled them neatly. Don't you care to know what it is that I need? he asked at last. She bent her head over her work and answered softly. Whenever you're ready to tell me. Before I can tell you, I must know something. Carefully she rolled another white strip, her eyes on her task. What must you know? that you have forgiven me? The color rushed into her cheeks as she answered, Don't you know that? But I must hear you say it so that we can start square again, don't you see? I suppose that we will always be starting over again, won't we? Then, as she saw his face, she added quickly, 
I mean, I, I was thinking of the company and father's work. But you forgive me this time, he insisted. Yes, I forgive you, and I'm glad, so glad that I can. And we're square again? Yes, we're square again. Until next time, she added the words sadly. But there'll be no next time. She shook her head with a doubtful smile. The company will make a next time. He laughed aloud with a sudden sense of freedom that was new to him. But you do not know, he said, and I would not tell you until we were square again. I'm not with the company now. She dropped her roll of bandages and looked at him. Not with the company? When did you resign? I didn't resign. They discharged me. Discharged you? Yes. Disgraceful, isn't it? I felt pretty bad at first. Then I came to take it as a compliment. And now, now I am glad. Then he told her why Greenfield had sent for him, how he had met the seer, and how he had advised Cartwright to supply the money her father needed. And you, you did that knowing it would cost you your position? She exclaimed. Oh, I am glad. That was fine. That was big. Worthy your ancestors. In her interest, she was leaning towards him with flushed cheeks and bright eyes, and her voice was triumphant as if in some subtle way she was vindicated through his victory. The engineer felt her attitude and knew that she was right. It was her victory. Barbara, he said, holding out his hand. Barbara, may I tell you now what it is that I need? Before she could answer, she heard a team and wagon coming into the yard beside the house. Barbara sprang to her feet. It is the men with Abe, she exclaimed, and ran out of the room onto the porch. From where he lay in his chair, the engineer saw through the open door Pablo and Pat coming up the steps of the porch, carrying the surveyor on the canvas cot, and Barbara with mute frightened face watching. The two men with their burden entered the room, followed by the young woman, and carefully lowered the cot to the floor. The long form of the surveyor lay motionless, his eyes closed. With a low cry, Barbara threw herself on her knees beside the cot, with one arm across the still form of the only brother she knew, and the other pushing back the rough hair from his forehead, she bent over, looking appealingly into the thin, rugged face, her own face, alight with loving anxiety. Abe, 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 she called softly. Then again, Abe, see, dear, it's Barbara. As if only that voice had power to call him back, the man's eyes opened. A slow smile spread over his unshaven, dust-stained features, and his voice expressed glad surprise. Why, hello, Barbara. Willard Holmes, who had half risen from his chair and was leaning forward watching them with burning interest, sank back with a groan and covered his face with his hands. But they did not see. Still kneeling, Barbara took a glass from Inez and turned again to the injured surveyor. Here, Abe, drink this. The Irishman lifted him in his huge arms and he obeyed. Then, as he lay looking up into Barbara's face, again that slow smile came and he said, Well, little girl, Holmes made it, didn't he? That buckskin horse of Texas is all right. And Holmes... Holmes is a man. He sure made good. How is he? Holmes rose dizzily and came forward. I'm all right, old man, and so will you be when Miss Worth has had a chance at you. Quickly the surveyor glanced from the engineer's face to that of the young woman, whose brown eyes still regarded him with loving solicitude. I reckon you're right, he said slowly. 
Then Barbara directed them to carry him into the room she had prepared, while Willard Holmes returned to his chair to lie with closed eyes, suffering a deeper pain than the pain in his shoulder. When his wound had been dressed and he had eaten the tempting meal Barbara brought, Abe fell asleep. But the young woman would not leave him for long, so that Holmes saw very little of her all the rest of the day. Occasionally she would run into the room where the engineer lay to ask if he needed anything, but only for a moment. Sometimes, seeing him so still, she thought that he was asleep and withdrew softly without speaking, but he always knew. The next morning, Holmes was just established in the big reclining chair in the living room when a peremptory knock called Barbara to the front door. It was James Greenfield. The president of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company was greatly agitated, and he scarcely noticed the young woman as he greeted the engineer with affectionate regard that was genuine, explaining how he had returned to Kingston the night before and, learning of Holmes' injury that morning, had hurried to him at once. "'But I can't understand,' he exclaimed half angrily, "'how you ever came to be mixed up in this affair. "'When I missed you from the hotel, "'I supposed, of course, that you had taken the train back to Kingston "'and came on expecting to find you there. "'What on earth possessed you to go off on this wild ride "'over the mountains with that man Lee? "'You might have been killed.' And I, I, he could not put into words the horrid thought that was in his mind. How, had the Mexican's bullet gone true, he himself would have been responsible for the death of the man he loved as his own son. Holmes, understanding the man's thought, was touched by the capitalist's unusual agitation, and for the moment did not attempt to reply. Then, with an attempt at lightness, he said, Oh, well, it's all coming out right, Uncle Jim. Thanks to Miss Worth's care, I'm nearly well now. The wound really didn't amount to much. As he spoke, he looked at Barbara, and the older man also turned quickly toward the young woman, who, at the engineer's words, was blushing rosy red. Father and I owe Mr. Holmes a debt we can never pay, she said quietly. Then, excusing herself on the plea that her other patient needed her, she left the room. When the two men had watched her go, Greenfield said gently, This is a bad business, Willard, a damned bad business. I'll admit that I was angry when you turned against us in that Cartwright deal, but confound it, boy, I admire you for it just the same. Your father would have done just as you did. It was that finer kind of honesty that made him a failure in the business where the rest of us made fortunes. But we all loved him for it. And your mother, he looked away through the window toward the distant mountains. You understand, don't you, Willard, that I was forced to let you go when you turned the company down. My directors would never stand for anything else, you know. You don't feel hard toward me, lad, because I had to let you out? Certainly not, Uncle Jim. I was hurt just at first, but when I had taken time to think it over, I did not blame you. You're sure, Willard? Sure, Uncle Jim. The older man was studying the engineer's face intently. I don't know what it is, Willard, but something has changed you since you came into this country. You know, my boy, that I have no one in the world but you. All that I have will be yours. I have dreamed and planned for you as for my own flesh and blood. I'm telling you this now because I have felt that something was taking you away from me. Something that I cannot understand has come between us. I felt it the moment I met you in Kingston, and it has been growing ever since. It was that that made me so angry over the Cartwright business. You know how I hate the West. You know what it cost me years ago. I feel now that in some way I'm losing you too. What is it, Willard, that has come between us? Let's clean it up and get back in our relations to where we were before we left home. 
As James Greenfield made his appeal, the engineer's eyes turned involuntarily toward the door through which Barbara had left the room. And when he did not answer immediately, the older man was sure that he understood what it was that had come between himself and the son of the woman he loved, and why Holmes had used his influence in behalf of Jefferson Worth. Is it that girl, Willard? The younger man faced him squarely and his answer meant much more to the engineer himself than he could have explained to Greenfield. Yes, sir, it is this girl. You love her? As my father must have loved my mother. At the simple words, Greenfield controlled himself, but his hatred for Jefferson Worth was very bitter. That he should fail to win in the business warfare with the Western man was nothing, but that Worth, through his daughter, should rob him of the son that was more than a son to him, was more than he could bear. But, my dear boy, he said, think what this means. Think of your family, of your father and mother, of your friends and your future back home. Who are these people? They are nobodies. This man Worth is an ignorant, illiterate, common boar with no breeding, no education, nothing but a certain native cunning that has enabled him to make a little money. We have nothing in common with his class. Mr. Worth is an honest, honorable man who is doing a great work, answered Holmes stoutly, and his daughter is... Uncle Jim, she's the most wonderful woman I ever knew. As Willard Holmes spoke, Barbara, coming from the kitchen into the dining room, could not help hearing the words that came through the partly opened door of the living room where the men were talking. Involuntarily, at the sound of the engineer's voice, the red blood crept into the young woman's face, and her eyes shone with pleasure. The next moment, Greenfield's voice held her motionless. But don't you know that she's not worth daughter? Not his daughter, exclaimed Holmes. No, not his daughter. She's a nameless waif whom he picked up and adopted. No one knows her parentage, not even her name. She may even have Mexican or Indian blood in her veins for all that anyone knows. It was not strange that Willard Holmes had never heard the story of how Barbara was found in the desert. In the new country, where most of the engineer's life in the West had been spent, comparatively few beyond worse most intimate associates knew that she was the banker's daughter only by adoption. Greenfield, who had learned the story while inquiring for business reasons into the history of his competitor, told the young man briefly of the finding of the unknown child. "'Don't you see, my boy,' finished the financier, "'how impossible it is that you should give your name, "'one of the oldest and best in the history of the country, "'to a nameless woman of unknown breeding, "'whose connection with this man Worth "'even is merely accidental? "'It would ruin you, Willard. "'Think of your friends back home.' How would they receive her? Think of me, of my plans for you. I, I should feel that I have been false to your mother, Willard, who gave you to me on her deathbed, if I permitted such a thing as this. It's, it's monstrous. Slowly the engineer raised his head, and with a smile on his white face that hurt the older man, he said, I can at least relieve your mind on that score, Uncle Jim. You need not fear that I will marry Miss Worth. At his words from beyond that partly closed door, Barbara made her way blindly to her own room and, throwing herself downward on her couch, strove with clenched hands and throbbing veins to keep her self-control. She must not, she must not let them know, she whispered to herself, moaning in pain. She must go to them again in a moment, and they must not know. While the woman whom Willard Holmes loved fought for strength to hide her pain, 
James Greenfield, in the other room, was leaning eagerly toward the engineer. She has refused you? I have not asked her. But don't misunderstand me. What you've told me, what my friends at home might think or do, could make no difference. Barbara Worth is worthy any man's love, and I love her and would make her my wife. I would give up even you for her, Uncle Jim. It's not that. It's because I know that she loves someone else too well to listen to me. End of chapter 32Chapter 33 of The Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 33 Willard Holmes Receives His Answer. When Barbara returned to the living room with some trivial excuse to explain her rather long absence, she found Holmes determined to go with Mr. Greenfield to his rooms in the hotel in Kingston. When she protested, he answered, Really, Miss Worth, my shoulder troubles me a little that I am ashamed to offer myself as an invalid, and now that Uncle Jim is with me, I haven't the shadow of an excuse for burdening you any longer. I'm sorry if I have made you feel you are a burden, she returned with a brave smile. He answered warmly, You know I did not mean to imply that. I shall never forgive your kindness. Never. Greenfield, too, expressed his appreciation of her kindness, but she answered the engineer as if she had not heard the older man. And I can never thank you for what you've done for us. As they stood on the porch while Greenfield went on ahead to the buggy, Holmes held out his hand. And we are square again? Yes, we're square. Then, adios, senorita. Adios, amigo. Bravely, she stood watching until the carriage disappeared down the street. Then she went slowly into the house to Abe's room. The surveyor lay propped up in bed with pillows, looking quite cheerful. Well, sister, was his greeting. You've lost one patient and you're going to lose the other one before long. I feel like a new man already. For a little, she made no answer, and as she stood before him silent, those eyes that were trained to let nothing escape their notice studied her face and noted her hands clasped in nervous pain. Why, Barbara, what is it, sister? What's gone wrong? At his words, the brown eyes filled. Barbara? She dropped into the chair by the bedside and, throwing herself toward him, buried her face in her arms in the pillow by his side, her form shaking with sobs. The surveyor's face was white now under its bronze, white and set. Lightly he placed his hand upon the soft brown hair so near his shoulder, and his eyes seemed now to be looking far away. When her grief had spent itself a little, he said quietly, Don't you think, sister, that you'd better tell me about this? When she did not answer, he said again, gently, Do you care for him so much, Barbara? The brown head nodded her confession, and for a moment the man closed his eyes and turned away his face. Then, Won't you let me help you? Slowly, with many pauses, she told him what she had overheard. When she had finished, Abe said simply, But he's not told you of his love, Barbara. Perhaps you are mistaken. No, Abe, I'm not mistaken. He has not told me, not in words, but I know. I know. Then, said the surveyor, he will tell you. Listen, Barbara. The man who went through those Mexicans in Devil's Canyon with me is not the kind of man who gives up the woman he loves for what others think. Wait a little, dear, and you will see that I am right. You've been too quick. Be patient a little, and you shall see. But, Abe, Mr. Greenfield is right. 
I am a nameless nobody, and he, he is... He is a man, and you are a woman, and this is La Palma de la Mano de Dios, where nothing else matters, said Abley almost sternly. A few minutes later, when Barbara was gone, the surveyor slipped lower on the pillows and warily turned his face to the wall. Several times that day Barbara looked in on him, and at last, when he had not moved for so long, called him softly. He answered with a smile, but when she had arranged his pillows for him, he closed his eyes again with a word of thanks. Jefferson Worth arrived that evening, and with him came the seer, who had joined him in the city by the sea. But Barbara's joy at that coming was overshadowed by her anxiety for Abe, who seemed to have fallen into a half-unconscious condition that was alarming. When they entered his room, the surveyor, who still lay with his face to the wall, did not look up. "'Daddy is here, Abe,' said Barbara. "'Daddy and the seer.' Slowly the man turned toward them and held out his hand with a word of greeting for each. "'I'm mighty glad you have come.' he added. Barbara has had rather more than her hands full. But the old engineer noticed that he did not look at Barbara as he spoke. While the three were at supper, Barbara told the men the whole story, and when they had finished the meal, the seer said, Now, Jeff, I know you have important business needing your immediate attention, and our girl here must have a good night's rest. She's been through enough to kill an average woman. I'm going to take care of Abe tonight myself. When his old chief was alone with the surveyor, he drew a chair to the bedside and sat for some time looking at the man on the bed. Then he said, I think, son, that you and I had better get to the bottom of this. First, I'll have a look at that leg. When the examination was over, the big man eyed the surveyor. Ha! Huh, this is not a scratch beside what that greaser did to you with his knife in Arizona. You didn't even stop work for that. Your ride to San Felipe and back ordinarily would call for about twelve hours sleep, and that's all. Come, lad, what's the matter? Out with it. Abe smiled. I'm down and out, I reckon. Down and out hell, returned the big man. That won't do, Abe. You forget that you're talking to me. Then he leaned forward and spoke in a low tone. I know what it is, my boy. It's Barbara. By the pain in the surveyor's eyes, the seer knew that he was right. Then the seer, in his own way, did for Abe what Abe had done for Barbara. When the young woman brought in his breakfast the next morning, Abe greeted her with his old cheery, Hello, and declared facetiously that the seer had talked him into a sleep from which he had awakened as hungry as a bear and ready to go to work. Two days later, Texas Joe, who had ridden in from somewhere late the night before, came to report. We were beginning to think that you were not coming back at all, Uncle Tex, said Barbara, who, with the others, was curious to hear of the old-timer's adventure. I allowed once maybe I wouldn't come back no more, neither, he drawled. You see, Mr. Worth, after we all got Abe at Wolf Wells, I figured that, being so far on the way, I might as well go on over to Felipe and get that old buckskin horse of mine what Abe had left. He paused, and turning his head to one side, looked meditatively down at the spur on his high-heeled boot. That there buckskin is sure some horse, Barbara. He sure is. Did you get him? asked Barbara. Texas looked up mildly surprised. Sure we got him. That's what I'm telling you. Then he laughed softly as though mildly amused at some incident suddenly remembered. Abe, you know that greaser that tumbled into the dry river spillway when we all was putting in number five gate? Yes. 
I allowed you'd know him. I heard something funny about him when I was in San Felipe after that dog skin. What was it, Texas? He's dead. The recovery of the two wounded men was rapid. For a while, Holmes came over from Kingston every day to see Lee, and the two with the seer and Barbara spent many delightful hours on the big front porch. Jefferson Worth's enterprises pushed steadily toward completion. The power plant in Barba was finished, and the King's Basin Central had stretched its steel length from the junction at Republic to within three miles of the terminal. When Abe was able to go back to his work, Holmes did not go so often to the Worth home, but the presence of the seer still enabled him to excuse to himself his quite frequent visits. But while the young engineer continually sought the seer, not only because of their growing friendship, but because he was always sure of meeting Barbara, he avoided seeing the girl alone, for he felt that he could not trust himself. And the young woman, feeling his attitude toward her, was convinced against her will and Abe's protest that the man who loved her guarded himself against her for the reasons that she had overheard Greenfield urge upon him. Then Holmes received a letter from the Southwestern and Continental Railroad Company offering him a position that would place him at the head of the engineering department of the district that included the King's Basin. The letter stated that the position was tendered on recommendation of Jefferson Worth, and, in view of the fact that the flood season was at hand, and that conditions seriously threatening to the company's property might be expected at any hour, urged him to accept by wire and take charge immediately. With the letter in his hand, a sudden desire to go with it to Barbara mastered him. He knew that the seer had planned to go that morning with Abe Lee to Barbara, and the young woman was alone. An hour later he dismounted in front of the Worth home. Barbara herself met him at the door. The seer is not at home today, she said as they entered the living room. I thought you knew. I did not come to see the seer today. I came to see you, he answered bluntly. Yes, to ask you how I shall answer this, he handed her the letter. She read it slowly, gaining time for self-control. But I do not understand why you should come to me. He studied her face a moment before he answered. How could he explain to her the impulse that had prompted him, as every man is prompted to take the big things of his life to the one woman who, if she be really the one woman for him, is more than all? I thought, I hoped that you would be interested, he said. And I am, she cried eagerly, feeling that which he could not put into words. Of course I'm interested. I was only surprised that you should hesitate a moment to accept. Don't you want to continue your work? Don't you want to stay with us? She added the last words wistfully, and the heart of the man longed to tell her that which she longed to hear. Yes, he said slowly. I want to stay, but I... I am afraid. The words slipped out unbidden. Barbara interrupted his answer in the light of his conversation with Greenfield, which she had overheard, and her woman's pride was aroused. He should be made to understand that he was in no danger from her. Her next words were a challenge. Afraid of what? Afraid of you, he burst forth savagely. Afraid of myself, because I love you. From the first day when you showed me the desert, you have been so closely associated in my mind with this work that I cannot think of it without thinking of you. Everything I have done, I have felt was done for you. I would have given it all up a hundred times, but my thoughts of you would not let me. When I have been untrue to the work, I have felt that I have been untrue to you. If I have accepted any good here, it has been 
through you. Everywhere I have gone in this country, you have seemed to me to be there. Everything I see speaks to me of you, the desert, the mountains, the farms and homes and towns. It is all you, and you, and you. I did not realize it at first, but I felt it. And then as I came to love my work, I came to love you. I did not intend to tell you this. I hate myself for telling you, but I love you. I love you. Do you understand now why I came to you with this letter? Do you understand why I'm afraid to stay? At the man's passionate outburst that came as if dragged from him against his will, Barbara shrank back as if he threatened her. He had not asked if she loved him. He had only spoken brutally, savagely, of his passion for her. She repeated insistently, blindly, to herself, He must not know. He must not know. The man spoke again. Forgive me, Miss Worth. I did not mean to let go of myself. I know how you love this work, how hard you have tried to hold me true to it. I could not bear that you should think of me as leaving it without reason. But you see, you see how impossible it is now for me to stay? As he spoke, a running horse stopped suddenly in front of the house, and through the open door they saw Pablo leap from the saddle and run swiftly up the walk toward the house. Senorita, the Mexican cried as Barbara sprang toward him. The river, the river, it has come. The company works, it is all gone. Senor Worth sent me quick to tell Senor Holmes. I go to Kingston, he not there. They say he ride this way. I come to you, senorita. I think maybe you know where I find him. He turned to the engineer. Senor Holmes, the river has come again into La Palma de la Mano de Dios, like the Indians say it was long time ago. Senor Worth, say you come, please, pronto. Barbara wheeled on the engineer with flushed cheeks and blazing eyes. This is your answer, she cried. Not for me, not for yourself but for the work, your work, our work. For an instant he looked into her eyes, then turned and ran towards his horse with Pablo at his heels. Barbara saw them spring into their saddles and disappear into a cloud of dust, and the engineer, as he rode, remembered what Abe Lee had once told him of Pablo's saying, In the company there is no senorita. End of chapter 33Someday, perhaps, the history of that river war will be written. It can only be suggested in my story. It was a war of terrific forces waged for a great cause by men as brave as any who ever fought with weapons that kill. The attacking force was the Rio Colorado, that with power immeasurably had, through the ages past, carved mile-deep canyons on its course, and with its mountains of silt had built the great Delta Dam across the ancient gulf, thus turning back the waters of the sea that sun and wind might lay bare the floor of the basin and work the desolation of the desert. Using the seer's open hand for his map of La Palma de la Mano de Dios, José, the Indian, had traced the course of the river along the base of the fingers flowing toward the gulf, which lies between the edge of the palm and the thumb. This same inner edge of the hand, representing roughly the high ground that shuts out the waters of the sea, the thousands of acres of the King's Basin lands lie from sea level to nearly 300 feet below. 
The river at the point where the intake for the system of canals was located is, of course, higher than sea level, for the waters that pass the intake flow on southward to the gulf. It was the river flowing thus on higher ground that made irrigation and reclamation of the desert possible. It was this also that made possible the disaster that was now upon the hardy pioneers who had staked everything in their effort to realize the vast potential wealth of the ancient seabed. The grade from the river at the intake to the lowest point in the bottom of the basin is much steeper than the estimated fall of the river from the intake to the gulf. The water in the canals on this steeper grade was controlled by headings, spillways, gates, and drops, while the structure at the intake, with gates to regulate the flow into the main canal, prevented the river from leaving its old channel altogether, pouring its entire volume into the basin, and in time, converting it again into an inland sea. The dangerously cheap and inadequate character of the vital parts built by the company upon the usual promoter's estimates had led Abe Lee to protest against the risk forced upon the settlers and had finally caused him to resign. Later, as the company system of canals was extended and more and more water was needed to supply the rapidly increasing acreage of cultivated lands, Willard Holmes came to appreciate the desert-bred surveyor's view of the danger and insistently urged his employers to supply him with funds to replace the temporary wooden structures with safe and lasting works of concrete and steel. But the hunger of capital for profits forbade. Some day the work would be done, the directors promised. In the meantime, without increasing the original investment by so much as a dollar, but with the revenues derived from the sale of water rights, they were extending the system to supply the ever-increasing fields of the settlers, thus shrewdly forcing the people, who were ignorant of the terrible risk they were carrying, to supply the funds to build the canals and ditches that belonged to the company. While for the water carried to the ranches, the farmers continued to pay the company large rentals. The original investment of the company was very small compared with the thousands invested by the pioneers who had been induced to settle in the new country. And yet, from every dollar of the wealth taken from the land, the company would receive a share. But the Rio Colorado gave no heed to the decree of the New York financiers. The forces that had made La Palma de la Mano de Dios are not ruled by Wall Street. Willard Holmes, who had come to understand that his work was not alone to safeguard the property of his employers, but to protect the interest of the pioneers as well, had been discharged because he would not deliver the people wholly into the hands of the company. A new engineer out of the East, as faithful to the interests of capital as he was unfamiliar with conditions in the new country, was placed in charge. It was as if the river, in the absence of the man whose constant readiness had held it in check, saw its opportunity. Swiftly it mustered its forces from mountain and plain. Hundreds of miles away it gathered its strength and hurried to the assault. The sources of information established by homes on the tributaries and headwaters wired their reports. A foot rise on the Gila, three feet coming down the little Colorado, two feet rise in the salt, five feet on the grand. The New York office engineer received the messages with mild interest. The daily reports from the Weather Bureau covering the countries drained by the Rio Colorado lay on his desk unnoticed. Mr. Burke warned him, but the thoughtful manager of the company was not an engineer. Willard Holmes tried to help him, 
but Holmes have been discharged by the company, and the words of discharged men have little weight with those who succeed to their positions. The daily reports from the gauge at Rubio City showed an increase in the river's volume of 20,000 second feet, then 30,000 more, and on top of that came another 20,000. The assistants of the new chief engineer tried to tell him what it meant, but the assistants were subordinates and friends of Willard Holmes. The man from New York, who was privileged to write several letters after his name, was supposed to know his business. Then the assembled forces of the river reached the intake, and the trembling wooden structures that stood between the pioneers and ruin, besieged by the rising flood, battered by the swirling currents, bombarded by drift, gave way under the strain, and the charging waters plunged through the breach. Too late, the company's forces were rushed to the scene. Before their very eyes, the roaring waters, as if mad with destructive power, wrenched and tore at the company's property, twisting, ripping, smashing, until not a trestle, plank, or stick was left in place, and the terrific current, rushing with ever-increasing volume and power through the opening, plowed into the soft alluvial soil of the embankment, undermining and carrying it away until nearly the entire river was admitted. As quickly as men and material could be assembled, the company's chief engineer began the battle to regain control of the mighty stream. The warfare thus begun meant life or death to the greatest reclamation project in the world. Millions already invested by the settlers in farms and towns and homes and business enterprises were at stake. Many more millions that were yet to be realized from the reclaimed lands depended upon the issue of the fight. Against the efforts of the engineers and the army of laborers, the river massed from its tributaries in the regions of heavy rains and melting snows the greatest strength it had assembled in many years. Five times, with pilings and trestles and jetties and embankments, the men who defended the King's Basin were in sight of victory. Five times the river summoned fresh strength, twisted out of the pilings, wrecked the trestles, undermined the jetties and embankments, and swept the nearly completed structures, smashing, grinding, crashing away, a twisted, tangled ruin. While the engineers and men of the company were waging this war with the river, the situation of the pioneers in the basin grew daily more perilous. Without a well-defined channel large enough to carry the incoming stream, the flood spread over a wide territory in the southern and western portions of the basin, filling first the old channels and washes left by the waters ages ago, forming next in the areas of nearly level or slightly depressed sections shallow pools, lakes and seas, out of which the higher ground and hummocks rose like newborn islands, growing smaller and smaller as the rising tides submerged more and more of their sandy bases. Meanwhile, the whole flood, eddying slowly with winding sluggish currents in the shallow places, moving more swiftly in the deeper washes and channels, swept always onward toward the north, where miles away lay the deepest bottom of the Great Basin. Many of the settlers in the flooded districts were forced to abandon farms they had won with courage and toil, for the sweeping waters covered alike fields of alfalfa and grain and barren desert waste. The towns of Frontera and Kingston were protected from the inundation by earthen levees, in the building of which men and women toiled in desperate haste, and night and day these embankments were patrolled by watchful guards 
who frequently summoned the weary, besieged citizens from their rest to protect or strengthen some threatened point in their fortifications. The eastern side of the basin being higher ground, the settlers in the south-central district and east of Republic, with the two towns built by Jefferson Worth, were in no immediate danger. But the old dry river channel became a roaring torrent, bank full, and it was only a question of time if the river were not controlled, when every foot of the new country, with its wealth of improvements and its vast possibilities, would be buried deep beneath the surface of an inland sea. The situation was appalling. The remarkable development of the new country, the marvelous richness of the reclaimed lands, with the immense possibilities of the reclamation work as demonstrated by the King's Basin Project, had attracted the attention of the nation. The pioneers in Barbara's Desert were, in fact, leaders in a far greater work that would add immeasurably to the nation's life, that would, indeed, be worldwide in its influence. Because of this, the attention of the nation was fixed with peculiar interest upon the disaster that had fallen upon the King's Basin. Throughout the land, civil engineers watched intently the efforts of the company men to regain control of the river and to force it back into its old channel. Many declared that, because of the alluvial character of the soil, the absence of anything like a rock floor to build upon, and the great volume and terrific velocity of the current, the feat was an engineering impossibility. In the eyes of the engineering world, the King's Basin project was doomed. The settlers were advised to abandon the work they had accomplished and to move out. But those strong ones who had forced the desert to yield its wealth to their hands did not move. Those whose farms were in the flooded district were forced to go. There was the inevitable sifting of the timid-hearted and the weak, but the great majority stood fast. Jefferson Worth, in the face of almost certain ruin, went steadily on with his work on the railroad and continued pushing his other enterprises toward completion, making improvements, erecting new buildings, planning further investments and developments with a confidence and conviction that was startling. Not once throughout that trying period was he heard to express the slightest doubt as to the ultimate triumph of the settlers. His business friends and associates outside urged him to stop, to wait at least until the issue was certain. He answered calmly that the issue was already certain and went on with his work. His confidence and courage were the inspiration that fired the hearts of that threatened people. Had he given ground, had he weakened and drawn back, it would have started a panic that nothing could have checked and that would have resulted inevitably in the abandonment of the cause forever. The King's Basin lands, with the wealth of effort that had already been expended, would have been given over to the river, lost irretrievably to the race. Hundreds went to him when they felt their courage failing and their spirits weakening under the strain, and always they returned to their farms or to their business with renewed strength to go on. As one who passed through that ordeal, long afterwards expressed it, in those times we all just lived on his nerve. Through all the company's war with the river and its repeated defeats, Willard Holmes was forced to stand a mere observer, an idle looker-on. Foreseeing the catastrophe that was now upon them, he had prepared himself by careful study of every factor in the problem and by thorough knowledge of the situation to meet the crisis when it came. With every means at his command, he had planned and worked that he might be ready, and so far as possible equipped for the struggle 
and now, when the war was declared and the battle being waged, he could only watch the ruin of the work he loved, while a stranger, who ignored his preparatory efforts, took the place that should have been his. But the great man of the S&C, with whom the engineer had many a counsel in those days, warned him always to be ready for the time when, as the western man put it, the company should throw up its hands. The waters moving northward reached the lowest point in the basin, and there formed an inland sea that, without an outlet and receiving the full volume of the river, grew ever larger and larger. Flowing towards the sea, the flood developed swift currents in the depressions and washes that led in the general direction of its course, seeking thus to make for itself a well-defined channel. The largest of these ancient washes, scarcely noticeable in the desert, led from the south to Kingston, passing through the edge of the town, curved slightly to the west and extended on northward, becoming deeper and more clearly defined, with higher ground on either side as it neared the lowest point of the basin. The general lay of the land drew the flood toward this channel and developed a current that moved with increasing velocity as the waters nearing the sea were concentrated more and more by the greater depth of the old channel and the steeper grade of the land on both sides. Then a new and alarming phase of the river's destructive work developed, and everyone saw that the war at the intake must be forced to a speedy finish or the cause would be lost. The immense volume of the water, flowing with increased strength and velocity as it defined for itself a more distinct channel down the steeper grade of the basin, began cutting in the soft soil a vertical fall that from the foot of the grade moved swiftly upstream. A mighty cataract from fifty to sixty feet in height and a full quarter of a mile wide, moving at the rate of one to three miles a day and leaving as it went a great gorge through which a new-made river flowed quietly to a newborn and ever-growing sea. The roar of the plunging waters, the crushing and booming of the falling masses of earth that were undermined by the roaring torrent were heard miles away. Acres upon acres of the soft, fertile land fell, melted, and were swept away down the gorge as banks of snow fall and melt in the spring freshets. Day and night, night and day, the immeasurable power of the canyon-cutting river drove the cataract southward toward the break at the intake through which, by this time, the entire Colorado, at its highest flood stage, was turned. The imminent danger that threatened the basin was not the danger from the ever-rising sea. Long before the waters could fill the old seabed, that mighty cataract, moving ever upstream, would pass the intake, and with the floor of the river lowered thus some fifty feet, it would be impossible to take the water out for irrigation. The lands reclaimed by the pioneers would go back to desert years before they would be buried once more under the surface of the sea. The complete destruction of all that the settlers had gained and the utter desolation of the land was now a question of weeks. The company town of Kingston was directly in the path of that moving Niagara. While the company's men were making a last desperate effort to close the break, the great falls were eating their way nearer and nearer the little city. When the roar of the water and the crashing and booming of the falling banks could be heard on the streets and in the offices of the company, the people left their homes, their stores, and their shops, 
the town realizing that no human power now could avert the disaster. Heroic efforts were made to direct the course of the new river away from the little city, but the waters with savage, resistless power chose their own way. The pioneers who built the first town in the heart of the King's Basin Desert saw that mighty, thundering cataract move upon the work of their hands and felt the earth trembling under their feet as they watched homes, business blocks, the hotel, the opera house, the bank, and finally the company building undermined and tumbled, crashing into the deep canyon. In a few short hours, it was over. The falls moved on, and where Kingston had once stood was that great gorge, with a few scattered houses only remaining on each side. That same day, the last attempt of the company men to close the break failed. With every hour, the awful ruin drew nearer the point which, if reached, would place the King's Basin forever beyond the reclaiming power of men. Frantic appeals for help were made to the government, but before the ponderous machinery of state with its intricate and complicated wheels within wheels could unwind a sufficient quantity of red tape, the work of the pioneer citizens would be past saving. It was at this time that a telegram from Jefferson Worth to the great man of the Southwestern and Continental brought a special train of private cars into the basin. At Deepwell Junction, Jefferson Worth, Abe Lee, the Seer, and Willard Holmes boarded the train and entered the car of the general manager, where the officials representing the highest authority in the great transcontinental system had gathered to meet them in consultation. At Republic, the president of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company, with his manager and chief engineer, joined them, and the train moved on until, at a word from Holmes, the conductor gave the signal to stop. From the windows and platform of the car, the party could see the water extending to the south and west mile after mile, and nearer, the huge plunging cataracts with leaping columns of spray, while the roar of the falls, the crashing and booming of the caving banks shook the air with heavy vibrations, and the earth trembled with the shock of the plunging waters and the falling masses of earth. Just ahead, where Kingston had stood, the track ended on the bank of the deep gorge. From here, the party was driven in comfortable spring wagons to the scene of the company's defeat. Save for the camps of the laborers, the boats, pile drivers, implements, and materials of their warfare, and the debris of their wrecked structures, not a sign of their work remained. While through the breach, widened now to nearly a quarter of a mile, the great river poured its hundred and fifty thousand second feet of muddy water with terrific velocity and solemn, awful power. When the party had viewed the situation, the railroad men with Mr. Greenfield retired to the tent of the company's chief engineer. A little apart from Jefferson Worth and his two companions, Willard Holmes stood alone on the brink of the broken embankment looking down into the swirling, muddy waters. He knew that his time had come. He knew that at that moment the railroad officials were concluding a deal with the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company through its president, by which the S and C would assume control of the situation and attempt to save the reclamation work. His chief had told him to be ready. He was ready. In the railroad yards at Rubio City and on every available side track for several miles east and west were standing trainloads of ties and rails. 
In the yards at the coast city were cars loaded with machinery, implements, and supplies. In the yards at the harbor were other trainloads of timber and piling. With the readiness of a perfectly equipped and organized army, the forces of the SNC, backed by the resources of that powerful system, waited the word, while every moment the disaster that threatened the pioneers drew nearer. From the roaring river at his feet, Willard Holmes turned to look toward the tent. Why were they so slow? Then his face lightened up, and he took an eager step forward as the private secretary of the general manager came out of the tent and hurried toward him. "'They want you, Mr. Holmes,' said the young man. The engineer went quickly to answer the call. When he entered the tent, every man in the party turned toward the engineer. "'Holmes,' said his chief, we will attempt to close the break. You will take charge at once. Within an hour, the forces of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company, already on the ground, were set to work under the sear preparing the grade for a spur track that would leave the main line near the river fifteen miles north of the break, and Holmes, with Abe Lee, set out on horseback for Rubio City. With the return of the general manager and his party to their train, the movement already planned began. Without hurry, but with ready promptness, the orders, voiced by the hundreds of clicking telegraph instruments covering the district affected by the operations, were obeyed. Special trains carried Jefferson Worth's force of railroad builders with teams and equipment to the point at which the spur track would connect with the main line where, under Abe Lee, they began pushing the grade southward to meet the forces that, under the seer, were working northward from the front. Throughout the basin, the call for men and teams was issued by Jefferson Worth and the pioneers, answering as the Minutemen of old, were hurried to the scene where they found trainloads of equipment waiting ready for their use, while every hour brought reinforcements. Laborers of many nationalities gathered in the cities of the coast by the agents of the railroad company. The waiting trains loaded with ties and steel began to move, and the construction gangs followed close on the heels of the graders, and when the last spike in the track to the scene of the decisive battle was driven, the track men with their sledges stepped aside to clear the way for the panting engines that drew the first train loaded with pilings and timbers for the trestle. Hour by hour now, without pause or halt, the men under Willard Holmes, working in shifts, met the Rio Colorado in a hand-to-hand -hand fight for the King's Basin lands. By day under the white semi-tropical sun, by night in the light of locomotive headlights that gleamed strangely over the dark, swirling floods, the trestles were forced further and further out into the plunging current that wrenched and twisted and tugged with terrific strength in a mad wrestle with those who dared attempt to check its sullen, destructive will, while steadily, irresistibly, the canyon-cutting falls drew nearer and nearer. It was not alone the magnitude of the task directed by Willard Holmes that made the work heroic. It was that this seemingly impossible work must be accomplished against time. In his fight with the river, the engineer raced against a destructive force which, if it reached the scene of the struggle before the battle was won, would make final defeat certain and place the Colorado, as far as the King's Basin reclamation was concerned, beyond control of men. As the engineer stood on the trestle above the mad whirling currents, 
directing his men in their efforts to drive the piling in thirty feet of water that as one veteran expressed it ran like the mill tails of hell he fancied he could hear above the roar of the river against the structure the blows of the heavy driver the rattle of cable and chain and windlass the grinding and squeaking of the straining timbers and shouts of the men the menacing thunder of that moving cataract a few miles away while he paced the embankments studying the set of the currents observing the form and action of the eddies or receiving the hourly reports from the river gauge at rubio city and held consultation with his assistants he often turned his head involuntarily to look anxiously away in the direction of the racing falls only when his exhausted body and wearied brain refused to respond longer to his will would he throw himself fully dressed upon a cot in his tent for an hour's sleep his face grew haggard and deeply lined with anxious care his hollow eyes dark rimmed were bloodshot and burning as if with fever his jaws were set as if by sheer power of his will he would beat the river into submission and he barked his orders shortly in a hoarse strained voice that told of nerves stretched almost to the breaking point in critical moments when it looked as though the river in the next instant would reduce their work to a hopeless wreck the engineer standing on the trembling timbers or clinging to the swaying pile driver itself seemed to those who did his bidding to become the very incarnation of human courage and power the seer and abe lee remembering the man who had come out from the east to go with them on that preliminary survey wondered at the transformation then willard holmes was the servant of capital that used people for its own gain he saw his work then only as a means to the end that his company might make money now though employed still by a corporation he was a master who used the power at his command in behalf of the people he had come to look upon his work as a service to the world and through that service only he served his employers it was as if in this man born of the best blood of a nation-building people trained by the best of the cultured east trained as truly by his life and work in the desert it was as though in him the best spirit of the age and race found expression at last the trestles were pushed across the break the track was laid and the gigantic work of filling the channel was begun in every rock quarry reached by the s and c within two hundred and fifty miles of the battle men were drilling and blasting and with steam shovels and derricks were loading cars with material for the fill at the word from willard holmes these rock trains steamed swiftly to the front everything giving them the right of way merchants and manufacturers east and west cursed the railroad because their shipments were delayed passengers held for hours on the sidings complained scolded protested and threatened it was an outrage declared the tourists in their luxurious pullmans that they should be forced to give up an hour of their pleasure in order that a train load of rock might make better time but unheeding the great battleships each with its fifty cubic yards of stone and the flats and gondolas each with its tons of material thundered away to the scene of the struggle every five minutes night and day from the moment of the completion of the trestles until the fill was above the danger point a car of rock was dumped into the break so the task was accomplished the fight was won the rio colorado was checked in its work of destruction and beaten back into its old channel 
the thousands of acres of the king's basin lands that would have been forever lost to the race through one corporation were saved by another and the man who without protest had built for his employer's gain the inadequate structures that endangered the work of the pioneers led the forces that won the victory the afternoon of the day on which the break was finally closed, three private cars came in with the rock trains. The passengers were the general manager and the general superintendent with their wives, Jefferson Worth and a small party of friends. Leaving their cars, the party walked toward a point below the rock embankment where they could look down into the now empty gorge. With this visible evidence of the river's power before them, the visitors exclaimed with wonder. When the superintendent had explained the magnitude of the work, the difficulties encountered, and how the task had been accomplished, the general manager, who here and there had added a word, said, After all, friends, taking into consideration money, equipment, and everything, the whole question of a work like this, or of any great enterprise, resolves itself into a question of men. It's up to the man on the job. We have the system, the machinery without which this work could not have been done. We have the capital to supply material and labor. But that man up there closed the break. As he spoke, he pointed to a figure standing on the upper trestle above the fill, outlined against the sky. Then the party climbed the grade to the tracks again and walked to the end of the upper trestle. Turning, the engineer saw and came towards them. Silently they stood to receive him. From boots to Stetson, his khaki trousers and rough shirt were stained with mud and grime. His eyes were sunken in their dark hollows, his worn face was unshaven, and his hair, when he removed his hat, was unkempt. He did not look like a hero. He looked more like some ruffian just from a prolonged debauch. But the little party burst into applause. The engineer smiled as his chief went forward from the group to grasp him by the hand. For a moment they talked of the work. Then the official, placing his hand on the engineer's arm, said, Come, Holmes, we have some women here who want to meet the man who mastered the Colorado. The engineer protested. He was not presentable. Presentable? You're the most presentable man I know of this minute. Come along. There's my wife making signs to me to hurry right now. There was nothing for Holmes to do but to go. A moment later, he was face to face with the rest of the party and with Barbara Worth. End of chapter 34of the winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 35, Nature and Human Nature. Two weeks after the victory of Willard Holmes in the River War, the engineer arrived in Republic on the evening train from the city by the sea. At the hotel, he was quickly surrounded by the pioneer citizens who were eager to greet him with expressions of appreciation for his work. But it was Horace P. Blanton who did the talking. Horace P., in his brave picture general hat, his impressively swelling front of white vest and his black clerical tie, was a personification of economic, financial, and scholastic not to say ecclesiastic, dignity. His greeting of the engineer was majestic. 
but as a royal sovereign might welcome the returning general of his conquering armies with sadness at the thought of the lives his victories had cost, the countenance of Horace P. expressed a noble grief. Willard, he said, his voice charged with emotion, I congratulate you. You are the savior of this imperial king's basin. When we saw that Greenfield's company was not able to handle the awful situation, I told my friend, the general manager, and our other officials of the S&C that they must come to the rescue without an instant's delay and that you must be put in charge of the work. I knew that if any man on earth could stop that river, you could. So we decided to let you go ahead. You have justified my confidence nobly, Willard. You certainly have. I am proud of you, old man. I am indeed. The engineer tried manfully to appreciate the spirit of the speaker's words. With that white vest and black tie before him, to say nothing of the picture hat that crowned the massive head, it was impossible for Holmes not to wish that he could appreciate Horace P. Blanton's spirit. It hungered so for appreciation. I'm very grateful to you, Mr. Blanton, said the engineer. But really, I feel that you overestimate my part in the work. I, not at all, not at all, my dear boy. I knew my man, and I was not disappointed. But the cost, he shook his kingly head sorrowfully and heaved a majestic sigh. Confidentially, Willard, I estimate that the financial cost of Greenfield and myself alone were close on to a million. I haven't a thing left. Wipe me out clean. Holmes looked really sympathetic. He knew that every dollar that Horace P. Blanton ever spent was a dollar belonging to someone else. But even mythical losses of mythical property, when suffered by Horace P., demanded sympathy. The man in the white vest felt them so keenly and strove with such noble courage to bear them bravely. Encouraged by the engineer's interest and the presence of the little crowd of pioneers, the speaker continued. When I saw our beautiful town, the town that we had built with our own hands, falling in ruins into that terrible chasm, I cried like a baby, sir. Even as he spoke, his eyes filled with manly tears which he made no attempt to hide. Then he lifted his majestic bulk grandly, and looked about with kingly countenance. But I shall stay with it, Willard. I shall stay and help these people to regain their losses. We can't desert them now. If my creditors will give me a little time, and I am sure they will, not a man shall lose a penny, no matter what it costs me. The sentence was a bit ambiguous, but it was a noble resolution, worthy of such a lofty soul. At this moment, a boy with the evening papers approached the group. "'Here, son, my paper,' called Horace P. The boy gripped his wares with a firm hand. "'I got to have my money first. You ain't done nothing but promise for a month. "'Boy, give me my paper. You shall have your money tomorrow,' he thundered from the depths beneath the white vest. The boy backed away. "'That doesn't do it. I can't live on hot air.' With an imperial air, as if tremendous stakes hung upon the trivial incident, the great man said to Holmes, "'Excuse me, Willard. I must see about this.' And with a firm and determined step, he left the hotel. A hush fell upon the company of pioneers. Not one of them but would have gladly, had he dared, offered the outraged monarch the price of a paper. The King's Basin settlers were proud of Horace P. But that night Horace P. Blanton boarded the northbound train and was never seen in the King's Basin again. His creditors, and they are many, from the newsboy to the hotel manager, the barber, the laundry agent, the liveryman, and bootblack, are still giving him time, as he was confident that they would. The pioneers miss him sorely, but they managed to struggle along without him, living perhaps in the hope 
that he will someday come back. In the silence that followed the passing of Horace P., Willard Holmes slipped away from the group of men and approached the manager of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company, who was sitting alone with his cigar in a far corner of the room. "'Hello, old man,' was Burke's greeting as the engineer approached. The thoughtful manager of the company had been an interested observer of his friend's reception and of the newspaper incident. As the two men shook hands, the manager's cigar shifted to one corner of his mouth and his head tipped toward the opposite shoulder. How much did Horace P. touch you for, Willard? I gave him my admiration and sympathy. The other shook his head wonderingly. A special providence watches over you, my son. After that, nothing could have saved your pocketbook if that kid had not been sent by your guardian angel to your rescue. When did you leave the river? Last week, the S&C called me into the city. I'm on my way back to the work now. What's the news? Burke grinned. The first train over the King's Basin Central went out this morning with a special party of distinguished citizens, Jefferson Worth, the seer, Abe Lee, and Miss Worth. The lady will spend a week or two in the town of Barba and with friends in the South Central District. Texas Joe and Pat left this morning in a rig, leading Miss Worth's saddle horse, El Capitan. It's all in the King's Basin Messenger. He handed the paper to Holmes, who mechanically stuffed it into his pocket. How's Uncle Jim? He's at the office, I think. You know, he's winding up the affairs of the poor old KBL and I. So I understand. The two men were silent for a moment. Then Burke said thoughtfully, It's hard lines for the company, Willard. But the mules, including your humble servant, don't seem to care much. That's one advantage in being a mule. I will be glad to get back to civilization, and so will your Uncle Jim, I fancy. Take it all together, I don't think he's enjoyed watching the success of Jefferson Worth's little experiments as much as we have. The same beneficent power that has knocked out the company seems to have taken good care of friend Jeff. You're not going to stay in the West? asked the engineer. I go Monday. I understand there is still a demand for good mules back home. The president of the wrecked company received his former chief engineer warmly and heartily congratulated him on the success of his battle with the river. I suppose you know, Willard, he said, that the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company has virtually passed into the hands of the S&C. We owe them a good half million for closing the break, which means that they will have to take over the property. We knew when we went into the deal how it would end, of course. If you had remained with the company, the river never would have had a chance to get in at all. The younger man did not remind Mr. Greenfield of the many times the company had been urged to make the improvements that would have prevented the disaster, nor did he suggest that he would have remained with the company had not the president himself discharged him. Your engineer did all any man could do after the break was made, he said warmly. It was the equipment and organization of the S&C that put the river back in its channel, and no other power on earth under the circumstances could have done it in time to head off that back cut. The older man smiled. We all know who closed the break, my boy. I suppose you're planning to stay with the railroad? They've offered me the management of the irrigation work here in the basin. They're going to put in permanent structures and reconstruct the whole system in first-class shape. And you accept it? There was a note of anxiety in the older man's voice. Not yet. I ask for a few days to consider. James Greenfield did not speak for several minutes. Then he said, hesitating as if searching for words, don't do it, Willard. Don't do it, for my sake. Let's go back home. You know how I hate this cursed country. 
I ought never to have gone into this deal after what I had already suffered in the West. But it looked as if I could clean up a good thing and get out. Personally, my money losses don't amount to anything. I have enough left for both of us. And you know, Willard, my boy, that it's all yours when I go. Come back home with me and leave this damned hole. We don't fit in here. Let's go back where we belong. I'm coming along now to the time when I must begin to think of getting out of the game. And I need you, my boy. I need you. Willard Holmes was strongly moved by the appeal of this man for whom he had a son's affection. I wish I could say yes, Uncle Jim, he answered. I owe you more than I can ever repay, and if it was only the work here, I would go. But there's something else, something that I cannot give up if I would, that I have no right to give up. You mean that girl? I thought that was all settled. So did I, returned the other grimly. When I talked with you about it, I thought there was no possible chance for me, and perhaps I was right. But I can't let it go now without absolute certainty. You don't mean, Willard, that you're going to offer yourself to a woman whose love you have every reason to think belongs to another man. The engineer rose to his feet and walked up and down the room. When he spoke, there was in his voice a suggestion of that which marked his speech in the days of the river fight. I mean this, that no man on earth shall take this woman from me if I can prevent it. I would deserve to lose her if I gave her up on the mere guess that she cared for another man. I'm going to know from her own words. If there's still a chance for me, I'm going to stay and fight for it. If I have no chance, he dropped into a chair, then I'll go back with you, Uncle Jim. James Greenfield's face flushed hotly at the younger man's words and then, in the silence that followed, grew pale and stern while his fingers gripped his pencil nervously. Very well, Willard, he said at last. You're a man and your own master. If your love for me cannot influence you, Uncle Jim, the engineer's cry was a protest and an appeal, but the other continued as though he had not heard. I can urge no more consideration, but you must understand this. I will never receive this nameless woman of unknown parentage as your wife. If you prefer her with that illiterate, low, cunning trickster whom she calls father, you need never expect to come back to me. I have been true to your mother and my care for you. I have done all in my power to give you the place in life that you are entitled to fill by your birth and family. You have been my son in everything but blood. But by God, sir, if you, with your breeding and raising, if you can turn your back upon the memory of your mother and father and upon me and all that we stand for, if you can turn your back upon us, desert us for these, these damned cattle, you can herd with them the rest of your life. He was on his feet now, pacing the floor angrily. The engineer had also risen and stood waiting for this storm of wrath to spend itself. Understand me, the older man continued. If she refuses you, you can come back. If she accepts you, you need never show your face to me again and I shall take good care that your friends at home understand the reason. Probably, if you let these people know what the result will be if you are accepted, it will make a great difference in the woman's answer. Willard Holmes dared not speak. Nothing but his lifelong love for the man whose devotion to the engineer's mother had stood the test of years enabled the younger man to control himself. When he could speak calmly, he said, I am sorry, sir, that you said that, for you must see how you have made it impossible for me now ever to go back with you. If Miss Worth does not care for me, I would have been glad to go home with you, for next to her, Uncle Jim, you are more to me than anyone in the world. 
When you say that my relation to you shall depend upon her answer, you make it impossible for her answer to make any difference as far as you and I are concerned. Won't you, won't you reconsider, Uncle Jim? Won't you take back your words? No, sir, I've said exactly what I mean. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye. When the office door had closed behind the engineer, James Greenfield stood motionless in the center of the room. Once he took a step toward the door, but checked himself. Then turning slowly, wearily, he sank into the chair before his desk. For a few moments he fumbled aimlessly over the papers and documents, then from his pocket took a flat leather case, and, opening it, held in his hand a portrait of the engineer's mother. As he looked at the face of the woman who had never ceased to hold the first place in his heart, his lips framed the words he could not speak aloud. Slowly his form drooped, his head bowed. Then, with the picture held close, he buried his face in his arms among the business papers on his desk. End of chapter 35Chapter 36 of The Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 36 Out of the Hollow of God's Hand. The first train from Republic to Barbara over the New Kings Basin Central arrived in the town by the old Dry River crossing shortly after noon. Later in the day, Jefferson Worth, with his daughter, his superintendent, and the seer, went to the power plant on the bank of Dry River. When the plant was built, it was placed as low in the old wash as the depth of the ancient channel would permit, so that the greatest possible fall from the company canal above might be secured. As Jefferson Worth and his companions stood now on the bank of the river, they saw the waste wave from the turbine wheel that ran the generators nearly thirty feet above the bottom of the channel. The flood that had cut the deep canyons through the heart of the basin, destroying Kingston on its course, had worked on a smaller scale in the old dry river wash, cutting a narrow gorge nearly fifty feet deep from its outlet at the new sea past the power plant at Barbara and nearly to the spillway of the main canal. Standing almost on the very spot where they had found the baby girl years before, the seer asked Barbara's father, Jeff, does your contract with the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company call for a certain amount of water or for water to develop a certain amount of power? Jefferson Worth answered in his careful, exact voice. The first contract calls for water to develop a certain amount of power. This new one is a contract for 300,000 inches of water. There's nothing in it about the amount of power, but it gives me the sole rights to put the power privileges on the company property. You see, when Greenfield tried to change the line of their canal so as to cut me out, Abe and I had begun to figure that some day the water from the spillway might cut down the channel and give us a little more drop. But we never counted on this, of course. I simply figured that I might just as well make the new contract safe. The seer smiled. You made it safe, all right, Jeff. Do you know what this cut means to you? In a way, yes. That's why I wanted you to look at it. It means, said the seer, that you have rights here worth a million dollars at least. By lowering your turbine to the bottom of this cut, you can, with the same amount of water that you're now using, develop power enough to run every electric light system and turn every wheel in all the King's Basin for years to come. 
You mean that the river breaking in and doing this has made Daddy's property worth a million dollars? asked Barbara breathlessly. The seer turned toward her. Yes, Barbara, the same force that destroyed Kingston and wrecked the company has increased the value of your father's holding to fully that amount. A million is very conservative. The young woman looked down into the gorge at their feet. Slowly, she said, The Indians must be right. This must be indeed La Palma de la Mano de Dios. Such things could happen nowhere else. She had just finished speaking when the sound of wheels behind caused them to turn toward the desert and the old San Felipe Trail. It was Texas and Pat in the buckboard with El Capitan leading behind. Catching sight of the group on the river bank, the men turned aside from the road and went to them. Howdy, folks, drawled Tex. We allowed we'd just about meet up with you all somewhere about here. Sure, tis a family reunion we do be having, with no empty chairs at all, declared the Irishman, looking from face to face with twinkling eyes. Well, well, who'd have thought now that the little kid we found under the bank here, scared of the coyotes and more scared of us roughnecks, would have growed up like this? And with me a swearing by all the saints, I knew that I would never set foot on the desert again. Here we are once more all together, with Barbara and Abe bigger than life. Tis the dang old desert itself that's a heaven never to come back at all. He drew the back of his huge hairy hand across his eyes. Barbara's eyes, too, were wet, and the others turned away their faces. Pat's words had recalled so vividly the scene at the dry water hole with the changes that the years had brought both to them and to the desert. It was Texas Joe who broke the silence. Mr. Worth, Pat and I would like to see you sometime this evening, if you ain't engaged. What is it, Tex? As he spoke, Jefferson Worth looked straight into the eyes of the old plainsman. Texas Joe, gazing steadily into the face of his employer, drawled easily. Just a little matter we allowed maybe you would like to know about, sir. What time shall we come? Something. The memories of the place, perhaps aroused by the words of Pat a moment before, caused Jefferson Worth to lift those nervous fingers and slowly caress his chin. I guess I can go now. We're all through here. He turned to the others. I'll go on to the hotel with Tex and Pat, and you folks can come along later when you're ready. He stepped into the buckboard and with the two drove away. At a livery barn where they stopped to leave the horses, Texas took from under the seat of the buckboard something that was wrapped in a sack that had held a feed of grain for the team and El Capitan. When they had reached the privacy of Mr. Worth's room, the old plainsman and the Irishman stood as if each waited for the other to begin. Well, men, said Jefferson Worth, what is it? Go on, your old Austria, growled Pat to Tex. Why the hell don't you tell the boss what we come to tell him? Speak up! Texas Joe cleared his throat and began formally. I don't reckon, Mr. Worth, that you all has forgot that outfit we left in them sand hills back yonder on the old San Felipe Trail the time we found the kid. At the words, Jefferson Worth's face became a gray mask from behind which his mind reached out as though to grasp what Texas would say before the man put it into words. Well, the single word came with the colorless sound of dull metal. Also, I reckon you know them big drifts are always on the move, so that when they covers up anything, say an outfit like that one, it stands to reason that some day they'll drift on and leave it clear again. Jefferson Worth's hands were gripping the arms of his chair. His gray lips could frame no sound. 
I always kind of kept an eye on that there particular ridge, continued Texas. And so today me and Pat stopped for a little look around, and slowly he unwrapped the grain sack from a long tin box. And we found this. He laid the box carefully on the table before Barbara's father. It was a lay-in with what was left of a bigger wooden box or trunk, which same had gone to pieces, and there was a part of that old wagon with that same piece of a halter strap you remember fastened to a wheel. There ain't no sort of doubt, Mr. Worth, that it's the same outfit, and it's mighty likely that there's papers in here that'll tell us what we tried so hard to find out at first. But what... He paused and looked around, then finished in a low tone. I don't reckon any of us wants to know now. Jefferson Worth sat motionless in his chair, his eyes fixed upon the tin box. The heavy voice of the Irishman broke the quiet. If Tex would have listened to reason, sir, I'd have dumped the dang thing into the river, saying nothing to nobody. For what good can it do reckon up the pass that's dead and gone? The girl is as much yours as if she was your own flesh and blood. And who can say what devil's own mess may come out of this thing? Leave it alone, I say, and for what nobody don't know can't hurt him. T'was wrong entirely to bring it up to you. After all, you've been such a father to the little one. Leave it to me, sir. Give me the word, and I'll... He reached eagerly for the box, but Jefferson Worth held up his slim, nervous hand. Wait a moment, Pat. I, I don't think that would be right. Never before had these men seen Jefferson Worth hesitate. The will of the man, whose cold decision had carried him through so many critical situations and upon which the pioneers had relied in the recent time of peril, seemed to fail him at last. The spectacle told the men more clearly than words could have done what he suffered. I, I don't know what to do, he finished weakly. Give me time. Let me think. He bowed his head in his hands. Pat growled an oath under his breath, and Texas turned his eyes from his companions to the box and from the box back to his friends in bewildered uncertainty. At last he said in his soft southern drawl, Mr. Worth, it's dead sure that me and Pat ain't helping you none in this. I reckon I was all wrong to bring it to you at all, but it seemed like I was plumb balled up, and it couldn't rightly say what was best. There ain't really no call to crowd this thing, as I can see. Suppose you take your time to think it over. Me and Pat will let you alone, and if you decide to forget all about it, you can bet your last red we'll be damn glad to help. Nobody but us three will ever know. Tain't as if it was a doing anybody any harm. Jefferson Worth raised his head. Thank you, boys, he said. I'll have to figure on this thing a little. Left alone, Jefferson Worth faced the temptation of his life. Dearer to this lonely-hearted man than all the wealth and power that he would realize from his King's Basin work was the child who had come to him out of the desert. The man knew that it was the influence of Barbara upon his life that had prepared him for that night in the sand hills and enabled him rightly to weigh and measure and value the efforts of his kind. That afternoon at the powerhouse, it had all been brought before him with startling vividness. He felt that in all that he had accomplished in Barbara's desert, he had been led by the child who had come to him out of the hollow of God's hand. The desert had given her to him. He had given himself in return to the work she loved. He could not think of his work apart from her. She was his, his, his. His gray lips whispered the words as he stood looking down at the box. No one had the right to take her from him, to come into her life. And yet, and yet, 
He reached out and laid his hand upon the box, then, turning again, paced the room. Suddenly he whirled about and approached the table. With cold fury he seized the box, and placing it upon the floor, broke the light tin fastening with his boot heel. Again he paused and looked dully at the thing in his hands. Then with a quick motion he threw up the cover. The box was filled with documents and letters, with four or five old photographs. The address on the large unsealed envelope met his eye, and he started back with a low cry as though he had looked upon some startling apparition. When Barbara, with the seer and Abe, returned to the hotel that evening, the clerk gave her a note from her father who, the note explained, had been called to Republic on business of importance. He would be back tomorrow. The clerk said that Mr. Worth had left only a few minutes before, with the engine and car that had brought them to Barba that morning. The End of Chapter 36《Chapter Thirty Seven of the Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Thirty Seven Back to the Old San Felipe Trail. In the office of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company, James Greenfield was aroused by a knock at the door. He lifted his head from his arms and looked around as if awakened out of a deep sleep. Another knock, and he slipped the picture he held in his hand into his pocket and called, Come in. The door opened, and Jefferson Worth stepped into the room. For a moment, the president of the wrecked company sat staring at his business rival. Then he leaped to his feet, his fist clenched and his face working with passion. You can't come in here, sir. Get out, he said with the voice and manner he would have assumed in speaking to a trespassing dog. Jefferson Worth stood still. I have business of importance with you, Mr. Greenfield, he said, and his air of quiet dignity contrasted strangely with the rage of the larger man. You can have no business with me of any sort whatever. I have nothing to do with your kind. This is my private office. I tell you to get out. Jefferson Worth turned calmly as though to obey, but instead of leaving the room, closed the door and locked it. Then, placing the small grip he carried upon the table, he deliberately went close to the threatening president and said coldly, this is rank nonsense, Greenfield. I won't leave this office until I'm through with what I came to do. I have business with you that concerns you as much as it does me. You're a damn thief, a low sharper. I tell you I have nothing to do with you. Now get out or I'll throw you out. Jefferson Worth answered in his exact, precise manner as though carefully choosing and considering his words. No, you won't throw me out. You'll listen to what I have come to tell you. The rest of your statement, Greenfield, is false, and you know it. It will be just as well for you not to repeat it. The last low-spoken words did not appear to be uttered as a threat, but as a calm statement of a carefully considered fact. James Greenfield felt as a man who permits himself to rage against an immovable obstacle, as one who spends his strength cursing a stone wall that bars his way or a rock that lies in his path. With an effort, he regained a measure of his self-control. Well, out with it. What do you want? Sit down, said Worth, pointing to a chair. Mechanically, the other obeyed. You have no reason for taking this attitude toward me, Mr. Greenfield, began Worth with his air of simply stating a fact. At his words, the wrath of the other again mastered him. No reason? You, you dare to tell me that? 
when you and the young woman that you call your daughter have come between me and the boy who is more than a son to me, when you've broken our close relationship of years standing and robbed me of his companionship, when you've wrecked and ruined all my plans for his future, when you've defeated the object of my life, no reason? But what can you understand of us? You're a nobody, sir, without a place or a name in the world. A common, low-bred, ignorant sharper, with no family but a nameless daughter of unknown parentage whom you found on the desert. How can you understand what Willard Holmes is to me? I figured that you would feel this way about it, came the coloredest words. That's what I came here for tonight, to fix it up. The angry amazement of Greenfield at what he considered the man's presumption could find no expression. Worth continued. I know a great deal more about you and your folks than you think. When I saw that my... He hesitated over the word, then spoke it plainly. My daughter was becoming interested in Willard Holmes. I took some pains to look up his history. In doing that, I naturally found out a good deal about you. Later, I learned a good deal more. It is immaterial to me what you know, muttered the other in a tone of deep disgust. What do you want? Worth spoke with quiet dignity. I want you to understand first, Mr. Greenfield, that my girl is just as much to me as young Holmes is to you. You are right. I'm a nobody, ignorant and all that. But you must not think, Mr. Greenfield, that because you belong in New York and I belong in the West, that this thing is harder for you than it is for me. You're not going to lose your boy. But I, for the first time, he hesitated and his voice expressed emotion. I'm going to lose my girl. The pathos of this lonely man's words touched even Greenfield. His manner was more gentle, as he said gruffly. It's a bad business, Mr. Worth, a damned bad business for both of us. I wish I'd never heard of this country. You'll feel different about that. Anyway, I figured that this country and this work will be here long after you and I are gone, and so will these young people. Again he hesitated, and his slim fingers caressed his chin. Then from behind that gray mask he asked, how much do you know about our finding Barbara in the desert? I know the story in a general way, that's all. It does not interest me. Let me tell you the facts. In his brief colorless sentences, Jefferson Worth related the incidents of that trip across the desert, and as he did so, Greenfield began to realize that some powerful motive had brought this man to him and was forcing him to relate his story with such exact care for the details. "'And you never found the slightest clue, even to the child's name?' he asked when Worth had finished. Jefferson Worth hesitated. Then, "'Mr. Greenfield, you had a younger brother who came west.' The man gazed at the speaker in amazement as he answered mechanically. "'Yes,' He died out here somewhere, in California, I believe. I was never able to learn the details. He was an adventurous lad and a good deal of a rover. But why? How? As the full import of the question dawned upon him, Greenfield started from his seat. My God, man, you don't mean... You cannot mean that it was my brother Will who was lost in that sandstorm on the desert? that the woman you found by the water hole was his wife, Gertrude, and that, that, his voice sank to a whisper. Will wrote me that there was a child, that she had Gertrude's hair and eyes. I had never seen her. He turned fiercely upon his companion. And you have kept this from me all these years? You've kept my only brother's child from me? By God, sir! I, but perhaps this is all one of your damnable tricks. What proof of you that this is so? And if it is, why have you kept it a secret? Jefferson Worth 
opened his satchel, and laid the tin box on the desk before the president of the King's Basin Land and Irrigation Company. This box was found this afternoon by Texas Joe and Pat, who brought it to me. I opened it. It's all here. When Greenfield had examined the contents of the box, letters, some of them written by himself to his brother, papers relating to William Greenfield's business affairs and property, and photographs of the little family and of the two brothers and their parents, he looked up to see Jefferson Worth sitting motionless, his form relaxed, his head dropped forward. Suddenly the words of the man who had been a father to his brother's child came back to Greenfield. My girl is just as much to me as young Holmes is to you. You're not going to lose your boy, but I'm going to lose my girl. In a flash, the financier saw it all, saw how Jefferson Worth loved Barbara as his own child, as Greenfield cared for Willard Holmes, saw how Worth might have destroyed the papers so strangely brought to light and kept the secret, saw and realized a little what strength of character it had taken to overcome the temptation and felt what the man was suffering. As Greenfield's hand fell on his shoulder, Jefferson Worth slowly lifted his head. Slowly he rose to his feet. In silence the two men faced each other. Without a word, for no word was needed, their hands met in a firm grip. After a little while, Greenfield said eagerly, Where is she now, Mr. Worth? Where is the girl? Does she know? I must see her at once. Come. And Willard, I wonder if he's still in town. Come, we must go to them. But Jefferson Worth answered, I've been figuring on that, Mr. Greenfield. You had better let me tell Barbara myself. And if I was you, after what you have probably said to Holmes on this subject, I wouldn't be in a hurry to tell him. For the sake of their future, we'd better let Barbara handle that matter herself. You can easily figure it out that it will be best for them that way. End of chapter 37「Chapter Thirty Eight of the Winning of Barbara Worth by Harold Bell Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter thirty eight The Heritage of Barbara Worth. Barbara, walking quickly, left the little village and crossing Dry River on the bridge that now spanned the deep gorge where the old San Felipe Trail once led down into the ancient wash climbed the slight grade to the grave that was marked by the simple headstone with its one word, Mother. That morning Jefferson Worth had told her of the tin box found by Texas Joe and Pat. With reverent care she had read the papers and letters and had looked long at the portraits of her parents and people. She could not at first realize that the desert had at last given up the secret that she had so longed to know. It was not real to her. The revelation was so sudden, so startling. She could not think of herself save as the daughter of Jefferson Worth, whom she loved as a father. As soon as the noonday meal was over, she had left her room in the hotel and once out of doors her steps had instinctively turned toward her mother's grave beside the old trail. Standing before the headstone, she looked at the one word, Mother. She said softly, Mother. Then, still in a whisper, she repeated the unfamiliar names, Gertrude Greenfield, William Greenfield, my mother. My father, I am Barbara Greenfield. 
Barbara Greenfield. Seating herself on the ground beside the grave, she looked about. At the sand hills in the distance, at the dry river gorge and the power plant, at the canal shining like silver bands among the green fields of the ranchers to the southeast, and at the little town. An hour passed, then another, and another. Across the river she saw Pablo riding out of the town and away along the road that follows the canal. Then from the powerhouse came Abe Lee with the seer. She watched them as they walked along the bank of the old channel. Once she thought she would call to them, but hesitated. If they crossed the bridge and came up the hill, they would be sure to see her. So she waited, keeping still. They passed the bridge and continued on down the bank of the stream. Barbara knew instinctively that they were talking of her and the secret that the desert had at last revealed, for she had asked her father to tell them. She thought of her father, who had gone to Republic. He would return that evening, and Mr. Greenfield, her uncle, would be with him. Her uncle! How strange! Then Barbara saw on the other side of the river a horseman riding from the south toward the town. She could not mistake the khaki-clad figure that, while fully at home in the saddle, still lacked the indescribable easy looseness and swinging grace of the western rider. It was Willard Holmes, and the young woman's heart told her why the engineer had come. Since that meeting at the river, in the hour of his victory, she had known that he would come, and she had known what her answer would be. He had evidently ridden from the river, from his work. Did he know? No, she decided. He could not know yet. Then the quick thought came. He must not know until... until she herself should tell him. Quickly the young woman walked down the hill across the bridge toward the town. Willard Holmes arrived at the hotel and, learning that Miss Worth was out, carried a chair to the arcade on the street to await her return. He had not waited long when a voice at his shoulder said with mock formality, I believe this is Mr. Willard Holmes. The engineer sprang to his feet. Miss Worth, they told me that you were out. I was sitting here waiting for you. I was out when you arrived, she confessed, but I saw you coming and hurried back pronto. I knew you had just left the river, you see, and of course, she added as though that explained her eagerness to see him, I wanted to hear the latest news from the work. There's no news, he answered as though dismissing the matter finally, and may I ask what brings you to Barba? He looked at her steadily. You brought me to Barba. I? Yes, you. I stopped in Republic on my way back from the city the evening of the day you left. I was forced to go on to the river, but took the first opportunity to ride out here, for I understood you expected to be in Barba several days. Surely you know why I've come. The work I stayed in the basin to do is finished. I have another offer from the S&C which, if I accept, will keep me here for several years. I have come to you with it as I came with the other. What shall I do? Please don't pretend that you don't understand me. The direct forcefulness of the man almost made Barbara forget the little plan she had arranged on her way to the hotel to meet him. I won't pretend, Mr. Holmes, she answered seriously. But will you go with me for a little ride into the desert? Her words recalled to his mind instantly their first meeting in Rubio City. But Holmes was not astonished now. The invitation coming from Barbara under the circumstances seemed the most natural thing in the world. The young woman went to her room to make ready, 
while the engineer brought the horses, and in a very few minutes they had crossed the river and were following the old San Felipe trail toward the sand hills. Very few words passed between them until they reached the great drift that had held so long its secret. Leaving the horses at Barbara's request, they climbed the steep sides of the great sand mound. From the top they could see on every hand the many miles of the King's Basin country, from Lone Mountain at the end of the Delta Dam to the snow-capped sentinels of San Antonio Pass, and from the skyline of the Mesa and the low hills on the east to No Man's Mountains and the bold wall of the coast range that shuts out the beautiful country on the west. The soft, many-colored veils and scarfs of the desert, with the gold of the sand hills, the purple of the mountains, the gray and green of the desert vegetation, with the ragged patches of dun plain, were all there still, as when Willard Holmes had first looked upon it, for the work of reclamation was still far from finished. But there was more in Barbara's desert now than pictures woven magically in the air. There were beautiful scenes of farms with houses and barns and fences and stacks, with cattle and horses in the pastures, and fields of growing grain, the dark green of alfalfa, with threads and lines and spots of water that under the flood of white light from the wide sky shone in the distance like gleaming silver. Barbara and the engineer could even distinguish the little towns of Republic and Frontera with Barbara nearby. And even as they looked, they marked the tall column of smoke from the locomotive of the SNC, moving toward the crossing of the old San Felipe Trail, and on the King's Basin Central, another, coming toward the town on Dry River, where once beside a dry water hole, a woman lay dead with an empty canteen by her side. Willard Holmes drew a long breath. "'You like my desert?' asked the young woman softly, coming closer to his side, so close that he felt her presence as clearly as he felt the presence of the spirit that lives in the desert itself. "'Like it?' he repeated, turning toward her. "'It is my desert now, mine as well as yours. "'Oh, Barbara, Barbara, I've learned the language of your land. "'Must I leave it now?' Won't you tell me to stay? He held out his hands to her, but she drew back a little from his eagerness. Wait, I must know something first before I can answer. He looked at her questioningly. What must you know, Barbara? Did you ever hear the story of what happened here in these very sand hills? Do you know that I'm not the daughter of Jefferson Worth? Yes, he answered gravely. I know that Mr. Worth is not your own father, but I did not know that this was the scene of the tragedy. And you understand that I am nameless, that no one knows my parentage, that there may even be Mexican or Indian blood in my veins. You understand? You realize all that? He started toward her almost roughly. Yes, I understand all that but I care only that you are Barbara. I know only that I want you. You, Barbara. But your family, Mr. Greenfield, your friends back home, think what it means to them. Can you afford... Barbara, he cried. Stop. Why are you saying these things? Listen to me. Don't you know that I love you? Don't you know that nothing else matters? Your desert has taught me many things, dear but nothing so great as this, that I want you and that nothing else matters. I want you for my wife. But you said once that you would never marry me, persisted the young woman. What has changed you? I said that I would never marry you. I said that? That cannot be, Barbara. You are mistaken. She shook her head. That is what you said. 
I heard you myself. You told Mr. Greenfield. At my house that morning he came to see you when you were hurt. I... I... The door into the dining room was open, and I heard. The light of quick understanding broke over the engineer's face. And you heard what Uncle Jim said to me? But, Barbara, didn't you hear the reason I gave him for saying that I would not marry you? I, I couldn't hear anything after that, she said simply. At her confession, the man's strong face shone with triumph. Listen, dear, I told Uncle Jim I would never marry you because you loved someone else and that there was no chance for me. Barbara's brown eyes opened wide. You thought that? Yes, I thought you loved Abe Lee. Why? Why, I do love Abe. The man laughed. Of course you do, but I thought you loved him as I wanted you to love me. Don't you understand? Oh! The exclamation was a confession, an explanation and an expression of complete understanding. But that, she added as she went to him, that could not be. And then... But Barbara's words, rightly understood, mark the end of my story. Rarely is it given in the story of life to those who work greatly or love greatly to gather the fruit of their toil or passion. But it is given those others, perhaps, those for whom it could not be, to know a happiness greater, it may be, than the joy of possession. End of chapter 38. End the winning of Barbara Worth. Recording by Bob Rollins in Augusta, Georgia.